My name is David Tucker, and we're getting ready to start a journey where we dive into JavaScript fundamentals. Whether this is your first or your 10th programming language, I want you to know that you're starting in the right place. Now, if you've been following along in the learning path, this is the course where things become real and we start using JavaScript to solve problems. First, I want to explain that this course was created using Node.js 18, which is the LTS release, and we'll be using features found in JavaScript ES 2022. I'll be using VS Code version 1.73.4, and I'll be running this on a Mac, but this should work equally well if you're running it on Windows or Linux. Now, because of the way that JavaScript works, this course will be applicable to any future JavaScript version. As long as you're running Node.js 18 or later and JavaScript ES 2022 or later, it should work as long as you're on the latest version of VS Code. Now, if any of the information around JavaScript versions is confusing for you, don't worry. I'm going to address that very topic in the next clip. So just hang on a bit. Now, all the way back in JavaScript, the big picture, at the beginning of this learning path, I defined JavaScript this way. JavaScript is a dynamic interpreted scripting language that can be used to create web applications, backend services, games, mobile applications, and just about anything else you can imagine. As you can see, JavaScript as a programming language is pretty much everywhere. Since its creation in 1995, it has grown to become one of the most widely used programming languages in the world. Now, if any of that definition seems confusing, feel free to go back and catch up on all the specifics in JavaScript, the big picture. I covered each of those concepts in that definition in detail there. Now, let's chat a bit about this learning path as a whole and how this course fits into everything. Everything that has been covered up to this point is designed to prepare you for writing JavaScript. This course will present a vast majority of the JavaScript concepts that you will use if you become a JavaScript developer. However, this course won't cover all of those concepts in depth. Many concepts such as error handling or working with JavaScript classes will be introduced at a foundational level in this course, but they will be covered in depth later within the learning path. So what will you be able to do after completing all the modules in this course? Well, let me tell you because I think it's pretty exciting and exactly what you need if you're getting started in JavaScript. First up, you will be able to read and understand JavaScript. This isn't to say you'll be able to understand every bit of JavaScript that exists in the world, but you will absolutely understand the core of what you can see out there. And next, you'll be able to write and execute JavaScript on your local machine using one of the most popular IDEs out there, VS Code. Also, you'll know where to go and find documentation for JavaScript, so you can expand on what you have learned here. And finally, you will get real-world experience by using JavaScript to solve real-world problems. I hope that all of this sounds exciting to you, too. Now, we aren't going to drag out this introduction either. After covering some essentials, you will actually execute your first JavaScript code here in this first module. So before we get too deep, I need to revisit the topic of JavaScript versions. So I'll be diving into that in the next clip. Before we get to installing the prerequisites for this course, I need to discuss JavaScript versions because this is a bit different than many other programming languages. When you run JavaScript, you are running it inside a JavaScript engine. Since JavaScript started in the browser, it's probably no surprise that each of the browsers have their own JavaScript engine. V8 is the most popular JavaScript engine and it is used by Google in Google Chrome as well as by Microsoft with Microsoft Edge. JavaScript Core is the engine that runs on Safari, although it sometimes goes by the name Squirrelfish. And then finally, we have SpiderMonkey, which is a descendant of the original JavaScript engine, and it is used in the Firefox browser. Now, JavaScript can run beyond the browser, though, and many of the other use cases for JavaScript use another engine designed to run on the server or your local computer, and that is Node.js. And we will be using Node.js for the entirety of this course. You might be saying, wait, I want to be a web developer. Trust me, you're still in the right place. The information contained within this course is essential. Whether you're building a React single page web application or if you're writing backend services for an IoT device farm, Node.js will give you the freedom to learn the core of JavaScript without having to know everything about HTML and CSS just yet. 
Now we're gonna be using the Node.js 18 LTS version. And LTS here stands for long-term support. This means that this specific version will have extended support for a longer period of time than a normal release. This means that big fixes and security updates will continue for about three years from its release until it reaches end of life. Next, we need to talk about the ECMAScript specification. This is the specification that covers JavaScript, the language. First, one of the things that you need to know about JavaScript that is different from other languages is that it is always backwards compatible. This means that the oldest JavaScript written is still valid today. This is different from other languages like Python or C-sharp, which may have breaking changes from release to release. Now we will be focusing on the ES2022 release of the ECMAScript specification here in this course. But JavaScript isn't quite as simple as other languages here. Most of the time that you're using JavaScript, you won't know which version of the specification you were on. This is because JavaScript engines don't adopt an entire specification version at a time. And instead they adopt things feature by feature from a specification release. Now, thankfully, there are great sites like caniuse.com as well as node.green that will help you understand which features of the specification are supported, whether you're using the browser or Node.js to run your JavaScript. Now, I don't wanna have to have you look up each and every concept that we cover in this course to determine where you can use it. If there are potential compatibility issues with this code I'll be teaching you, I will include notes within a specific page. Now here, via this short link and QR code, you can get to a web page that will link to sites like caniuse.com for each module to show you what engines support the features we're working through together. Now, if you're interested in learning more about JavaScript versions, go back and check out JavaScript, the big picture. And here you can learn how to track future releases of the ECMAScript specification, who governs that specification, and even the history that got us to where we are today. Now it's good information to know if you're going to be a JavaScript developer. Okay, enough about versions. In this next clip, I'll be moving forward with installing the prerequisites that we'll be using in this course. So now I'm gonna walk you through installing the prerequisites for this course, and this is essential because you will need these items that we'll be installing if you wanna follow along with the examples that I'll be giving. So over the course of this demo, we're gonna be working through a few things. First of all, we will be installing Node.js for development. Once you have this installed, you'll be able to execute code using the Node.js engine. Then we'll be installing Visual Studio Code, which is an integrated development environment or IDE. In other words, it is a tool that you will use to write and run your JavaScript code. And then we'll be reviewing the JavaScript documentation that you can access online. Okay, let's dive in. So first I'm here in my browser and I'm at the site for Node.js. Now you'll notice here that it lists both an LTS and a current release. We want to install the LTS version. So here you'll see that it is 18.13.0. That's what I will be using throughout this course. You'll notice here that it's currently on downloads for Mac OS, but if I go to other downloads, you can see that we have installers for Windows and Mac and Linux and even the source code if you want to build it from that. So pretty much any type of installer that you need, you can get here from the Node.js site. Now, next, let's talk about Visual Studio Code. So here, I'm at the site for Visual Studio Code. And in many ways, just like what we looked at for Node.js, we have the installers for most of the platforms that we would need. We can get installers for Mac, Windows, and Linux, depending on what you need. So just be sure, you get the installer that you need and you install it on your local machine. Now chances are whatever platform you're on, it will default to that here with the big button here on the left side. Simply install it and you should be good to go. Now let me tell you how you can check to see if you have installed both Node.js and Visual Studio Code correctly on your machines. So I'm gonna open up the terminal. So here in my terminal, I should be able to run a few commands. First, I'm going to run node-v. And here you can see it gives me the version of Node.js on my local machine, which is 18.13.0. Hey, that's exactly what we needed. 
Next, I'm going to run code-v, and this will give me the version of Visual Studio Code, 1.74.3. So, we're good to go here for this. Now, if you remember, there's one more thing that we need to take a look at, and that is our online JavaScript documentation. So I would recommend utilizing the Mozilla Developer Network web docs for JavaScript. And here, this will give us the information that we need if we wanna learn how to use some of the built-in objects and classes that are included with JavaScript. Let me look at an example. If I go here under built-in objects on the left side, I can scroll down until I get to date. Now we haven't learned anything yet about the date object within JavaScript, but we will be learning about that here in this course. So here I can go through and see a bunch of background information. I also can look at some of the different methods that are included, for example, get hours that I can use on any date that I create. I also can see how I can go in and create a date for the current time. And it gives you code samples to go along with these examples. I think it's a great place to go if you want to add to the information that we're gonna be covering in this course. So this might wanna be a place where you set a bookmark here for this online documentation. So the moment has arrived here within this clip, you're gonna be running your first JavaScript code. So let me walk you through what we're gonna be doing. First of all, we're gonna be going in and running JavaScript in the terminal. We won't even start in VS Code. But once we work through that, we then will be configuring Visual Studio Code for Node.js. And once we have that in place, we will be able to execute JavaScript code within Visual Studio Code with Node.js. So let's dive in. So I'm here in the terminal, and if you followed along in the last clip, you have Node.js installed. You should be able to run Node-V and see that you're on version 18.13 or later. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna type in node. And here I'm going to enter into something called the REPL or read eval print loop. This allows me to just type in JavaScript commands and let them be executed for each line. So for example, I can go in and type console.log and I can say hello. Now once I run this line, we'll see that it turns back and says hello. Great, we're actually executing JavaScript code. Now I also could do other things here, and I realize we haven't at all talked about variables yet. We will be covering that within the next module, but I could go in and type let first name equal to David. And then I could go in and say, okay, console.log, and I could say, hello. And then I could say, first name. Now if I ran this, you'll see that it says, hello, David. So this is just an example of how you can use this read eval print loop to go in and in essence test out single lines of JavaScript code. And if you go through and set variables, which as I mentioned, I know we haven't covered yet, it will remember that from one line to the other. So that's certainly one way that you can run JavaScript code, but I would say this is not going to be the most common. So now I'm gonna hit Control C once and then Control C again, and now I have exited the read eval print loop. So now I will open VS Code. So I'm here within VS Code and I have opened up the index.js file that comes with the exercise files for this module. So if you go under the course at Pluralsight and download the zip file that contains all of the exercise files for the entire course and you navigate in under module two, you'll have to go through a few folders, but then you'll find this index.js file. And it's about as simple of a JavaScript file as you can have. And as I said, we're gonna be covering variables within the next module. But what I wanna show you here is how you can configure this, even though we just have a single file, to make it easy to execute within Visual Studio Code. So to set that configuration first, I'm going to go down to this option here on the left pane that shows the run and debug button. If I press this, I'll now be greeted with several different options. Now what I wanna do here is I wanna create a custom run and debug configuration. And I do that by creating a launch.json file. Now, what you don't need to know here is how to create this from scratch. If you click on this option, you'll see that it comes up and asks you some different things. Well, do you want this to be for VS Code extension development or for a web app with Chrome or a web app with Edge? No, here we wanna use Node.js. If you remember, 
That's going to be the JavaScript engine that we will be using throughout this course. So first, I'm going to go through here and just select Node.js. Now, it's going to generate this file for us in our project called launch.json. Now, I don't need to do anything with this. I can simply close it out. And you can actually see this if you go back under the top option here where my files are in the Explorer, you can see that I now have a .vs code directory, and inside of that I have my launch.json file. Again, you don't need to worry about any of those specifics just yet. So once that's there, you can then open up your index.js file if you haven't opened that up yet. And now we can navigate back over into this run and debug option. And you'll see here that we have an option here to launch. So if I hit this button here, I can actually launch the application. And we can see here that it actually runs. So first I'll point out a few things. First of all, you'll see that I am running node version 18.13.0, which is what we mentioned previously. And what it's doing here is it's actually showing you the command that VS Code is running to run your JavaScript file, which in this case, again, is called index.js. Now, yours will look a little bit different than mine. I happen to install Node using a tool called NVM, so my directory structure will be a bit different. That doesn't matter in this case. But in this case, what you need to know is that you can run a JavaScript file just from the terminal by using the Node command followed by the name of the file that you're trying to run. But the next thing that you'll see is that we have the output from our Node.js file, which in this case says, hello, David Tucker, because it's outputting the word hello, plus our variable for first name and our variable for last name. So congratulations, if you've done this, you have executed JavaScript code inside of Visual Studio Code using a run and debug configuration. But you can do more than just this. So in the next clip, I want to show you how to do something that I believe you'll need to do at many points throughout this course, and that is knowing how to do basic debugging of your JavaScript code. So here in this clip, we're going to cover a skill that will be essential for you if you spend time as a JavaScript developer. And just to be honest, it is a skill that I believe will prove essential as you work your way through this course. So let me go ahead and tell you what we're going to be doing. First of all, we're going to be configuring Visual Studio Code for debugging, and we've really done a majority of the legwork for this in the previous clip. Then we'll look at how we set something called a breakpoint within a JavaScript file. And then through that process, we will be inspecting variables in a JavaScript file that are found at a specific breakpoint. So let's dive in. So I'm here within VS Code, and I have the index.js file opened up from the exercise file for this second module of the course. Now I also have my launch.json file that was created in the previous clip. And again, this was created by VS Code for us based on our internal Node.js installation. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out the launch.json file. We don't need it in this case. Let me explain to you here the concept of a breakpoint. So if you're executing this code, you might want to stop the code at some point and see what things have been defined. This happens a lot when you're building a more complex application. Maybe there's an error or maybe you're building something out and you just wanna see, okay, where am I at? So you would stop execution at that point and then you can inspect your application and see everything that's happened up to that point. Now here within VS Code, you can do this by setting breakpoints. And here, if you go to the gutter next to where you have your line numbers, you'll notice that we have a little red dot that hovers near our cursor. I'm going to put two breakpoints in place. First, I'm going to put one here next to last name. And then I'm going to put another breakpoint here near the logging statement that we have at the end of the file. Now, if you have your launch configuration, when you go here under your run and debug options, we should be able to just hit a single button here to launch our application. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and hit this button and you'll notice several things that happen right away. First of all, the bottom bar of the application has changed to an orange color, indicating that we are in debug mode, that we have stopped execution of the file. Now we can also see here that we have this variables window that has now been populated with the variables from our application. And I can see, for example, if I scroll down, and again, I know we haven't talked about variables yet, 
I can see that at this point, because line one has executed, that I do have David assigned as the value for first name. However, I haven't yet executed the second line, so last name at this point is still undefined. Now, I could go ahead and just continue. Now, the way that I do that is by going here to these options that are now included on the screen because I am in debug mode. The first one of these is continue. Now, there is a lot of skill that goes behind knowing how to effectively use a debug mode, so much so that you'll notice that there is another course in this learning path that covers that extensively. For now, we'll just talk about using continue. And you can see here that I can use either the F5 key or I can just push the continue button. So I'll go ahead and push that once, and now you'll see that it has moved up to the fourth line, but it hasn't yet executed that fourth line. And if we look over here under variables, I can see that Tucker has been populated as the value for last name. However, this console log statement hasn't executed yet. Now, if I hit this continue button one more time, it's going to run through the entire file. And here I can see that just as when we ran it in the last clip, I get the output, hello, David Tucker. Now, if this for some reason doesn't come up for you, you can access this by going under the view menu and going to debug console. So here we have been able to set breakpoints and inspect variables at given breakpoints. Now, trust me, this will make a lot more sense as we move forward and you learn more about the JavaScript code that was included here within this sample file. And we'll be covering that and oh, so much more in the next module. Let's chat about the syntax of JavaScript. Now, if this is a new term for you, syntax is just a set of rules that define how the collection of characters and symbols should be structured within a programming language. Now, by following these rules, you will be able to create valid JavaScript. If you don't follow these rules, your JavaScript would be considered invalid. Let's cover some basic concepts around JavaScript syntax. First, you will organize your JavaScript code into statements. A statement will generally perform some specific action. Now, in the example that you can see here, we are logging a message to the console. Now, if you're not sure what I mean by this, don't worry, you'll see this in action within this module. Now, I let the JavaScript engine know that my statement is done by inserting a semicolon at the end. Now, we'll talk more about semicolons here in a bit. Now, you may be tempted to think that by looking at this example, that statements all have to exist on separate lines within your JavaScript file, but that's not the case. As long as you have those semicolons in place, you could write an entire JavaScript application on a single line but for the sake of code organization, we generally don't do this. By placing statements on separate lines, it makes it easier for humans to read through what you're doing in your code. Honestly, the JavaScript engine doesn't care, but trust me, your future teammates will certainly care. Within every programming language, we have keywords. These words have specific meaning since they perform a specific task. In this example, I'm defining a variable using the let keyword. Now you will notice within VS Code that these keywords appear in a different color than the other text that you write. As you learn more about JavaScript, you will learn many different keywords and what actions they take. Now I don't want you to think that you will need to memorize hundreds of these keywords. If we look at the current version of the specification, we have 64. And if you're writing JavaScript on a regular basis, you may use about a third of these on regular tasks. Now, another part of JavaScript statements would be operators. You can kind of think of these as the symbols that we use when we write code. These symbols represent some specific action that we will be taking on one or more values. Now, we would call these values operands. Now, here, I'm going to use a mathematical operation to add two numbers together. Now, if I were to run this code, I would get an output of five by adding the numbers two and three together. In this example, the plus sign is an operator with two and three being the operands. Let's chat briefly about those semicolons because a part of the goal of this course is to help you understand what you will see in JavaScript code out in the real world. Now, while I've told you that your statements end with semicolons, they don't actually have to. For most JavaScript code, it would just run fine without them. The ECMAScript specification allows for automatic semicolon insertion in most cases. That being said, there are some areas, especially if you're new to JavaScript, that could trip you up. Because of that, I personally recommend that you always use semicolons. And with that being said, 
If you're looking at some open source code, or if you're working with a team where semicolons are not used, I just want you to understand what is happening. Now, just to finalize that discussion, let me reiterate, you need to use semicolons until you have a level of experience with the language where you can understand what problems might be caused by not using them. And finally, I mentioned earlier that one of our goals with our code is to make it human readable. I can put some text in my JavaScript file that the engine will completely ignore solely for the purpose of helping other developers understand what's going on. We call these comments. While I'll be diving into comments more deeply in a later clip, I can show you briefly what a basic comment would look like. Now, in this example, I'm using some variables. Now, I realize I haven't covered this yet, but I'll be doing that shortly. Now, in this example, I'm grouping a few different statements together and giving a description of why that block of code is there and what it's doing. This is just one type of comment. And in the next clip, I'll be diving more in depth into different ways that we can write comments and also add in some general notes on code readability. So next, we're going to talk about the concept of comments in our JavaScript code. And this is something I've only briefly introduced so far. So let's dive in a bit and take a look at it. So first of all, in programming in general, a comment is text within the source code that is actually ignored by the engine running the application. As such, changing or removing the comment would have no effect on the actual application. And this may leave you asking, why would we use comments in our JavaScript code? Well, I wanna give you two reasons, and I'll give you examples of both. First of all, it is to help other humans understand the code. Now, there are some good ways to do this and some bad ways to do this, but if we're doing something that's confusing, it might help other developers on our team to have us leave a comment explaining our thought process around a specific block of code but also we can use comments to add metadata for tools that are analyzing our code. So let's look at some examples of JavaScript comments. So first we have a single line comment, and we can do this simply with two slashes in front of whatever comment we want to add. And generally you would want to put this directly above whatever you're commenting on. But in some cases you want to do more than just one line. And even though you could do a bunch of these single lines together, there is another syntax for adding a multi-line comment. And so here you can see this particular syntax where we can go in and add in as many lines as we want. Now I mentioned though, that there might be another reason for adding in comments. And that would be for dealing with metadata related to tools that are analyzing our code. And I'm going to give you two examples. First, we can actually use comments to document a specific block of code. Now, I know we haven't yet talked about functions, and there's a lot here that we haven't covered yet, but I'll just point out that we can use this to specify different parameters and return values, and then tools can be used to actually generate web pages of documentation for our code. So we're not going to cover that fully yet, but I just want to point out that's one of the ways you can use it. Now, there's another tool that we'll be talking about at the end of this course called ESLint, which can actually help with our formatting and to make sure that our code is valid according to the rules that we have specified. And in this case, you can choose to actually tell that tool to disable looking at a specific line for one reason, utilizing comments like this. And there's actually multiple different ways we can specify those config rules. But this just showcases two different ways that we can utilize comments with other tools that are separate from the engine that's actually running our JavaScript application. Now, I wanna give you a quote here about comments because I think this is also equally important to understand. So nothing can be quite so helpful as a well-placed comment, but nothing can clutter up a module more than frivolous dogmatic comments. Nothing can be quite so damaging as an old crufty comment that propagates lies and misinformation. So in summary of this quote from Robert C. Martin, just understand that your comments need to stay up to date with your code. And if your code is self-explanatory in a situation, then you might not need to add in a comment at that spot. Back in the first clip of this module, I mentioned variables. Now variables are essential to any programming language. So let's discuss how to leverage variables within JavaScript. If you were building a company directory application, which we will be doing over the length of this course, you would store information about each employee, including their first name, last name, maybe their number of years at the company. Hey, you, you could even store their birthday. But before we assign values to these, 
each of the variables will need to have a name. So let's chat a bit about naming in general. Now, first, I feel that it is appropriate to bring up Phil Carlton's famous quote, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. Now, if you're new to programming, you will be amazed at the amount of time you will spend staring at the screen and wondering, what should I name this variable or function? Getting good at naming things is just as much a skill as writing the code. Now, since our end goal is to have code that is easily understood by other developers, we really need to focus on this. Now, in JavaScript, we have a few hard rules and then a few best practices when it comes to variable names. Let's cover the rules first. Now, names can contain letters, digits, as well as the dollar sign and underscore characters. Second, you cannot start your name with a digit. Now, names within JavaScript are case sensitive, so an uppercase A and a lowercase A for a name would be different variables. Now, now that we have the rules out of the way, let's chat about the best practices. Variable names in JavaScript usually start with a lowercase letter. Next, JavaScript variables generally leverage camel case naming. This means that the name starts out with a lowercase letter and then all of the subsequent words start with a capital letter. Now this is different from some other languages that might normally use a dash or underscore to separate words. Now while these best practices are not rules, they can help you write code that will fit in with most of the JavaScript that is being written today. Okay, now that we've covered these rules and best practices, let's get to the code. Now let's actually assign some values to a variable for the items we mentioned earlier. First, we need to use a keyword to define a variable. We have three different keywords that we can use here, and I'll explain each of them in this clip. For now, we will use the let keyword. So here, we will start with the keyword, and then we will give our variable a name. I'll give the first variable a name, first name. Now we can see here that we're using camel case for the variable name. Now I'll use the assignment operator to specifically say that I wanna give this variable a value. I'll use quotes around my first name and then I'll put the semicolon on the end of the statement. Because I'm using the characters that make up my name here, this is a string. And in JavaScript, we can define strings with single quotes or double quotes. There is no difference, unlike some other languages. Now we also have other ways to define strings, but we'll talk more about that later within this course. Now next, I can do the same thing for the last name variable. After this, we can create a variable for the number of years I have spent at the company. I'll use the same keyword and I'll give this the name num years employment. After the assignment operator, I can just add the number six for this. Just as before, I'll add a semicolon to the end of the statement. Finally, I need to add in the birthday. So we're gonna do some new things here and don't worry, we'll dive into how to work with dates later within this module. So I'll specify let as the keyword and then I'll give it the name date birth. Next, I'll add in the assignment operator and then I'll use a keyword we haven't used yet, new. Now I'll specify here that we're creating a new date object and then I will pass in the birthday. Now, this isn't my actual birthday. I'm just adding in a random value here. I realize that we'll need to dive into this syntax a bit more deeply for creating a date, but as I mentioned, we'll be doing that later within this module. The first thing I wanna revisit is a term that I discussed back in JavaScript, the big picture, and that is dynamic typing. We don't define the data types for each variable in JavaScript. Instead, the JavaScript engine figures out that based on the data that we assign to a variable. Now, in the example we have here, we have defined strings, a number, and a date. Now, this is one of the benefits of JavaScript as well as one of its biggest pitfalls. I'll be discussing several things you need to watch out for with dynamic typing throughout this course. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this clip that we had three different keywords for creating variables. And up to this point, we have only discovered one. Now, one of the things we get when we use the let keyword is that we can actually go back and change those variables. If I wanna update my years of employment from six to seven, I can easily do that. Now, there is another keyword that we can use if we want to create a variable and have it never change. And that would be const, which is short for constant. If you create a variable using the const keyword, you cannot go back and update its value at a later time. Now, there are many reasons why you would do this, and I'll be covering many of them throughout this course. The third option we have for creating a variable is the var keyword. This was the original way to create a variable in JavaScript. It has its drawbacks, and I would recommend that you don't use it in your code. 
I do want you to know it exists as you may run across it in some code out there. So when reading code, just think of it like the let keyword. It does create a variable that you can change. Finally, I want to explain one additional characteristic of JavaScript when it comes to variables. And that is how JavaScript decides what variables to keep in memory and which to release. JavaScript uses garbage collection. And according to Wikipedia, garbage collection is a form of automatic memory management. The garbage collector attempts to reclaim memory, which was allocated by the program, but is no longer referenced. Such memory is called garbage. I realize that if you're new to programming, you may not yet understand how this fits in, but I'll also be referencing this concept throughout this course. What you need to know is that unlike lower level languages, you don't have to control the life cycle of the memory that is storing your variable. The JavaScript engine uses its own internal tools to do that for you. Now, there are many techniques that you will learn over the course of this learning path to help you optimize your code so that you can avoid some of the common traps when it comes to memory and performance in JavaScript. Now, we're gonna talk about the different data types that we have available to us in JavaScript. Now, as a reminder, and I know I've already mentioned this, but we do deal with dynamic typing in JavaScript. So we can look at it this way. JavaScript is a dynamic language with dynamic types, and variables in JavaScript are not directly associated with any particular value type, and any variable can be assigned and reassigned values of all types. So unlike if you're using a strongly typed language, like let's use Java, for example, in that case, you might have a variable that is of type string, and you could only then assign string values to that particular variable. But that's not the case with JavaScript. You could assign it to be a string and then assign it to be a number and then assign it to be something else. So we need to understand that aspect of dynamic typing within JavaScript. Now, it is worth asking the question, well, where is this information stored? Well, memory in JavaScript, we generally have two different places where we're going to be storing the data types that we create. And we have the stack and the heap. Now, I realize this doesn't make a ton of sense to you yet. I'm just going to introduce this concept here within this clip, but we'll be covering this more over this course. So let's talk in general though about the two different types of JavaScript data types that we have. So these are kind of the overall types. First of all, we have our primitive types and I'll go through in a minute and explain what primitive types we have available to us in JavaScript. And then everything else in JavaScript is an object. So let's take a minute and dive into each of these categories a little bit more deeply. So first of all, we have primitives. So in JavaScript, primitives are immutable, meaning they cannot be changed. So these values have no methods or properties and their data is stored directly on the stack since the engine knows exactly how much memory to allocate for that piece of data. And primitives are passed by value. And that's something else that I will be demonstrating here within this module. Now let's talk about this for just a minute. You might say, oh, well, they can't be changed. That means when I create a variable, it has to stay the same value. No, that's not what I mean in this case. So let's say that we create a string, which we've done so far. I could assign a new string to the particular variable, and that would be just fine. But that's going to be a different piece of memory that is actually allocated for that new string. Now let's talk next about objects. So in JavaScript, objects are mutable, meaning that their contents can be changed without creating a new object. So objects can contain a collection of properties and they are passed by reference and stored not on the stack, but on the heap. So we'll give some examples of that here within this module as well. So let's just look at the different data types that we have available in these two overall categories. So when it comes to primitives, we have Boolean values, which again are true false values. We have number, we have big int or big integer, string, and it's important to note here that in JavaScript, string is a primitive. That's different than a lot of other languages. Also, we have symbol, null, and undefined. And we'll be covering most all of these here within this module. But as I mentioned, everything else in JavaScript is an object. So that includes just plain objects that we've created, functions, our collection types, which would include you know, array and map and set, as well as things like dates that we've utilized so far, any class instances, things like errors that actually pop up in our code, 
and promises, all of these things would be categorized as objects. So it's important to note here that all primitive types, except null and undefined, have their corresponding object wrapper types, which provide useful methods for working with the primitive values. Now, let me give you an example of this because this seems like it goes against something that I said earlier. So I mentioned earlier that primitives have no methods or properties. And if I look here, I'm going to give an example. I could utilize this code. Now I'm going to create here a new string, in this case, David, and I'm going to assign it to the variable name. Then I'm gonna create another variable called uppercase name, and I'm going to call the method to uppercase on my name variable. And this will convert that David to be all uppercase. Now you might look at that and say, well, I thought name wasn't supposed to have any methods associated with it because it is a primitive value. And you are correct, and it is stored as a primitive value. But JavaScript has some utilities that are provided for many of these data types where at runtime it's able to substitute in these wrapper methods so that you can interact with that particular data type a bit more easily. But it is important to note here that the way that this works, for example, when I call to uppercase, it is actually creating a new string. And it's passing that in this case to the variable uppercase name. It's not changing the value because if you remember, in our case, primitives are immutable. So now we're gonna walk through the process of creating and using strings. And unlike some of the previous examples, we're gonna spend most of our time just in the code editor inside of VS Code. Now, as a reminder, I showed you earlier the documentation site that I recommend, which is the MDN Web Docs, which is the Mozilla Developer Network. So everything that I'm going to be covering here about strings inside of JavaScript is covered here in this documentation as well. But let's go ahead and dive into VS Code. So here within VS Code, this is pretty much the state that we left it in the last time we were in the editor. Now, as a reminder, I have already configured this particular workspace to have a launch.json file, which enables me to be able to execute the current file that I'm in with Node.js. You can go back to the previous module to look at how to configure this for your workspace if you haven't done that yet. Now, as another reminder with that, if I go here under the run and debug options, and I want to launch, if I see here in the tooltip that comes up, and that might be a little bit small for you to see, but I can use the F5 keyboard shortcut to run whatever script I'm currently in without having to continually switch back and forth between different side nav options here. So I'll be using that over the course of this demo. So let's go ahead and close this out. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a file called strings.js where I will be storing kind of our experimentation with strings in JavaScript. So here I have created a string, much like we have already done many times throughout the course of this course so far. So here we're using double quotes to create a single line string. But as I've mentioned, we could certainly do the same thing with single quotes. Now there is a third option that I haven't shown you yet. And I can utilize what we call backticks to also create a string. Now there are some interesting capabilities with backticks that you don't get with the other options and I'll be covering those shortly. Now, as a reminder, strings are primitives and so that means they are immutable. But at any point, if I use the let keyword to create my string variable, I can go in and reassign a new string to that variable. Okay, so that is single line strings. Now let's talk about something else that's important. And that is knowing how to bring multiple strings together to form a new string. Now, one way we can do that is with this operator, the plus operator. When we use that on strings, it will join them together. So here I'm bringing together the first name, I'm adding in a new space, and then I'm bringing in the last name to create the full name. Now I also could do the same thing with those capabilities we can use with backticks. And here we're specifically talking about template literals. So you'll notice inside of this string, I can use a dollar sign and curly bracket notation, and then I can put in any JavaScript expression. Now in this case, I'm just using variables. So I'm bringing together the first name and the last name, as well as that space 
just like I did in the previous example. But I could again add in any expression that I wanted beyond just bringing in variables. Now here, I'm gonna go ahead and log this out so you can actually see this in use. So I'm gonna go ahead and press the F5 key. And when I run this, you can see there that it does bring up David Tucker. So I've pulled together my first name and last name into a new variable called full name. Now, moving on, we're gonna talk about multi-line strings because there are times when we actually want to have multiple lines within a single string. Now, I'm gonna show you one way to do this here. I wanna point out here that we're using some special characters. Now, these special characters within our strings start with a backslash. And in this case, we have backslash in, which represents a new line. So here, if I run this, what do you think I'm gonna get? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and run it, and you'll see that I do get line one, line two, and line three, all on separate lines in the console. So, okay, that's, that's great. That gives us what we need. But to be honest, in a lot of ways, that's not a very readable way to work with a multi-line string. So here, I'm gonna show you another option that we have when we're using backticks. Here, we can create a string, and we can actually just have it take up multiple lines. It becomes a lot more readable, and we actually don't have to put in those new line characters. It will do that for us. So here, I can close out a string just like this. Now, the next thing we may need to do is to actually escape characters. Here, in this case, I'm using double quotes inside of a string that I have defined with single quotes. And you can do it this way. You can nest quotes together as long as I'm not trying to nest single quotes inside of single quotes or double quotes inside of double quotes. Now, if there is a situation where I do need to nest double quotes inside of double quotes, for example, I can utilize the special character to escape. So I can use the same backslash here and say, okay, I want this to be treated not as a syntax quote. I want this to be treated just like a regular quote that you would find within any string. So here we can escape it utilizing the backslash character. Now, another approach that we can take here is if we utilize backticks, we can use both single and double quotes inside of our strings. But what happens if you need to use a backslash in your string? Well, in this case, you're going to have to escape your backslash. So here you actually would see two different backslashes together. But if I were to go in and actually log this out to the console, which I'll go ahead and hit F5 and run this, we can see here in the line that comes up at the bottom, it only shows one backslash. And that's because we escaped it by using another backslash so that it knows, again, this isn't a syntax backslash. Instead, this is just a normal backslash we're using within our string. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is every string has a property, and this property is length. Now, if you remember, I talked about our primitive object wrappers. These wrap around our primitive values and give us the ability to interact with our strings with some different properties and methods. So here, the length property will let us know how long our string is in terms of the number of characters. So here, I could also go through, I'm gonna use a template literal inside of console.log, and if I were to run this, we could actually see that our quote length here is 46 characters. Now, the next thing that we can do is we can actually look at specific characters within our string. So in this case, let's say we wanna look at the second character in the quote we had created earlier. Well, in this case, we can utilize a square bracket syntax and then pass in an integer to say where we want to look. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, you're saying second character, but you're using the number one. And this brings up a great point that you need to understand when working in JavaScript. And that is that these values are zero indexed. That means the first item in the list is going to be zero. The second item is going to be one. So if we were to go in and log this out, we should see that if we look at our string, the first character is a capital I, the second character is a lowercase n. So when I run this and I hit F5, we should see that it brings out the letter n. So we, we're doing what we wanted to do there. Now the next thing here, we can also change case. And we've also done this before, so I'm just gonna briefly cover this. We can call the to uppercase method on a string, which again is there because of that primitive object wrapper. 
And we could do the same thing with our lowercase value. So we could say to lowercase. And if I were to run after logging out both of these, I would see both an uppercase David Tucker and a lowercase David Tucker. Now next, we also can look at a specific substring. So here I'm going to use a function called index of to try to find the value of DAV in our full name. Now again, that's the first three letters of my name. So if we're looking for where that happens, we should see it return a zero because that is the first spot in the string. The first character is where that starts. And next, we're gonna go in and we're going to say that we wanna find the index of KER. Well, that should be at a much higher number because that occurs at the end of my name. So I'm gonna go ahead and run those, and indeed, we can see that index one is zero and index two is nine. Now, the last thing we're gonna do is we're going to use index of to try to find a value that doesn't exist. And when this happens, in most cases, we're going to see that JavaScript will return a negative one, meaning I didn't find it. So if I were to run this, we would see that this last one returns a negative one. Now there's also another way that we can check for this. We can check and see if a string contains a substring. So we're going to use here the method includes, and I can see if my full name includes the letters DAV. And in this case, we know that it should. And so if I run this by running F5, I'll see that it returns true. And that actually helps set up our next clip where we're going to be talking about true false values in JavaScript with Booleans. So next, we're gonna be talking about how you use Boolean values within your JavaScript applications. And while we had a huge amount to get through with strings, we don't have nearly as much for Boolean values. But I wanna remind you that there is documentation available for Booleans on the MDM web docs if you wanna go even deeper than what I'm covering here. But for now, let's go ahead and jump into VS Code. So here within VS Code, I need to first go in and create a new file. And now I wanna start the process of creating some variables that have Boolean values. So first, I'm gonna use the let keyword, and here I'm just gonna assign this first one to be true. Now, note here, I'm not using a string, there are no quotes, there isn't a capital T, right? It's lowercase t-r-u-e for true. So now, if I go ahead and log this value out, we should see that it will indeed return true. So I'm gonna hit F5, and I can see that it does return true. Now, if I want to do false, it works in a very similar way. I go in and say it's equal to false, and then we can log that out and verify it as well. Great, so we've seen how to create Boolean values, one for true, one for false. Now, I'm gonna introduce you to another operator, and this might not seem super important yet, and you might not yet know when you would use this, but this is something you'll be using. So I wanna show you how to use the not operator, and this will change the result that we get back. So every time you see the not operator, just think the word not in your head. So in this case, we're setting our variable not true to be equal to not and then true. So if we were to go in and log this value out, what do you think we would get? Well here, if I run this with F5, we'll see that we get false. And then we can do the same thing with a not false value. So here I can log this out and we should see that this one is true. And indeed, that is what we get. So while this may seem simplistic and you might think, oh wow, I totally get everything about Booleans. Once we get into the next module where we're working with type coercions and when we get to working with conditionals later, you'll see just how important Booleans are. So now we're gonna talk about how we store numeric values within our JavaScript code. And to do this, we're gonna be talking about not one, but two different data types. So to start with, we'll be talking about the number type. Now the JavaScript number type is a double precision 64-bit binary format IEEE 754 value, like double in Java or C sharp. Now, wait, wait, don't leave just yet. I realize that for most of you that made absolutely no sense. The next point though is what I really want you to notice. This means it can represent fractional values, but there are some limits to the stored number's magnitude and precision. This means there's a limit to how big of a number can be stored inside of the number type, or how small of a number can be stored within the number type. And that will be important as we look at the other data type that we have as well. So with that being said, I do wanna remind you that we do have documentation on the MDN web docs. 
So here you can follow the link on the screen to get to the documentation for the number type. Okay, now that we have all of that out of the way, let's get in to VS Code. So I'm here within the editor. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new file. And what we wanna do here is something that to be honest, we've already done a few times. We're just gonna create a basic number value. In this case, we'll say num1 is gonna be equal to six. That's just a small integer. Well, for num2, we'll do a negative number. And you can see that we can do it this way. For num3, let's do a decimal. In this case, 1.234567. So all of these can be represented just fine with the number type. But let's talk about what happens if we start getting to some really big or some really small numbers. Well, I wanna show you here first that we're going to try to store a really large integer inside. Now you'll notice immediately we have some little dots that appear underneath and it says here that numeric literals with absolute values equal to two to the 53rd power or greater are too large to be represented accurately as integers. Well. We'll see those minimum and maximum values in just a bit. But for the moment, let's pretend like we didn't see that warning and let's just keep moving forward. I wanna go through and log this out because it's probably not gonna come out the way you would think. So here, you'll notice that we get an E notation value. Now in this case, what this means, because it says E plus, is that we take the number 1.56 and we move the decimal point 21 places to the right, and that would give us the full number. This is just a shortened notation for representing this. We also could see this if we're going to do a small number. In this case, we'll do a very, very small negative number. And if we log this out, and then I run it with F5, we'll see that we see negative 2.1 and then E minus 18. That means we take the number, negative 2.1, and we move that decimal point 18 places to the left, and that would give us the number. Now, we get to also use this notation, if we so desire, when we're creating our JavaScript numbers. So in this case, we could go through and say that we're gonna create something num6, which is 1.2 e plus 10. Now, if we wanted to, we could also log this out. Now, JavaScript will by default only use e notation when numbers get to a certain size, either again, big or small. So what's funny is when we actually write this out down here to the console, we'll see that it's just showing us the full number. But again, I just wanted to showcase you can use that notation as well. Now let's start to get into some of the specifics around how big and how small of numbers can be properly represented with the number type. So one of the cool things is we have some values provided by JavaScript that we can utilize to help see what these minimum and maximum values are. So we're gonna be looking at number.min value, number.min safe integer, and then we'll do the flip of that with the maximum. So maximum value and then maximum safe integer. And we're just gonna go ahead and log all of these out to the console. Now these numbers are gonna be represented for the most part in E notation, so I wanted to be sure you were familiar with that before we actually ran this code. So now I'll hit F5. And you can see here that we have values that are presented here. The minimum value is shown in E notation but our maximum and minimum integer value, which again are just kind of mirrors of each other, one is positive and one is negative, those are shown in uh, without E notation. But then we also have E notation for that maximum value. So you can see here the limits of what can be contained. Now, you might say, okay, well, what do we do? If for some reason we need an integer, let's say bigger than what is shown here, what do we do? Well, that brings us to our next type. So here we have big int, which is short for big integer. And it represents numeric values that are too large to be represented by the number primitive. Now it is created by appending the letter n to the end of an integer literal, or by calling the big int function without the new operator and giving it an integer value or string value. Before we get too far, I wanna remind you that we also have documentation for big int on MDN web docs. So you can follow the link on the screen to get access to that documentation if you need to go even deeper than what I am presenting here. Okay, with all that said, we'll get back to VS Code. So here within VS Code, I wanna actually create a couple of values with big int. So here, I'm just gonna go ahead and create my first one. Now you might be surprised. I just put the number one and the letter n. Now, because the type can handle very, very large integers. It doesn't mean you have to have large integers. We could, in this case, choose to represent a big int with just the number one, but we also could create something really big if we wanted to. 
So if I scroll back up, for example, and I look at num4 that we had defined up here, the one that gave us the warning, what if I wanted to actually make that a big int? Well, I can do that down here, but I'm gonna do it in a way that probably surprises you. So here, I'm gonna go through and you'll notice that I'm using these underscores. Now this might seem like, oh no, this is something completely new. Really here, this is just something that exists for us and not for the JavaScript engine. In between these digits, those underscores are going to get completely ignored, but this can help if we're dealing with large numbers and we want to actually have this represented in a way where we can read it. Uh, so here, this is going to be another big int. Now, unfortunately, when you're creating big ints, you cannot utilize E notation when you're creating it. So you'll need to actually write the number out. Now, this gives us two types that we're working with, numbers and big int. I need to tell you here that you always need to use the number type unless you know of a specific use case that requires you to use big int. A vast majority of the numeric operations and some of the tools that are provided by the engine really are designed to work with the number type and not big int. Big int is actually a more recent addition into JavaScript, but it is there if you do have use cases that require larger integers than the number type supports. So now we're gonna be understanding both null and undefined, and this will factor in quite a bit to the code that you're gonna write in JavaScript. So at a high level, you need to understand JavaScript undefined and null both represent something without a value, but for different use cases. So if you were to define a variable, but you didn't assign it a value, that is said to be undefined. But if you want something to not have a value on purpose, you can choose to assign it to be null. So before we dive in and look at this in VS code, let me just remind you that you can visit the web doc. So here I have the link for undefined. If you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you'll see that there is a link to get to the page on null as well. Now these don't have the kinds of properties and methods that we're used to seeing on some of the other data types, but I do wanna have this here so that you can review it. But as always, we wanna to get to the code, so let's pull up VS Code. So here within VS Code, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file. So here, we're gonna start off with one particular use case. So here, we're gonna go in and ask the question, what happens when you don't give a variable a value? Now, this is not something we have done yet. Every time we've used the let keyword or the const keyword, we have given a variable a value. But if you use the let keyword here, you can choose to initialize it and then at a later time go in and assign it a value. So what happens though, if we were to go in and actually log out the variable at this point? Well, that's exactly what we're gonna test out. So I'll hit F5 and we can see here that we end up with undefined, right? Now this is the description of the type that we have right now for this variable. A matter of fact, we can utilize a new kind of global function we haven't talked about yet called type of, and it will actually tell us the type of a particular variable. And in this case, if we were to go through and run this, we would also get that to come back as undefined. So that is the type. However, because we did use the let keyword, we could go through here and give this a value. And then if we went through and logged it out, it would no longer be undefined, but it would be the value that we assigned to the variable. So that is undefined. But we also have situations where we wanna actually purposefully set a variable to be nothing or an empty value. So let's use the example here of our employee directory that we're going to be building out over the course of this course. Well here, let's say you're talking about the CEO. Well, everyone else in the company will probably have a manager listed, but the CEO doesn't have a manager. So in this case, we would assign their manager to be null because it's empty. They don't have one. So in this case, we could then go through and say, okay, let's actually log out manager and let's see what the value is. So if I run F5, here we get back null. Now, we'll also go through and I'm gonna show you and explain one of the quirks that we occasionally see within JavaScript. If you remember, way back in JavaScript, the big picture, I mentioned that JavaScript is always backwards compatible. It's one of the things that makes JavaScript a bit different than other languages, and it also is kind of required because JavaScript is the language of the web. So here, one of the things we're gonna see is when we say type of, we would expect it to return null, but in this case, it's actually going to return type of as 
object. And this is one of the uh, big quirks that you'll see. It really shouldn't be object here. You can go do some research online, but because this was what it said at the very beginning of JavaScript, it is actually preserving that. So it doesn't break anything that is dependent on this returning object. So again, it's not really an object in this case, but because JavaScript is consistent with itself over time, that's the value that we get back here. But just as a reminder, we have two different things we're considering here. First, if you have something that hasn't yet been assigned, it is undefined. But if you want to purposefully set something to have an empty value, you would leverage null. So now we're going to talk about JavaScript objects. Now, as a reminder, just as with everything we've talked about so far, here we do have the documentation on the MDN web docs that's going to walk you through JavaScript objects. So again, you can dive in here if you have any questions after I finish going through the demonstration utilizing JavaScript objects. But let's go ahead and jump into VS Code. So here within VS Code, I'm gonna create a new file. Now here, I wanna show you a couple of different ways to go in and create a JavaScript object. Now the first way that I'm going to do here is what we would actually refer to as an object literal. So here, object one, and we just use this curly brace format. Now, the other approach that we could take is to actually use what we would call the constructor approach, which is going to use the new keyword. So here we can say new object and then just put parentheses and our semicolon. Now, with this, I would say that the first approach, the object literal is what you will generally see and it's what I would recommend you use whenever possible. And I'll show you why here in just a minute. But let's now talk about how we actually add some values onto our JavaScript object. So here, I'm gonna go in and add a string. So we'll say first name, because again, we're gonna eventually build out this employee directory. So here, we're just going to say, well, this object represents an employee. So here, we'll say dot first name, and this is using dot syntax. We'll then add in our value, which in this case would be David. Then we could go in and do the same thing for last name. We could then go in and add another data type. Let's say we'll add a Boolean here. So we'll say, okay, is this an active employee? We'll say true. But we don't have to just stop there. We could do a date as well, which you've seen me do already in this module. And we could even go in and add in a number. Let's say the number of vacation days this particular employee has. Now, all of these are now part of the JavaScript object. So if we were to go in, we could say, let's just log this out. Let's see what this looks like when we actually run this. So I'll hit F5. And we'll see here, it basically adds this in, in between those curly braces, we can see all the different values. We see the property name, colon, and then whatever value it is. So that's really what we need to know to create and access properties on an object. But what we can also do is we can actually populate an object when we create it, if we're using that object literal syntax. So here, I'm gonna keep the curly braces open and I'll go in and say, okay, first name, and I'll give it the value, and then I'll add a comma. And then I can do last name, give it the value and add the comma. Then I can go in and say, is active, start date, just like we did before. And you'll notice here that I can just enter in all of these in line so that as I'm creating the object, these different properties are getting populated. And what you'll notice here when I run this, if I hit F5, is that we get the exact same thing as what we had before. Okay. Now let's talk about how we can get to those properties once we create an object. So first of all, we can go in and get the first name by just saying object3.firstName. That's using the dot syntax. We also could go in and utilize this other syntax, which is our square bracket syntax. Here we put the name of the property that we want to access inside of quotes. So if I run this, just as you'd expect, I get the correct first name and the correct last name from my object. You can use either of these different ways to access those properties. Now, as a note, you can actually put spaces inside of your property names because it will take any valid string. But in this case, if you do that, if you put spaces in, you have to utilize the square bracket syntax. You can't use that with dot notation because that would be invalid JavaScript syntax. Now, let's talk about how we delete properties from an object. So if we want to do that, we can utilize the delete keyword and then just say, you know, what we're actually trying to delete. So in this case, object three, which is the name of our variable that's holding our object and first name. So now if I go through and log it out, 
will notice that it starts with last name. It doesn't start with first name anymore because we have removed that. Now, another thing that we can look at here is what happens if we try to access a property that we don't have, like middle name, for example, which I did not enter in. Now, what do you think it's gonna return here? I'm curious to get your thoughts because we just learned something in a previous clip that might give you a hint. So here I'll run it and we see that this comes back as undefined. And that's what we would expect here because this value hasn't been defined. You might say, well, I thought it would actually throw an error and blow up the particular execution of our JavaScript file. Well, in this case with objects, that is not the case. Now you are correct. If you just pick some random value and you were just saying that this was a variable that existed and we had never even initially created it, then yes, it would throw an error. But in this case with objects, it won't, it will just return undefined. Now let's talk about the difference between passing by reference and passing by value. So objects are indeed passed by reference. That means that when I create a variable, like my object three variable, for example, it isn't the variable itself is actually just a reference to a block of memory. So let's see how this plays out. So here I'm going to say object four is equal to object three. And you might say, okay, that makes sense. So now we have two variables that are both the same object. So what would happen then if I said object dot four and I set the last name to be Smith instead of Tucker in this case? Well, what do you think this would return? We're gonna go back and get object three dot last name. Do you think it's gonna be Smith or Tucker? Let's run it and see what happens. Well, now you can see it returns Smith. And you might say, well, wait a minute. We said object four dot last name should be Smith, but you're telling me object three dot last name is now Smith. Why is that? Well, the reason is, is because object four and object three are both pointing to the same block of memory. And so when we choose to update one, it is going to update the other. And this is very different from working with primitives where we actually pass the value. So in, in the case of a string, we're actually passing the string around. And if we do that, we can change it on one variable and it wouldn't affect another. But when we're passing by reference because it's pointing to the same block of memory, we would affect the other. And that's what we mean by the fact that objects are passed by reference. So now we're gonna talk about working with dates within our JavaScript code, something that I have only introduced up to this point. Now I wanna remind you, we do have documentation for the date object in JavaScript and you'll be coming to this page quite a bit if you're doing a lot of JavaScript code. Now, as a note here, it does let you know on this page that the TC39 committee, which again is the committee that manages the ECMAScript specification, is working on a new date time API. So you can dive in and click on those links and learn more about what the future of dates in JavaScript is gonna be. But as a reminder, JavaScript is always backwards compatible. So everything I'm showing you today will always work, even once this new temporal API is put into place. So let's jump in to VS Code. So I'm here within VS Code, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file. Now here within this new file, I first wanna start off by demonstrating some different ways that we can create dates within JavaScript. Now, as a note, when you create a date, it represents both a date and a time. So this value is a specific point in time, not just a given calendar date. Now you'll see that if I run this, this is gonna be F5 here to run it, and you're gonna notice that something strange happens. I included the date of 2023-0101. You would think this would be January 1st, 2023. But in this case, we see a return of value of December 31st, 2022 at 7 p.m. Well, why is this? Well, it is assuming that I am passing in values for UTC. And when I actually log this out, it's going to convert this to my current time zone, which is the Eastern Standard Time Zone. And so because of that, it's going to move it back five hours because I'm five hours behind GMT. Now let's look at another way that we could create a date. And this is the way that we have used up to this point. So here I'm gonna pass in a date string like you would write it if you were writing it somewhere. And in this case, it's going to assume that that is already in my current time zone. So if I were to run it here, we could see that that does return January 1st, 2023 at midnight. Now there's another thing that you'll need to do when you're creating JavaScript applications is you'll sometimes need to create a date for the current time. If we use this new keyword and we say new date and we don't pass in anything, then it's going to give us the date for the current time. 
So if I run that, you'll see January 27th, 2023 at 9.54 a.m. And that's the time I'm actually recording this clip. So another approach here is that to be very specific, we can utilize some standard formats for date strings. So here is a standard format that gives us the date and the time and the time zone all within one string. And so if we use a string like this, we can be sure that it's going to return the exact value that we specify. So you can see that down in the debug console. But we can also do it a different way. We can utilize the date constructor and pass in values for all the different elements of our time. So for example, if I ran this, you could see that this returns January 1st, 2023, because I've passed in 2023, zero. And again, that is the zero indexed month. So in this case, zero would mean January. One for the first day, two for 2 a.m., 30 for 30 minutes, and four for four seconds. So that shows you how to utilize the constructor and pass in each of the elements individually. Now, if we have a date, we can take advantage of some of the methods that are provided by JavaScript to access the pieces of data that are contained within that date. So for example, we might wanna get back the full year with get full year, or we might want to get back that zero indexed month with get month. Now again, that means for zero, it's gonna be January and December would be 11. Now, next, we could get the particular day of the month. So if we want to get back that value, we can call get date. Well, you might say, oh, is that zero index? No, that's not zero index. That would be a bit too confusing. So in this case, if it is January 1st, this value would return the number one. So next, we could also do something like get hours. So the current hours. So if it's 2 a.m., this would actually return to us the number two. So if I run all of this, you'll see all of these values return just as I mentioned. Now, these are not the only method. You can go through and look on the documentation page and find all the different methods that you can execute on a given date object. And this will actually return all the different elements that make up your date. But we need to have another conversation, and that is we need to talk about how dates are actually represented within JavaScript. And the way that JavaScript stores this is milliseconds from the epoch. Now the epoch is in some ways an, an arbitrary date that was chosen in the past, January 1st, 1970. And JavaScript tracks the number of milliseconds from that point, from midnight on January 1st, 1970 until the date that you have. So if you had an earlier time, then it would be a negative number. If it's after that, it would be a positive number. And you can get this number of milliseconds by calling the get time method on your date object. So if I run that here, we can see a pretty big sized integer that is going to be the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. Now I can prove to you that that's actually what it's calculating from because let's create another new date. We'll call this one date six and I'll pass in the number zero into the date constructor. Now what this is going to do is this is going to create a date that is zero milliseconds from the epoch. So exactly on the epoch but I'll need to get back a string that is actually for UTC, again, for Greenwich Mean Time, right? So I'm gonna say date six dot two UTC string. Now, if I run this with F5, you'll see that it returns January 1st, 1970 at midnight with Greenwich Mean Time. So this is how JavaScript actually stores the dates is by calculating those number of milliseconds from the epoch. So next, we're gonna talk about the concept of classes in JavaScript. So in terms of a basic definition, classes are a template for creating objects. They encapsulate data with code to work on that data. Classes in JavaScript are built on prototypes, but also have some syntax and semantics that are unique to classes. Now, much of that new syntax and semantics were added in the ES6 version of the ECMAScript specification. While we could do classes before that, it really didn't look a lot like classes, like what you would see in other languages. Now let's take a look here. We do have documentation for classes. So if you want to really dive in and understand at a deeper level how to create and leverage classes in JavaScript, you can certainly check out the MDN web docs for that information. Now I'm gonna give some information here that's not gonna mean much if you're brand new to classes, but this is more for people that have worked with classes in other languages. So here within JavaScript, our supported class features include constructors, static initialization blocks, public methods and fields, static methods and fields, private methods and fields, as well as inheritance, but 
as a note, really in the core, this is still prototypal inheritance, which again is something that is just a core part of JavaScript. Now let's go ahead and look at what it would look like to create a class in JavaScript. So here, I'm just gonna create a class that represents a calendar day. Now, you'll see that I use the class keyword and then I give it a name, and I have a constructor here. And in this constructor, I pass in three different values, the month, the day, and the year. Now, listen, I know we still haven't done a deep dive into functions yet. So again, if you're not familiar with this and if the syntax seems unusual, just know it will be covered thoroughly here within this course. But here we're passing in these values. Now to assign these to the private fields that we have created, we can use the this keyword, which is going to represent the state of the class. So here we can say that the month, day, and year correspond to those parameters. And then we just have a single public method to string where we can return all the information. So in this case, we'll do the year, dash, the month, and we'll go ahead and add one to the month. This shows you how you can utilize a JavaScript expression inside of this template literal and then we'll output a dash and then the day. And so that is the public method that we are exposing. So if we wanted to use our JavaScript class, we could go in and say that we wanted to create a new calendar day. So if you'll notice, this is a lot like how we create a new date, right? Except this is our custom class. And so here we can pass in the values 2023, zero and one, and then we can log out the result of our two string method, which would return to us 2023-1-1. And that's a very basic example of creating and using a JavaScript class. Now, now, if you wanna dive in and understand this at a deeper level, I have included the code that has been present here on these two slides in the exercise files for this module. So you can take it, expand on it, uh, break it, do whatever you'd like to learn how to work with classes in JavaScript. Now there will be a course later within this learning path that will dive into the whole concept of utilizing classes and object oriented programming at a deeper level. However, here within this particular course, we're just gonna be utilizing classes. We're not gonna be creating a lot of custom classes, but I wanted to show you how you could do that within JavaScript. So we just spent a whole module talking about some of the different data types that exist in JavaScript. And here within this module, we're going to be covering about data type conversion. So even though JavaScript does leverage dynamic typing, we still need to understand how types work in the language. So anyone that tells you you don't need to worry about types because JavaScript handles it for you, that's not entirely true. You need to know here how to convert from one type to another type. And we would call this process of changing conversion. Now there are several different use cases that you may run into when you wanna convert from one JavaScript type to another. And I'm going to give you some examples here, and these are all examples that we will be covering here within this course. So first, you might want to join a non-string value in with a string. Now we actually have already done this. I just didn't tell you that's what we were doing. And I will actually cover this one here within this clip. Or maybe you want to format a number into a string so that it can be displayed as something like currency. Or maybe you wanna format an object into a string, and maybe this is a date object. Maybe you just wanna show the calendar date and not the time zone and everything else that comes with the date. Or maybe you wanna export an object to some sort of a portable format that you can then load back in later, and we will do that here within this module. Or maybe you just wanna evaluate an expression to a Boolean value, which is so important, especially once we get to conditionals, which will be covered in a later module. So now that we've covered those concepts, we've covered some of these use cases, let's take a look at some of this in action. So I'm going to jump over to VS Code. So here within VS Code, the first thing I'm going to do is to create a new file. Now here within this file, I wanna remind you that we do have access to a function in JavaScript called type of, and this will return the type of any variable that we have created. So in this case, I'm going to create three variables, a string, a number, and a Boolean. And then for each of these, we will log out the type that gets returned by type of. So now if I were to hit F5, you can see that it returns a string, number, and Boolean, exactly what we wanted it to do. Now let's go ahead and talk about one of the use cases, the one that I mentioned at the very beginning, which is maybe we wanna join in a non-string value with a string. So the first thing we're going to do here is create a couple of different variables. 
Here we have an age, which is a number, and first name, which is a string. Now, one of the ways we can join this together is to use backticks and that template literal syntax. So here, if I was to create a new variable called description, utilize backticks and bring in both the first name and age, description will be a string and it will include both the first name and the age. And so it will have converted the age from a number value into a string that's included as a part of this overall string. So here, if I run F5, you can see just that. We now have a string that says David is 41 years old. Okay, perfect. Let's talk about another use case, and that is the use case where maybe we want to convert a string into a number. Now, this one is a little bit less straightforward. Let's say we do create a string here and it has the numbers four and one in it. Well, to create a number, we can utilize the number function. Now notice this is not a constructor call here. We're not saying new number. A matter of fact, you want to avoid utilizing the new keyword when you are converting data from one type to another. So here we're gonna say that we wanna create a number from this string. So now once we've done that, if we were to log this out, what do you think it would say for type of? Well, let's run it and see. And indeed, in this case, it comes back that it is a number. So we have successfully been able to convert these two characters, four and one, into the number 41. Now, this also brings up another interesting case, and that is this. What if we do go in and use the new keyword? So I'm going to show you why you generally don't want to do that. So here we'll create a new number. We're gonna say new and use the new keyword. But then what we're gonna do is I'm going to run type of on the return value. Now, if we run this, if I hit F5, we actually don't get back a number, we get back an object. And in most cases, that's not what you're going to want to do. A matter of fact, I'll just say, unless you fully understand the ins and outs of the differences, you probably just wanna stick with number and not worry about the new keyword. We also have another scenario we have to cover here in this use case. And that is, what if we pass it a string that it just can't convert into a number? I'm gonna pass in the string here, the words 41, and then we're gonna to try to create a number from that. And I'll go ahead and tell you that it can't handle that. And so what does it return? Well, let's go ahead and run it and see. So here we get a value back. It says N-A-N, that stands for not a number. This is what gets returned if we try to convert something into a number type, but it can't actually be parsed into a number. We also have some other cool capabilities that are included at the language level that let us check to see if a value is NAN or not a number. And here I'm going to use the isNAN function to go in and check for that. And so if I run this now, we can indeed see that it is invalid. It did return true for that value. But let's talk about another one. Let's talk about how we convert a value into a Boolean. And in this case, we're going to say a number. So here I'll create two numbers, one and zero, and then I'll create two Booleans from those two numbers. So here we'll say that we have a Boolean based on num1 and a Boolean based on num2, and then we'll log out these two values. So what do you think these values are gonna be? Well, let's run it and see. So it returns that num1, which is the number one, would evaluate to true, and num2, which is zero, would evaluate to false. Now this will become very important once we get to conditionals, but we see things like zero and null and undefined evaluating to be false, and then anything that isn't a zero value evaluating to true. And we can see that that is playing out here when we convert these numbers over. Let's look at another example. What about converting a string into a Boolean? So here we'll create a new string called hello, and then we'll actually convert that to a Boolean. But then, I'm gonna take another value and I'm not going to assign anything to this variable yet. And if you remember in the previous module, we said that the value of this variable, which in this case is val1, is going to be undefined. So what do you think that's going to turn into when we convert it to a Boolean? And we can see here that bool3 does evaluate to be true because that is the string that actually has a value. And bool4 evaluates to false because again, that one was undefined. So that's going to turn into false when we convert it into a Boolean. Okay, so now I have one thing left to show you, and this might be one of the easiest things we've covered so far in this clip. I'm gonna show you how we convert a Boolean to a string. And this has actually been happening even throughout this clip, right? So in this case, we're going to create a new Boolean variable called bool5, and I'm just gonna set it to be true. 
And then I'm going to log this out as a string. And in doing so, again, if I were to go in and actually run this with F5, we'll see that that one turns out to be true. So here, we'll just see the words true and false if we convert a Boolean into a string. Now, we don't have to do that here with template literal syntax. We could also do that utilizing the string function, just like we've done with the number function and the Boolean function. But now that we've covered that, we need to get into some other, even more powerful use cases for converting between one JavaScript type to another. So next, we're gonna cover a special case for conversion, and that is converting to JSON. So let me explain to you what JSON is and why it should matter to you. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and it enables developers to convert a JavaScript object into a string. Now this string can be passed between applications, stored in the local file system, or loaded at runtime. And those are just a few of the different use cases that you can leverage when you're working with JSON. Now let's just look at a quick example of this. So first of all, JSON is just a string. So everything you're looking at here is just going to be a string value. And you might notice that this looks in many ways very similar to our object literal syntax that we've used to create JavaScript objects, but there are some differences that we'll cover in a minute. But I could create an object and then convert it to JSON and I could end up with a value like this. Let's go through and talk about some specifics about JSON. First of all, as I mentioned, it is similar to the object literal syntax. However, there are some differences, including that it requires double quotes for property names, which we don't have to have quotes at all on property names when we're using the object literal syntax. Also, it requires that any string values also be enclosed in double quotes. Also, when you create JSON from an object, it won't include undefined properties or functions. So there are some things that just can't be properly replicated in JSON from a valid JavaScript object. In addition, JavaScript has methods for converting to JSON as well as converting from JSON to an object. However, as I'll go through here in just a minute, there are some limitations and sometimes you'll have to do some custom work to make it work the way that you would like. Now, as a reminder, we do have documentation. In this case, there's a whole page on JSON on the MDN web docs that you can review if you want to dive in and understand any of the rules at a deeper level but let's actually work with JSON. So let's jump into VS Code. So I'm here within VS Code, and the first thing I'm gonna do is to create a new file. Now here within this file, I first wanna create a JavaScript object. And I'm going to do this just using the object literal syntax that we've used so far. And we'll give it some different values. We're gonna have first name and last name, which would be strings. We'll have birth date, which will be an actual date object. We'll have num years of employment, which is going to be a number, specifically an integer. We'll have department and title, which will both be strings, is active, which is a Boolean, and then salary, which will also be a number. So this is just a basic JavaScript object. Hopefully, all of this looks familiar to you. We have covered all of these different data types in the previous module. So how do we actually convert this to JSON? Well, here we can utilize a method on the JSON global object called stringify. And this will take any object that you pass in and convert it into a JSON string. So I'm not doing this here, but if I were to do type of JSON value, it would return string. So let's go ahead and run this and let's see what we get. So I can see that I have a string output here that is JSON. Now, with this being said, there's a few bits here that are a little bit hard to read. So I'm actually gonna show you a little trick here that we can do to make this a bit easier to read. So I'm going to re-stringify this object, but I'm gonna pass in null and then the number two as two additional arguments to that method. Now, this isn't going to change anything in terms of the JavaScript engine. It's just going to change the way that it actually creates this string by adding in, in this case, two spaces per indentation level. So if I were to run this now, we can see that we get something out that's a little bit easier to read. Now, there's a few things I want to point out here. First of all, most things convert the way that we would think. Our strings remain strings, our Boolean remains a Boolean, and our numbers remain numbers. However, you'll notice here that our date was converted into a string. And in some ways, that presents a bit of a problem for us when we go back and convert this into an object, but we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Okay, 
So now that we have that in place, let's keep moving forward. So let's talk about how you do the opposite. How do you take a JSON string and convert it back into an actual JavaScript object? Well, in this case, we can utilize the json.parse method, and this will take in your string and it will return an object that is created from that string. So now if I were to run this, we can see that it does indeed return an object. And so you'll notice here though that our birth date is actually still a string because if you remember it converted it to a string. So later on, we'll learn how to convert this back into a date. We won't be covering that quite yet, but just know it's possible, but it will require a little bit of custom code to make that work as intended. Okay, so now that we've covered that, let's keep moving forward. Now, another thing we can do is we can actually write our own JSON. I just wanna show you this because there are times you'll want to do this. Now, I'm just gonna create a string. Now, I'm using backticks because I want this to be a multi-line string, and here I'm just passing in two different string values. And I could go through if I wanted to and create an object just based off this JSON string. And if I did that, I would end up with a valid object. And I'll run this here to show you that's the case. Here you can see we do get back an object where we have first name and last name, and we have the correct names in place, the correct string values. And this also presents an interesting challenge. What happens when you try to parse something that's not valid JSON? What would you do? Well, in this case, if we were to look at this, I'm just saying hello as a string, that's not valid JSON. And so if I try to parse it, what do you think is gonna happen? Well, in this case, we're gonna actually run into an error. So it's actually tried to parse this and it's basically saying, hey, I can't do it. In this case, it says there is a syntax error that there is an unexpected token. Now, we will cover how to deal with this later because anytime you do parse JSON, you need to account for this as a possibility. However, we're not covering that just yet, but we'll cover that when we get to error handling within our JavaScript applications. So now we're gonna talk about the process of formatting numbers. And trust me, you'll be utilizing this probably even more than you think you will. So let's talk about some different use cases that we might run into where we will need it to format a number. And maybe it's just something simple, like we wanna display a number and we need to round a number to its nearest integer value. Or maybe we want to just limit the number of decimal places that are actually displayed when we're showing a number. So instead of showing a hundred different points after the decimal, we just wanna show two, for example. Or maybe we want to output a number to a certain geographic area. So not all areas actually display numbers in the same way, so we might need to convert it for that reason. Or maybe we wanna do a specific use case tied to something like a currency format. These are all different use cases that would lead you to format numbers when you're using them within your JavaScript applications. Now, I need to introduce another concept that will be essential to what we'll be covering here in this module, and that is the concept of a locale. So in computing, a locale is a set of parameters that defines the user's language, region, and then any special variant preferences that the user wants to see in their user interface. So usually a locale identifier consists of at least a language code and a country or region code. So locale is an important aspect of I18N. Now, if you ever see the term I18N, that actually is just short for internationalization. And that's what we're gonna be looking at here. So to just make that real, anytime we have a locale code, we're going to have generally three elements. So we will have the first identifier, a dash, and then the second identifier. And if you go by what we just learned from the previous slide, the first identifier will be for the language and the second identifier will be for the region. So in this particular example, this is the locale code for English spoken in the United States. Now here we can see a list of a bunch of different sample locale codes. Now again, these are just samples. There are many, many more that exist. This is simply a small fraction of what's available, but I wanted you to see how these are represented for different areas in the world, and we'll be using some of these when we head over to VS Code in just a minute. But before we go to VS Code, I do wanna point out two additional areas of documentation. One is for the math built-in object, the global object that is available within JavaScript. So here you can follow the link on the screen to learn more about the different methods that are provided in that global object. And we also have the international number format object that we have available 
within JavaScript, we'll be using this as well. So you can follow this link on the screen to get more information about it. Okay, now that we have all of that out of the way, let's jump in to VS Code. So I'm here in VS Code, and the first thing I'm going to do is to create a new file. Now, within this file, I'm gonna go in and start off by just creating a number. And I wanna talk about how we can actually manipulate this number in three different ways. So you'll notice here we have 5.618345. Well, there's a lot of different things we might want to do. We might want to round this to the nearest integer. And so if we wanted to do that, there would be one global method we use from the math object. Maybe we want to actually have it give us the next integer past this value, or maybe we want to give it the integer that it just passed. So in those cases, we have three different methods. So if I look here, we're first going to just do the rounding, and that's going to be math.round, and then we pass in our number. The next one is ceiling. That is going to give us the first integer past this value. And then we have floor, and that is going to give us the integer that we went past before we got to this value. And so if we were to actually go through and run this by just hitting F5, you'll see that if we round the number because it's 5.6, it's going to round up to number six as the integer. If we use seal, which is short for ceiling, that's going to be the number six as well because that is the first integer past this value. And then if we do floor, that's gonna give us the last integer before this value, and that would actually come out as five. So that's just a really basic way to utilize that math global object to format and manipulate the numbers that we're passing into it. But we actually need to walk through a lot more. Let's talk about another example. So here, I wanna talk about fixed. So what we can do is we can call to fixed on any number, and what this is going to do, it is going to fix the number of decimal places that we have after the decimal point. So if you notice here in our original number, num1, we have six different places after the decimal. What we're asking here in using to fixed is to return only three decimal points. Now, I want to call out here the type of data that's returned. That's why here in the console.log statement, I am running type of. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So here you can see it actually returns a string and not a number. Again, this is what we would use to actually display a value where we didn't have maybe a huge number of digits after the decimal point. And you can see that in the value, it's returned 5.618, which is the first three decimals after the decimal point. And that's how we would utilize to fixed if we wanted to display a subsegment of the overall number of decimal points. Now let's keep going here because the other thing we might want to do is display a number in a format for a specific locale. Now, I'm gonna create a number here called num2. And here, I'm going to use the underscores, but again, we don't have to use those. That's just a way to make it easier to read. So this number here is one million, but that isn't displayed the same way everywhere. So let's go ahead and see what we would do if we wanted to format it for the USA, right? And we're going to use that locale string en-us, which again is short for English in the United States. And so if I run that by hitting F5, we can see that it returns one comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. That's how it would be displayed in the US. But we also could choose to look at it from somewhere else. In this case, we'll look at it from Greece. So let's go ahead and run that. And you can see here that instead of commas, we're actually using decimal places. So those two different bits of punctuation actually switch places here. Now we could go ahead and look at another example, which would be here, we want to look at Bangladesh. And so in this case, we can pass in the correct locale code. And when we run it, we can see that we just have spaces. I'm gonna give you one more example here. And so here we could do Punjab and we could go in and pass in the correct locale code. And when we run it, you're gonna notice that we actually have completely different comma placement than we did for the US. Now here's the great thing you don't have to remember all of these rules. This is something that is built in to JavaScript. So we can actually format numbers to the correct locale. Now, sometimes we wanna do something that's even more complicated. And that is we want to go in and we actually want to format currency. And if you think about it, currency can be displayed in a lot of different ways. Now, let me explain what I'm doing here. I have a salary number. So let's pretend that we have an employee that makes 100,000 a year. Now you might say, well, 100,000 what? Well, 
That's what we're going to convert it to here in a minute. But let's say, what would their monthly salary be? So I'm going to go ahead and give an example here of utilizing two fixed. We're going to return this with two decimal places. So if I go in and run this with F5, we can see that the monthly salary is 8,333 and 33 whatever. Again, we haven't defined what currency this is, so I can't actually give this any type of a descriptor yet. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what this would be if we were going to format this specifically for the US, so ENUS, just like we did before. Now there's a few different steps here, and I realize we haven't yet gone through and talked about functions yet and arguments and all of these things. So I realize some of this might seem a little bit strange, but what we need to do is give it two bits of information. The first is we do need to give it that locale, which we have, that's en-us, and we also need to tell it what currency we're wanting to convert it to. So in this case, that is USD. And there is a standard three letter identifier for every currency, and that's what we're going to be using here. So if I were to run this, you can see that this would come out to be $8,333.33. But we could go through and display several different currencies. And you can see that there's a lot of different rules that go into different currencies. So maybe we want to actually convert this into euros, for example, right? So we could log that out. Or maybe we want to go in instead of that, we actually want to utilize Japanese yen because there is something that's unique about yen and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Or maybe we actually want to do Hong Kong dollars. And so we could actually enter in the correct locale code for that as well, as well as the correct currency code. So now that I'm getting all of these in place, we'll run all of these together so you can see the different ways that currency would be displayed. So here, if you see the US dollars, that's what we saw before. In euros, we actually have the identifier that comes after the number. For yen, we only have the whole numbers. We don't have what we would call minor units in their currency. And Hong Kong dollars looks a lot like US dollars, except we have the prefix HK that comes before the dollar sign. And so these are all different ways that we can convert numbers that we have into values, whether it's just number values or currency values that are specific to different languages and different geographic regions in the world. So we've already covered how to access the different elements of a date, but now I want to dive in and take it further and introduce you to some additional capabilities that you have when you're working with the global date object in JavaScript. So let's jump right to VS Code. So here in VS Code, the first thing I'm going to do is to create a new file. Now here within this new file, I want to start off by creating a date. So here we'll utilize the standard date format that it's actually expecting. Now we're going to specify here a date of January 23rd. It's going to be 223 in the afternoon, and it's going to be in the Eastern Standard Time Zone. We can see all of that through that standard string that's been included. However, if we were to just automatically convert this to a string, we get a pretty long bit of information. So let's go ahead and hit F5 and run this. And you can see we get a full date string that actually gives us all of that information, including the day of the week and a bunch of different bits of information. Well, sometimes we don't want to display all of that. And maybe, for example, we just want to actually display the calendar date. So one of the things we can do is we can utilize the methods that are included with our date object, such as to date string. Now, if I were to run this, I get back some information. It says Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Now, notice here that we're using the short version of Monday and the short version of January. So maybe this isn't necessarily ideal. And ideally, we want to have the ability to customize this a bit. But if you remember from our previous clip, one of the areas of customization that we may need to do is to customize something for other locales. And so if we want to take a look at the other locales and how we would format that, we can utilize another method that's included with the global date object, which is to locale date string. So let's go ahead and take a look at how that would work. So I'm going to start off here by doing the same thing with the same date, but we're going to utilize this new method. And I'll start by passing in the locale ENUS for again, English speaking here in the United States. So if I run this value, I'm going to get back one slash 23 slash 2023. Now that seems like that's a pretty good date string if you're in the United States. However, 
we know that other places choose to actually lay out those different numbers in a different order, such as in the UK. So if I were to run this, you can see that returns the day and then the month and then the year instead of the month, day, year. But we could go even further than that and take a look at what it would be like if we were in Japan. So here I'll do the same thing and pass in the locale JAJP. And then if we run it, we'll see yet again a different order year, month, day. Now you've probably guessed this, but we don't have to just do calendar dates. As I mentioned to you, our date objects in JavaScript represent both dates and times. So if we want to extract the time, we can also do that utilizing two time string. So if I were to run this now, you would see that this returns with 14, 23, 02, and then the specific time zone, which in this case is going to be Greenwich Mean Time minus five hours, which of course is Eastern Standard Time. But we can also do the same thing with this because we will at times have to format times to be different locales. So let's take a quick look at what that would look like. So here we'll do the same thing and start off with ENUS. So I'll pass that in and I'll run that. And you can see here, this returns to 23.02 PM. Perfect. Now, if I was to keep going, we could then take a look at the same other locale. So here we'll do the UK. And if I pass this in and then hit F5, we're gonna see that it returns by default to 24 hour time. So 14.23.02. But if we went and looked at Japan, we would see that it's actually going to, to share a value. But let me go ahead and hit F5. And so you can see here, the time in this case replicates what's included in the UK. So sometimes we will want a little bit more ability to customize this. And here we're gonna get into some things that are a little bit more advanced. So I wanna go ahead and show you that we're gonna define a just object literal. We'll call this options. And I'm going to include two different properties, one called date style and one called time style. And I'm gonna specify here that both of these are short. So this is the options object that will allow me to customize how the JavaScript date object gets translated into a string. And I wanna give you a couple of different options here. So let's go ahead and look first at what it would look like in ENUS. That's generally where we start. That's the locale that I'm in. And so if we say to locale string, we pass an ENUS and then we pass in the options, I can get back just the date comma and then the time. And in a lot of cases that might be what I want, but there's also a lot of additional customizations, but we'll talk more about that in just a minute. We also have the option to go in here and say, well, let's do it for a completely different type of language. So in this case, we'll do Arabic in Kuwait. And so if I were to run this and hit F5, we would see that this returns a completely different string, but here we have time first followed by the date. It's gonna be year and then month and then day. So we can showcase a good degree of flexibility with the included date object. Now there are many different libraries and we'll talk more about third party modules later within this course. There are many utilities out there to help you work with JavaScript. However, one of the great things is, is that you get a lot of this native internationalization capability with the date object that's included with JavaScript and you can customize it. Now, I noticed I've only shown you here the customization for date style and time style. So I quickly want to call out here the international date time format constructor. So the options object that you pass into to locale string includes the same objects as we have here on the date time format constructor. And so you can go through and see all of the different values here that you can specify. So if I scroll down here to options, you can see we have date style, we have time style, we have different calendars, we have different day periods. There's so much that we can change here based on what we're looking to do with the format of our dates. And we'll get into some more advanced use cases for this later, but what I wanted to cover in this module was that you can indeed customize how your dates get converted from date objects into strings in JavaScript. Up to this point, our code has followed a single path. And for some things, that's just fine. However, for most real world applications, our code needs to do something different depending on different values that are passed into it, whether from user input or from stored data. Let's use an example with our company directory. Amazon uses a color badge system to indicate the length of time people have been working at the company. When employees start, they have a badge outlined in blue. Once they reach their fifth year, they actually get a badge in yellow. At the end of 10 years, this changes to red, 
and for year 15, it goes to purple. And at 20, it changes to the final color of silver. Now, how could we add this to our company directory? Now, we could certainly go in by hand and update everybody's records every few weeks, but that is wildly inefficient. What if there was a way to get badge color based on the number of years the employee has been working at the company? Well, there is, but we'll need to use two different things to make this work, comparison operators and conditionals. Now, these are core concepts that you will truly use every single day when writing JavaScript. Now, let's start first by looking at comparison operators. Now, I introduced the concept of operators earlier in the course, and these were the symbols that represent some specific actions that we will be taking on one or more values. Now, the values are called operands. Now, we have used two types of operators, assignment operators and mathematical operators. Now, if you remember, we were able to assign a variable the result of a mathematical expression. In this case, two plus three. Now, in this case, the plus sign is the mathematical operator and the equal sign is an assignment operator. Now, comparison operators are used to compare two different values. These expressions always evaluate to a Boolean value. Now, we have three different types of comparisons that we can do with these operators. If an operand is greater than or less than the other, if the two operands are equal, or if the two operands are not equal. In this first example, you can see that since 10 is greater than four, the value of the expression is true. And if you remember, these conditional operators always evaluate to a Boolean value. Next, you can see that since five is equal to five, and we use the greater than or equal to operator, this expression also evaluates to true. Next, we will look at equality. Now, I need to mention that JavaScript has two different types of equality operators. I'll be using the strict equality operators for these examples, but I'll be explaining the difference later in this module. In this example, I can check to see if the two different string values are equal. Since these are two different strings, this will evaluate to false. I can also check to see if two numbers are not equal to each other. And in this case, since four and seven are not equal, this will return true. Now that we've learned about the basics of comparison operators, we can do powerful things with them. One of the things is conditionals. Now, if we go back to our employee badge question, we could write logic to assign the proper badge color based on the number of years the employee has worked for the company. To do this, we will use two new keywords, if and else. These keywords are used in conditional statements. First, we can create a variable that we will use to store the badge color. Next, we can check to see if the employee has under five years of service. If so, we can set that color to blue. Now we can write this all on one line. Now the code after the conditional won't be executed unless the conditional evaluates to true. Now we'll talk later in this module about what evaluates to true. In most cases, we don't write it on a single line. We use curly braces to define a code block that will get executed if the conditional evaluates to true. Now we can add as many statements as we want inside of this code block. While this gets us to the first badge, we have more that we need to check for. Next, we will put the two keywords together, else if. If the first conditional evaluates to false, that first block will not be executed. It will continue to the next statement, which is else if in this case. Here, we can add another conditional. Now here, we will include checks for the yellow, red, and purple badges. Now, if we get to this point and none of the conditionals have been true, what do we know? Well, in this case, we know that they have been at the company for more than 20 years, and they should have a silver badge. We can use the else keyword to signify this. It represents the code block that will execute if all of the other conditionals evaluate to false. Now, you don't have to have an else block, but in this case, we need it to account for that last badge option. Now, over the course of this module, you will be diving in and learning even more about operators and conditionals. We have just touched the surface of what's possible here. We will wrap up the module by adding in these concepts to the company directory application that we've been building throughout the course. So we've used mathematical operators a few times already in this course. So I just wanna take a step back and review all the mathematical operators that you have available to you so you can feel comfortable using them in your JavaScript code. So let's jump right to VS Code. So here within VS Code, the first thing I need to do is to create a new file. 
Now here within this file, we're gonna go ahead and look at the different mathematical operators that we have available to us. So we'll start here with addition. And I realize this is pretty simple. We're just adding three and two together. So when I run this by hitting F5, we'll see that the output is indeed five. But let's keep going because we also here can choose to add a positive and then a negative number. And in doing so, we're really kind of creating subtraction here, but two plus negative one should give us one. So if we run this, we can see that that is indeed the case. Now, just like we use the addition operators, we can do the same thing for subtraction. So here is an example where we're doing three minus one, and then we could keep going with this and do one minus negative one, which should actually yield two. So if I run this, we can see that both of those values come back as two. So that works probably exactly like you would expect. Now we have division, and here with division, we just use a slash. So here in this case, we can see three divided by one is gonna to return to us three. And then we could go through and do 21 divided by nine. So this is not going to return a whole number. And so if we run this, we're gonna see that we get 2.333 and so on and so forth. So next, let's look at multiplication. So here in multiplication, we're going to utilize the asterisk character. And so here three times two should give us six. And then we'll do another example here of three times three. So this just gives us a couple different examples here. And if we run this, we can see that we get six and nine respectively, which is exactly what we would expect. Now that gives us kind of the four basic operators. Let's talk about some other operators that we have available to us. So in JavaScript, there are times when you want to divide and then simply return the remainder. So here, nine divided by two. So let me go ahead and hit F5 to run this. And nine divided by two is going to give us a remainder of one, because here it would be four and then there would be one remaining. Now we could also do this with a negative number. And here, if we were to log this out, we would actually get negative three. So here you can see that we are able to get the remainder because in this case, seven would go into 10 one time, there would be three left. Now, because we had a negative number to begin with, we're going to get back a negative remainder. Now, we also have an exponential operator here. So we can go through and say, for example, do three to the second power. And we do that with a double asterisk here. So here, if I were to run this, we're going to get back nine because three times three equals nine but we also could go through and do an exponent that is negative, in which case this would, when we run it, give us 0 0.5, because we're going to get one over two in this case, because we're doing a negative exponent. Now, there's one other thing I wanna show you here, and that is I wanna show you the increment and decrement operators. So here, I'm gonna create a new variable called val13. We'll set it equal to one. And then I'll use this syntax that you see here where I go, plus plus before the name of the variable. Now what this is going to do, in this case, because we're using two plus operators, it's going to increase the value of the variable by one. So here, if I run this by hitting F5, we can see that this does return two for val13 because we are incrementing the value. Now let me go through and let me do another one here, which val14 will be one, and then I'll use two minus signs. Now this is going to decrease or decrement the value by one. So if I were to run this, we could see that indeed that returns zero because one minus one equals zero. So now we're gonna dive in and talk at a deeper level about assignment operators. Now we've obviously been using the equal sign up to this point to assign a value to a variable, but when you pair the information that we just learned about mathematical operators we have some new ways that we can assign values, and we're gonna take a look at that here. So let's just go ahead and jump right in to VS Code. So here within VS Code, the first thing I'll do is to create a new file. So here within this file, I'll just demonstrate the kind of assignments that we've been doing so far. We can just simply create a variable and then assign it a value using the equal sign. And that's true whether it's a string, a number, a Boolean, or an object. In any case, it works the same way. But as I mentioned, when you pair this with the mathematical operators that we just learned about, we gain some abilities to do some different types of assignments. So here, I'm setting val1 to be equal to three. Now in the next line, I'm using a new operator, plus and equals together. 
So here I'm saying val1 plus equals six. And you'll notice here in the comment right next to this, this is the exact same thing as saying val1 is equal to val1 plus six, but we're able to do this with a lot less code using the plus and equals together. So if we were doing three plus six, val1 should in this case equal nine. So let me run it here. We'll see that indeed it does equal nine. So let's look at another example, because as you've probably guessed, we can do minus equals as well. So in this case, two minus one should give us indeed one. Now we don't just stop with addition and subtraction. We can do the same thing here for multiplication. So six times two, in this case, will give us 12. And we can go through and also do the same thing with division. So in this case, 10 divided by five. So that would give us two. Now this also works if we're utilizing the exponent, for example, two to the third power in this case, which we could see that return eight. Or if we're utilizing the remainder operator, we can do that as well. So here we can see that if we divide 21 by eight, that the remainder that we get back is five. Now I wanna to talk to you about the assignment when we're utilizing the increment and decrement operators. So here, this might work different than you would expect it to. So here we'll set val seven equal to 10. And then I'm going to set val eight equal to val seven and then the increment operator. So in this case, what do you think seven would equal? What do you think eight would equal? Well, let me go ahead and run it and let's see what it says. Well, in this case, it says that val seven is 11 and val eight is 10. Now for many of you, you might say that is the exact opposite of what I was expecting. So let's quickly take a look at something that is found in the docs. So here, if we look in the MDN web docs, it says that if we use these increment and decrement operators in prefix, meaning before the variable, then the increment operator increments and returns the value after incrementing. So in other words, if we were incrementing from one to two, it would go ahead and increment that, and then it would return the number two. So if we were assigning it to another variable, it would get that value. However, if we use it postfix, meaning after the variable, then in that case, it will increment. However, it will return the value before incrementing. So let's bounce back over to VS Code to understand that in practice. So here in our case, with the example that we just did, because we're including that increment operator after the variable val seven, it will increment 10 to 11, but it will actually return the number 10 to assign that to val eight before it does that. That's why val seven becomes 11 and val eight becomes 10. Now, if we were to go through and do it a different way, in this case, we'll utilize the decrement operator before the variable. In this case, when we run it, we can see that both of them are equal to nine. Because we put it in front of the variable, it's going to return the value after it decrements. So now we're gonna talk about comparison operators. I introduced this concept in the first clip here in this module, but I wanna dive in and understand these at a deeper level. And this is going to be essential before we dive in and start working with conditionals here in a few clips. So let's go ahead and jump over to VS Code. So here within VS Code, you guessed it, I'm gonna create a new file. We'll call this one comparison. Now here, I wanna go ahead and start with something that's fairly simplistic. I wanna start off with the process of checking for greater than or less than with numbers. So here we'll start off with a basic example where val one will be equal to the expression seven is greater than five. Now remember that any conditional expression is going to evaluate to a Boolean value. So this could only be true or false. And in this case, since we know that seven is greater than five, this will return true. So when I hit F5, it does indeed return true. Now, let me show you another example. I wanted to show you that you don't have to use the parentheses that I've been using for these comparisons. In this case though, it does make it a bit easier to read. So when we remove those parentheses, things kind of get crowded and it's a little harder to just glance at it and understand what we're doing. 
But here in this case, we're checking to see if five is less than or equal to three. Now we know that five is greater than three, so this one should evaluate to false. So if I hit F5, we'll see that indeed this does evaluate to be false. Now let's start looking at the concept of equality. We're gonna check and see if two values are equal. Now you'll notice here that I'm using three equal signs. This is what we call strict equality. Now I'll explain later in this clip what the difference is between equality and strict equality. But in this case, since three is equal to three, when we run this, we should get a true value back. And indeed we do. Now let me give you another example. Here we'll check to see if true is equal to false. Now, as you guessed, that's gonna return false because those two are not the same. Now, in some cases, we might want to check to see if things are not equal. So here, I have two strings that are not the same. Even though they have the same letters, they're not the same case. So in this case, we're gonna to check to see if they are not equal. Now, we do that by utilizing the exclamation point followed by two equal signs. Now, this is a strict non-equality check. So in this case, I'll hit F5, and we'll see that that one returns true because those two values are not equal. Okay, let's keep moving forward here. Let's look at primitive equality. So here, I'm gonna create two strings. They're both going to have the exact same text in it. And then I'm going to check to see if they're equal. Now, what do you think it's gonna do? Do you think it's gonna return true? Or do you think it's gonna return false? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and run it, and you will see that it does return true. Now, the reason is, is because with primitives, we're going to just check the value. But things work different as we move into objects because those are passed by reference. So here, I'm gonna create object one, which is going to be an empty object. I will do the exact same thing for object two. Now, I'm going to check to see if these two are equal. What do you think it's gonna return? Well, let me hit F5. And here, you can see that it returns false. It says they are not the same. The reason is, is because object one is pointing to a block of memory. Object two is pointing to a different block of memory because I created a completely new object for each of them. Now, I wanna show you though, that if they are pointing to the same block of memory, that it will return true. So let's do another example. Here, I'm gonna set object three to be equal to object two. And then I'll go through and see now, because those two were pointing to the same object, if object two and three are equal. And when I hit F5 to run it, we'll see that indeed that returns true because now those are both pointing to the same block of memory. Now I teased earlier in this clip, this concept of equality versus strict equality. So let's take a minute and let's take a look at that. So in JavaScript, there are two different sets of equality operators. We have the two equal signs and then the exclamation point and equal sign together. And these are just the standard equality operators. However, when we're looking at three equal signs and then the exclamation point and two equal signs, these are the strict equality operators. So the latter requires that both the value and the type match. So let's take a look at this in action over in VS Code. So here within VS Code, I wanna show you the difference between these two. So we're going to do two different comparisons here. I'm gonna start off utilizing the standard equality check with a string that says 42 and a number that's 42. And then I'm going to do another strict check with the same two values. So what do you think it's gonna return? Well, I'll hit F5 here and you can see that the first one returns true and the second one returns false. Now the reason is with the first one, it starts off with a string. Now it's going to try to convert the next value to a string. It's gonna take that number, which is 42, convert it into a string, which would be equal to the first. But with the second one, because they're different types, it's going to say no, that these aren't equal. Let me show you another example. So here, we'll take a look at the values of undefined and null. Well, they both represent an empty value, but in this case, they are different types. So what do you think is gonna happen? Well, if you guess that the first one is gonna be true and the second one's gonna be false, you are again correct. Because in this case, even though they both are empty values, they are of different types. So my recommendation for you is that you always use strict equality operators unless you fully understand the different behavior of these standard equality operators. In most cases, if you really are checking for equality, you care that the values and the types are the same. So now we're gonna talk about 
falsy values. And this is something that is critical to understand before you start working with conditionals. Now, your reaction to this probably should be, okay, what are falsy values? Well, let's take a look in the documentation. So here from the MDN web docs, a falsy, which again is also sometimes written with an EY at the end, is a value that is considered false when encountered in a Boolean context. So JavaScript uses type conversion to coerce any value to a Boolean in contexts that require it, such as conditionals and loops. And if we were to actually dive in, there is a page in the docs that will go through and talk about all of the different falsy values that are included within JavaScript. So for example, we know that false evaluates to false, but there are other values that also will evaluate to false. So you can certainly go in and review the docs, but let's also dive into VS Code to get an understanding of how this works in practice. So I'm here within VS Code, and the first thing I'll do is to create a new file. So here within this file, I'm going to start off with something that we haven't fully covered yet. I'm going to create a function that will enable us to test and see if something evaluates to being true, which is generally called truthy, or something that will evaluate to be false, which would be a falsy expression. So let's take a look at some different values and we'll see if they ultimately evaluate to be true or false. Now we'll start off here with numbers and we'll start off with just a basic one here, the number zero. Do you think this is going to evaluate to be true or false? Well, if I go in and run this, we'll see that this one does come back as false. So generally anything that represents an empty value will evaluate to be false. And we'll see some other examples of that here in just a bit. But anything that actually has a value, and that could be something that is either positive or negative, in these cases, those values will evaluate to be true. Okay, let's keep moving forward here. Let's take a look at something that is not a number. What do you think this will evaluate to? Well, this one also evaluates to false. We also could take a look at a big integer or big int. So if I were to do this, what do you think this would equal? Well, in this case, because it is still a zero, even though it is still a big int, it's also going to evaluate to be false. But any big int that it has a value would evaluate to be true. Okay, let's look at Boolean null and undefined. So first of all, we'll look at something that we've talked about before already is undefined and null. And then we'll also just evaluate false. Again, this one's kind of the, uh, the given out of the bunch. But if I were to run these, you would see that both undefined and null evaluate to be false and false obviously also evaluates to be false. So let's keep pushing through here. So here we're gonna take a look at empty strings as well as strings that actually have a value. And I'm going to do something here that is an important thing to understand and that is a string that says false. So I'm going to run all of these by hitting F5, and we'll see that val9, which is the empty string, evaluates to be false. So if you're checking to see if a string has a value, you can simply evaluate it as a Boolean, and it will come back as false if there's nothing in the string, if it's just an empty string. But any string that has a value will return true, even if that string is the word false. So you do have to be careful here if you're letting users do something like inputting values, which we'll see at the end of this module, you can't simply evaluate a string for true or false and expect that it will return the correct Boolean value. Okay, so let's push through with a couple of other items here. So here we have objects, and in this case, we're just going to do an empty object. And so if I were to run this, we would see that this one comes back as true. So if it's a valid object, it will return true. But let's look at another use case, and this is one you've probably uh, seen before because we've covered it here within this course, and that is an undefined variable. Now, we did learn that undefined variables truly return undefined if you evaluate them. So since we've already seen that undefined returns false here, we should see the same thing with this for val13. And indeed, that does come back as false. Now, this is important because when we do conditionals, we're going to evaluate expressions as Booleans, and then that will determine which conditional we actually take. So an understanding of the falsy values within JavaScript is important to being able to work with conditionals. We finally arrived at conditionals, and I'm going to build off of the concepts that I introduced earlier within this module. So let's not waste any time, let's just jump right in to VS Code. 
So here, within VS Code, I'm first going to create a new file. Now here within this file, I'm going to start off by creating a sample employee as a JavaScript object, utilizing the JavaScript object literal syntax. And we'll include several different pieces of information here. Now this is going to work in many ways like what we've done so far in this course. We'll have first name and last name that are strings, a start date that's a date, number of years service, which is an integer, is active is a Boolean, and then a department and title that are both strings. I also want to revisit the example that I gave at the very beginning of this module, utilizing the Amazon badge system and the specific badge color. So here I'm modifying this slightly just to check the values on the employee that we've created with the object literal syntax. We can go through and check that individual's number of years of service and then assign the proper badge color. Now here we're utilizing multiple conditions by using else if. And as a reminder, every conditional that we have included here will be evaluated to be a Boolean, either true or false. And if that conditional is true, then it will execute the code within its respective code block. So here we can see because we have an employee that has seven years of service, we should end up with a badge color of yellow because once it reaches the first conditional, it will say employee dot number of years service is less than five. Well, that is false. So it will not execute the code block that would assign the badge color to be blue. But with the next conditional, if number of years service is less than 10, that would turn out to be true. So the only code block that would execute within this conditional is going to be the one that assigns the badge color of yellow. And we can see this if we were to actually log this out. So here we'll get back the years that the employee has served as well as their badge color. So let me go ahead and hit F5. And we'll see that indeed we do get back seven years and the badge color would be yellow. Now, one of the interesting things is we've only tested a single condition here in each of these different statements, but we have the ability to check multiple. So let's go ahead and look at an example. Let's say that you wanted to have a meeting for all of the employees that are in the engineering department that have been around for more than five years. And so you need to go through a list of all the employees and figure out which ones meet this criteria. Well, you could do a conditional like the one that I've listed here. So first we are checking to see if the number of years service is greater than five. Now you'll notice here that we have a logical and operator, which is two ampersands. What this is saying is this overall conditional will only evaluate to true if the expression on the left and the expression on the right both also evaluate to being true. So in this case, we have an employee that is in the engineering department and they have seven years of service. So when I run this code, we should see that it does log out that the employee meets the criteria because both of these different conditions are true. So I'll go ahead and run and we can see that indeed the employee does meet the criteria. But instead of checking that both actually return true, we can utilize a logical or operator to check and see if either condition evaluates to be true. So if one or more of those conditions are true. Now here we actually have two pipe characters side by side, and that's what gives us our logical or operator. So let's say that we want to have a meeting with everyone who either has more than 10 years of service or their title starts with VP, for example. Now this particular individual has a title that is VP of engineering, so they would be included even though they only have seven years of service. So here, if I run this, we should see that we have another employee meets criteria log statement, and indeed we do. Now we also can check and see, not if a statement in a conditional is true, we can check and see if it is not true. And if you've been following along, you've noticed that if we're ever checking for something to not be true, we utilize the exclamation point. And so here, maybe we wanna check and see if an employee has full retirement. Let's say in our company, that means they had more than 20 years of service and their active status is set to false. So we can check for that here. We're utilizing a logical and operator, which is two ampersands. 
So what is on the left and the right both need to be true. So first of all, on the left, number of your service has to be greater than 20. And on the right, it says not, and then employee is active. So this would evaluate to true if the employees is active status is set to false. Now, actually for our employee, neither of these conditions are true. So we should not see this log statement if I were to go through and debug the code, which I'll do by hitting F5. And in this case, we can see that we do not get a statement that is returned because both of those conditions evaluate to be false. Now I wanna show you another example, and this is going to be a different use case here. We're gonna start off with something that seems to be fairly basic, but I'm going to show you a different way that you can actually write this code. So let's say, for example, that we need to check and see what our annual bonus is for a specific employee. And let's say that at our company, if you have more than 10 years of service, you get 1,000 for your annual bonus. And if you don't, you only get 500. Well, you could utilize a basic conditional that you can see here to go through and do that calculation and assign the proper value on the employee object. However, we can utilize something called the ternary operator to write this in a single line of code. So here, we're going to integrate in our conditional. So here we're saying employee.number years service is greater than 10, and then we have a question mark. So here is the way that this works. If our conditional evaluates to true, then the first value after the question mark is returned. However, if it evaluates to false, the value that comes after the colon is what will be returned. So we have a much simpler way of writing a longer conditional that we have above utilizing the ternary operator. And this is one of the ways we can integrate assignment in with a conditional. So now we're gonna talk about another use of conditional statements and that is with the switch statement. Now in a minute, we're gonna to go to the documentation and review a definition because all elements of this definition are actually really critical to working with switch statements. However, I think it's gonna help you out a bit if we go actually create a switch statement first inside a VS Code. So let's jump over to the editor. So here within VS Code, I'll first create a new file. So here within this file, I'm first gonna create the same employee object that we had within the previous clip. And let me explain the logic that we're going to be implementing. So at this particular company that this employee works at, they are having an annual meeting. Now this annual meeting is going to be held at their main campus, which has multiple buildings. Now you'll be meeting at a different building depending on which department you're a part of. So we need to be able to effectively let employees know. So we need to write some logic to help evaluate that. And the way this is gonna work is we'll have engineering and HR both meeting in building one. We'll have marketing meeting in building two while anyone else in the company will be meeting in building three. So we can implement this using what is called a switch statement. So here I'm gonna start off by saying that we want to switch based on the department of the employee. Now the first case that we're going to look for is engineering. And here we'll say that we'll log the statement meet in building one if the employee is a part of the engineering department. Now you'll notice here that we have a special keyword at the end of this called break. And what this is saying is, is that you're going to break out of the switch statement if you reach this point in the code. Now you'll see the same thing when we implement the logic for first marketing, which in this case, we just need to change what building they're meeting in, which in this case will be two. And we can go through and do this for HR as well. And you'll notice that since it's meeting in the same building as engineering, it's going to look identical to what we see. Now we also need to use the default keyword here because we need to create a scenario where if someone doesn't fit into any of the other groups, we know they need to meet in building three. So here we go, we've created a switch statement. But there are some things here that you need to understand now that you've seen one. So let's go take a look at the documentation. So here we can see that the switch statement evaluates an expression and matches the expression's values against a series of case clauses. Now, that's what we've seen so far, right? We've seen engineering, HR, marketing, all have different case statements. Now notice the next part here. It executes statements after the first case clause with a matching value until a break statement is encountered. 
So if you leave out break statements, it's just going to keep executing the next code, even if it's under a different case. Now also note the last part of this definition. The default clause of a switch statement will be jumped to if no case matches the expression's value. So let's jump back over to VS Code and see if there's a way with our newfound knowledge of how switch statements work to simplify the code that we have inside of our current switch statement. So here, what I wanna do is I wanna to try to combine engineering and HR so that I only have to actually log out the statement once that we're going to meet in building one. So here's what I can do. I can actually put two cases together because if you remember from the definition, it's gonna keep executing code until it gets to a break statement. Then we can put marketing in a separate case after the break statement and it won't execute that. And then with the default statement, we'll include that as we did before for all of the other employees. Now, if I go through and run this, we should see that both switch statements, both the first one and the second one here, both say meet in building one because we are an engineering department. And indeed, that is what we get. And the reason that this works is because of a concept called fall through. So you will actually fall through to the next case unless you include a break statement. So as a reminder, if you're going to use switch statements, you need to be extremely careful about making sure that you include break statements where you want them to be. And you also need to have a default statement so you can make sure to catch anything that doesn't fit within any of the other cases. So now we're gonna review how to work with the exercise files and for the work that we're gonna be implementing within the next clip. So here in this clip, we're gonna be walking through several things. First, we'll be reviewing the organization of the exercise files. We will be installing a third-party module with NPM, and I won't cover this extensively here, but this will be covered extensively later within the course. And then we will be configuring VS Code to debug in the integrated terminal instead of the debug console. So let's dive in. So first, I wanna review the structure of the exercise files with you. Now in the exercise files for this module, there will be two base folders. The first is example, and this is going to include everything that we've covered so far. So if you wanna work with switch statements or conditionals or comparison operators, this is where you need to go. But if you wanna look at the project that we will be working on that we're beginning here within this module, you can look in the project directory. And inside of here, there will be two different folders. Before, this is the current state, before we've built anything out or made any changes, and after will be the state at the end of the module. So if you want to follow along, you'll be using the before folder contents. Okay, let's jump over to VS Code. So here within VS Code, you'll notice that we already have some files in place. So if I click on this package.json file, you'll notice that here we have something that we haven't covered at all yet. This is where we're going to define some information, including the dependencies for our JavaScript application. Now, I'll be covering this extensively later within this course. But what you do need to know is that before you can work with the code that we'll have in the next clip, you will need to run one command in your terminal. Since you've installed Node.js, you also have NPM on your machine. So here, as long as I'm in the same directory as that package.json file, I can run NPM install. And this will go out to the internet and it will grab the one dependency that we've defined and we'll now be able to include it within our application. Now there's one other thing I want to point out. Because we're going to be building a command line application, we need to change the way that we're debugging our application. So under the .vs code directory, you should see your launch.json file. Now here within this file, you'll notice that I have changed our console here to be integrated terminal. So you can just use the file that's included with the exercise files for this module. But if for some reason you wanna edit that or you wanna customize it for your own needs, just be sure you are leveraging the integrated terminal for this debugging. And you'll notice that when we hit F5, when we start building out this application, we'll be in the terminal tab instead of the debug console tab. Now, once all of that is in place, you'll notice that we do have an index.js file and there actually is some code already in it. Now, if we've done everything correctly up to this point, what I can do is I can hit F5, and I should see here that the application runs, albeit briefly, and then it exits, but we don't actually have any errors. 
you'll notice here that there is a huge long massive command required to run our application. Again, don't worry about the specifics of that. That's kind of what's hidden from you when you just use the debug console. But you should see here that the debugger attached and then it was waiting for the debugger to disconnect once the application completed running, but we have no errors. So once all of this is in place, you're now ready to move forward with the application that we're gonna be building in the next clip. So now that we've completed our setup work in the previous clip, we're now ready to move forward with really bringing all the practices and concepts that we've learned up to this point into an application. So here within this demo, here's what we're gonna be doing. First of all, we will be creating a command line application to add an employee to the directory. Now, this isn't going to be a fully functioning app yet. We're just taking our first steps, but you actually will be building a JavaScript application that you can interact with. And as a part of this, we will be utilizing conditional logic to validate user input against specific rules. So now that we have all of that in place and we've done all the setup, let's jump in to VS Code. So I'm here within the index.js file. And as you can see, as we saw in the previous clip, there is some code that's already in place. This is pulling in the third party module that we're going to be using. Now what this lets us do is it lets us ask the user for input and they can type in a string based on the question that we give them. And we're going to use this to input the information for a new employee in our directory. So here's what we need to do first. We need to create an empty object that will hold our employee, and then we'll populate the information as we get it from the end user. So the first thing we need to ask for is the first name. Now, if I just utilize this one line of code and then I hit F5 to run it, you'll notice here that it waits for me to enter in a first name. So here, if I type in David, perfect. The application finishes up because we haven't instructed it to do anything else just yet. But I want you to think for a minute. If we were building this out, what would you check for to make sure that the user entered in the right information? Well, names can obviously have a lot of different characters. We can't really validate based on that, but what we can check to make sure is that it's not an empty string. We have to have a first name for the employee. So let's check for that. So here's how we'll do that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, if for some reason, first name is false, meaning that it's an empty string. Well, that's an invalid first name. And you'll notice here I'm using the error method on console instead of just log. And then I'm doing something we haven't talked about yet. I'm just exiting the application by calling process.exit and entering in the number one, which is an error code instead of just saying zero, which would be a normal exit of the application. So with that being said, we can use this to check and see if there's an empty string. And if there's not, if everything passes correctly, then what we can do is we can go through and actually put that on our employee object. Now, just to revisit this conditional, if we had left off the exclamation point and just said, if first name, we would be checking to make sure that first name is a string. But because we have the exclamation point, you can again substitute in the word not. So if we don't have, or if there isn't a first name, then that's when we're going to run the code that will tell the user that we have an invalid first name. So let's go ahead and run this. So here, First name. Now, if I type in David, we should notice that there's no error statement. However, if I hit F5 again, and then I just do enter where it says first name, we'll notice here that it says invalid first name, and it goes ahead and exits the application. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next piece of data, and I bet you've already guessed what it is. We're going to do the exact same thing to get the last name. Now you might say here, David, is there a better way than just kind of copying and pasting this and just changing from first name to last name? There absolutely is, but we haven't covered that yet. So for now, we're just gonna be repeating a lot of code. Just know that some of the organization around how we write code will change later once we move into things like functions, for example, and loops. Okay, so now we're getting the last name. Let's keep moving forward here. The next thing we need to do is we want to get the start date. But what we're gonna do here is we're going to ask the user for three different elements of the date. We'll do the year, month, and then the day. So here, we're going to ask them for the year. Now, we're expecting that this is going to be in the range between 1990, let's say that's when this company started, and 2023, which is the current year that I'm actually recording this video. Now, when we get this back, it's going to be a string. So the first thing we'll do here is try to convert this string into a number. 
And if it can't be converted into a number, we'll need to catch that. And that's one of the things we'll do first. So what we'll do is we'll check to make sure that it's a number and even more specifically that it is an integer. Because here, nobody generally started the company in, you know, 2000.0416, right? We need to actually have a true integer value. Now we can check for this. I know we haven't done this check yet, but we can do this check with number dot is integer and then pass in the value. Now let's keep moving forward here because we also need to do another check, right? We need to check if it's between 1990 and 2023. So here we're gonna do two conditionals and we're going to use the logical or operator. So here, let's go ahead and put that check in place. So what we'll start off here is we'll say if the start date year is less than 1990 or if it's greater than 2023. In this case, we're gonna also tell the user, hey, this is an error, this is not a valid value for this particular type of data. Okay, now we're gonna keep doing the same thing for the next two values. We'll go ahead and do the month. We'll let the user enter in the month by number one through 12. We'll need to do some adjustments for that because if you remember, JavaScript is gonna expect that value between zero and 11, but that's okay. We'll figure that out in just a second. So here, we're gonna do the same thing and check to see if it's an integer. And if not, we'll go ahead and enter in an error. We'll tell the user and we'll exit the application. Then we'll need to check the range. This will work pretty much exactly like it did in the previous example, but we'll just use the new values. So we'll say if it's less than one or if it's greater than 12, then the same thing. We'll go ahead and enter in an error code so that the user knows that that is a problem. Great, okay, so now we're through two steps of our date. We just have one more to go. And that is, is that we need to get the day of the month. So we'll tell the user that they need to enter in a value between one and 31. Now, as a note here, there are some things I'm not checking yet. I'm not checking to see, for example, if they pick February and they say it's February 31st. Well, there clearly isn't a February 31st but we're not going to check for that value right now. We'll deal with some more complex validation later within the course. But we're gonna do the same thing here, check to be sure it's an integer, and then check to be sure it exists within the range. Now, if we go through this entire process and we actually have valid numbers for all of these, we can then use that value to actually create the date. And that's what we'll do right here. So we'll go through and say that we're gonna go ahead and create a new date object, and we'll assign that to our employee.startDate property. Now, as I mentioned, we're gonna subtract one from the start date month so that we're giving this value to JavaScript in the format that it expects. Now, there's one more thing that we need to do, and that is, is that we need to assign the isActive property. So we're going to prompt the user to enter in either yes or no. So here, we're going to check and see if they have entered in yes or no. So we'll add in a logical and check here. So if the value here isn't yes and it isn't no, we need to inform the user that there is an error and they need to enter in one of those two values. And then we can utilize a conditional this way. I'm going to set the isActive property. It's gonna be equal to isActive equal to yes. So if the user did enter in yes, this value will be true and that will set the isActive property to true. But if they entered in no, then that would be false and that would set the isActive property to false which is what we want. Now that we have all of that there, there's only one thing left we need to do. We're gonna convert this employee that we've created to JSON. And we could choose to save this to the local file system. We could choose to enter this into a database. There's a lot of things we could do here and we will be doing those things later within this course. But for now, we're just going to output it to the console. So now that we have all of that in place, let me run the application. So first, we need to enter in a first name. Then we need to enter in a last name. Now we need to enter in a start year. Let's say 2016. A start month, let's say March. And a day, let's say the third. Now is the employee active, yes or no? So we'll say, yes, the employee is active. Now you can see that we're returning that object. We can see that the JSON is properly formatted. We can see that we're getting back the correct date based on what we planned, which was March 3rd, 2016 and we can see that our Boolean value is set to true. And so here you have been able to see how we can use our logic of conditionals to help add in user input validation for our employee directory application. 
In programming, you are often dealing with collections. Let me explain what I mean. In our company directory, we may wanna search for everyone who has the last name Smith. Now we haven't built search into the application, but just imagine it's there for now. I could enter that last name into the application and get back a collection of employees. Let's say that we had six results. Now, instead of giving back six variables, you could have one named employee one, another one named employee two, and so on. Instead, we can get back a single collection. And this is one variable that contains multiple items. Now, in JavaScript, we have three primary collection types, array, map, and set. Now, some of these also have some subtypes based on the way that you wanna handle the memory side of things, but I won't be covering that in this clip. In addition, we can also store multiple items in a type we have already discussed, objects. Let's start by looking at arrays. An array in JavaScript is an ordered collection of items. It has a length property and methods for manipulating the list. Now, arrays should be used for collections where the order matters. Let's think of a few examples. If we're storing members of a baseball team, the order likely doesn't matter. But if we're storing a list of people in line to purchase tickets to a movie, the order is critical. We need to preserve the place everyone has in line. So let's discuss two terms that we use when talking about arrays. First, an array has a length. I mentioned this earlier. So if we have three items, its length will be three. Next, each item in the list has an index based on its position in the array. Now these indexes are zero based. That means that the first item in the list will have an index of zero, the second will be one and so forth. So let's see this in practice. There are multiple ways to create an array, but I'll use this syntax here. I'll cover more ways later within the module. Using this syntax, we can create and populate an array all in one statement. If we wanted to access a single item from the array, I can use square brackets and pass in the index that I'm looking for. Likewise, if I wanted to see how big my array is, I could check the length property. Now, if I wanna add an item to the array, I can do that using the push method. This will push that item onto the end of the array. And after that, you can see that the length is now larger than it was before. But arrays are not the only collection type. Next, let's take a look at maps. In many ways, maps are similar to objects. On an object, you can have a string key and then an assigned value, as we have seen before. A map is a JavaScript collection type that allows you to use any data type as your key. It has a size property and methods for manipulating the collection. Let's see how we can use it. To create a map, we can leverage the map constructor. From here, we can use the set method to set the key and value for the data that you want to store in the map. To retrieve the value for a key, we can use the get method. We also have the ability to delete a single item from the map using the delete method. Next up, we have another collection type, set. Now a set in JavaScript is a collection type that allows for a unique set of values. It has a size property and methods for manipulating the set. The key word here is unique. Within a set, you cannot have the same item more than once. Unlike an array where you could have the same item at multiple indices, they can only appear once in a set. To create a set, we use the constructor, just like we did with map, and then we use the add method to add items to the set. Even if I add the same item multiple times, you will notice that the size does not increase. So now you have an understanding of the collection types that we have in JavaScript. These collection types are iterable. That means we can loop over each of the items in the collection and perform some specific action on each item in the collection. So let's go back to the employee search option that I mentioned earlier. Once we retrieve the six results from our search, we would want to display the results, right? So we could loop over that array and log the first and last name of each of those six employees to the console. After we spend the first half of this module diving deeper into arrays, maps, and sets, we will spend the second half talking about loops. I'll be back in the studio midway through this module to discuss what it means to be iterable and demonstrating how loops actually work. So now that we've been introduced to the concept of arrays, let's dive in and really figure out how they work. But as usual, before we dive too deep into the actual code, 
I do want to remind you that we do have the documentation that you can leverage on the MDN web docs. So you can follow the link on the screen to get through and review all of the different capabilities that you can leverage when using an array. Okay, with that out of the way, let's dive in to VS Code. So I'm here within VS Code, and the first thing I'll do is to create a new file. Now, here within this file, let's go ahead and start working with arrays. So let's talk first about how we create arrays. Now, in the clip at the beginning of this module, I showcased utilizing this square bracket syntax to create arrays. Now, in this case, we have created an empty array. Now, we could also use the syntax with square brackets and add in items so that we can populate it at creation time. So here we would have an array that has a length of two. Next, we could go through and create an array using the constructor. So we could say new array. Now, this doesn't prohibit you from being able to populate it. You can actually pass values in to the constructor as well. So this would create an identical array to what we have for the second array that we defined. So these are the different ways we can create arrays. But what you're going to want to do after you create an array is access the values. So let me start by creating a new array that's going to hold a list of names. In this case, we'll have David and Kim, Steve and Katie. So we have four different items that are included within this array. Now, what can we do with this? Well, as I mentioned, we might want to check the length. So let's start by confirming the length. Now, length in this case should be what? Well, we have four items, so it should be four. So if I run this with F5, we can see that indeed it does return four. Now to access individual elements in the array, as I mentioned earlier, we can utilize the square bracket syntax and then we put in the index of the item that we want to retrieve. Now remember, arrays are zero index. That means the first item in the array would be at index zero. So here our last item would be at index three. So here, if I go through, I could get the first name by utilizing zero as the index. For the second name, I could utilize one. So now if I run this, we should see that indeed we have David as the first name and Kim as the second name. Now, if I was trying to retrieve a number that didn't exist in terms of the index, let's say I want to retrieve the 10th name. When I run this, I'm not going to get an error, but I am going to get back undefined because this value does not exist within the array. So this is something that we have to account for in our code if we have a specific number of items and we might be trying to retrieve something that is beyond that. Now, there will be times that we need to search for things within an array. We want to know where it is positioned or if it is even included in the array at all. So here we can utilize the includes method from the array object to give back a Boolean on whether or not a specific value is included. Now, as a note here, we're dealing with a string, which is a primitive. We'll talk a bit later about dealing with objects in this context. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and run this, and we'll see that since the list does include the name David, this will return true. Let's look at another example here. So here, we'll check and see if it includes the name Tucker, which it doesn't, so we should get back false on this. So let's go ahead and run it and see, and indeed, we get back false for that value. Now, there's another thing we can do. Instead of just saying, is it in the array, we can say, where is it in the array? So since we know that David is included in the array, we're gonna call the index of method on the array object, and here we'll find out what index that's at. And I'll also show you here, we'll do the same thing with Tucker, which again is not included, so we should get back something here. We'll talk about what it is when it returns. So let's go ahead and hit F5. We can see that for David, it does return an index of zero, which makes sense because it is the first item in the array. But for Tucker, in this case, it returns a negative one. Now you can't have a negative one index, but anytime you ask for a position of something inside of an array, if it can't find it, it's going to return negative one. Okay, so let's keep pushing through. Let's talk about how we can add values to our array. And there are some different options here for how we do this. Now, if we simply want to add a name to the end of an array, we can utilize the push method. This will just push a value onto the end of the array. So here in this case, I'm just adding Shannon to the array, and we can see that indeed it is now the fifth item in our list. 
Now, I also could go through and add a specific value, but do it at the beginning instead of the end. Because if you remember, I mentioned that with arrays, the order matters. That's one of the whole reasons you would use an array. So if you wanna change where you're inserting it, if you wanna put it at the very beginning, you can utilize the method unshift. Now, there are two methods, shift and unshift, and in my mind, they're very unclear just by their names what they do. But in this case, I'll tell you, if you call the unshift method and you pass in a value, it will add that to the beginning of your array. So we'll run this, and you can see that now we have six items, and Sarah is at the beginning of the list. Let's say we want to do something else. We want to actually add a value, but do it at a specific index. Well, a lot of manipulation of arrays can happen with the splice method. Here, we're going to use this to just insert the name William at an index of one. So if we go through and run this, you'll see indeed that William is now the second item that has been included within the list. Now you can do much more with splice. I won't go through all the specifics here in this clip, but there are several things you can utilize splice for. Now, if we keep going, there's another thing we might wanna do is actually remove a value. Let's say we wanna take the beginning item off of our list. I mentioned to you before that shift and unshift are both methods that you can use on an array, and this one will just take that value off the front of the list. So I'll go ahead and hit F5, and you'll see that indeed the name Sarah is no longer at the beginning. We've removed it. We have shifted it away from our array. Now, another thing we might need to do is we might need to remove a value, but at a specific index. So if we want to say, okay, at index spot five, we want to actually remove a name, we can do that utilizing splice. And here we actually could remove multiple values. So if we were to change that second number, which is currently one to be two or three, we could remove multiple items at that point in the array. But in this case, we're saying just one. So if I run this now, you'll notice that the last item in our list, which was Shannon, has now been removed and we are left with just five items in our array. Okay, let's keep moving forward here. Now with arrays, arrays don't just have to contain primitive values. They can contain objects as well. So here I'm going to create three different objects. We can pretend that these are three different employees within our directory. So the first one is David Tucker. The second one is Sarah Jenkins. And I've purposefully included here for object three, an identical object to what we've put in for object one. Now with that information, let's take a look at a few things. First of all, we can create an array utilizing our square bracket syntax and passing in both of those objects. But now let me give you a scenario. What would happen if I ran the following code? We're saying employees includes and then object three. Well, object three has the exact same first name and last name as object one. So what do you think it's gonna return here? Well, let me run it and we'll see. Well, the answer that comes back here is false. So in this case, because object three is pointing to a different block of memory than object one, it would return false in this case. Now, if we keep moving forward here, we might wanna check though and see is object one, is that included inside of the array? And because we did include object one in the array, this one should return true. And indeed it does. So here we've been able to do a lot of the basics of working with arrays, creating, we have been able to access items within an array. We have been able to add items to an array, remove items from the array, and even work with more complex objects inside of JavaScript's array object. So now we're gonna get hands-on and work with maps and sets in JavaScript. And just like with anything we do, I wanna remind you that you can get to the documentation. So here you can see the page for map on MDN web docs. And in addition to having one for map, we also have one here for set. So if you want to learn more about the different methods that we have available or the different properties that are available on these objects, you can dive into the documentation to get what you need. Now, let's go ahead and jump over to VS Code. So I'm here within VS Code, and the first thing I'm gonna do is to create a new file. Now, here within this file, you might say, I know what you're gonna do, David. You're gonna create a new map. That'll be the first thing you do. Well, you would be wrong. I'm gonna start off by creating an object. You might be saying, wait, what does an object have to do in working with maps and sets? Well, let me explain here for a minute because we're gonna start off and we're gonna be looking at maps. 
And one of the things I want to point out to you in the beginning is that really maps are very similar to JavaScript objects. We have keys and values. So in this case, in our object, we have keys like first name and last name, and then we have values like David and Tucker. Now, both of those are strings, which are primitives, but we could also put in dates and we could put in Booleans. We've done that before with JavaScript objects. Let's talk a little bit about how maps are the same and yet how they're also a bit different. So to create a map here, we don't use this object literal syntax. We do utilize the constructor here to go in and say we want to have a new map. And so now we have a map that's created. And if we wanted to go in and set values, we pass in both the key and the value to the set method. So in this case, when we look at these two different values, right, map one and object, both of these are kind of functionally the same. Now, they're represented within different data structures, but they're both holding the same bits of information. If I were to run this, we could see that it returns, again, our map has a size of two, and we have first name as a property, David as a value, last name as a property, and Tucker as a value. So they're functionally the same, but there are some things we can do within maps that we cannot do within JavaScript objects. And that really centers around having non-string keys. So if you think about it, in JavaScript objects, we're utilizing string keys for everything. So even though first name, I don't have quotes around that under the object, it is really represented as a string. So here we can do other things. Like let's say we wanna do a number key based on the current time. And there might be reasons you would do this if you were actually doing some time series data, for example. That would be one option of something we could do. We could also go in and we could set an array as the key and then have a value. Now notice here, all of my values are strings, but they don't have to be. I could put in other data types there as well. We could even utilize a function. And I know I haven't talked about functions yet, so I'm kind of teasing something that will be coming later within the course, but we could even have a function here as a key. And all of this is perfectly valid when you're working with maps, even though you cannot do this within JavaScript objects. So I could go through and log this out, and you can see that indeed we have our number key uh, that we're utilizing and we have our array key and we have our function key. All of these are perfectly valid when working within JavaScript maps. Now I mentioned to you the size a bit earlier and I do wanna remind you because if you are working within maps, you will be checking the size periodically depending on what you're doing. So you can access that property on your map object just by utilizing size. So here, if I run this, you can see indeed it does return five, which we also saw in the previous logging statement, but I wanted to point out how you could get to that information. Now let's talk about how you actually get to the data once you put it inside of a map. And I know I introduced this earlier within the module, but I wanna really showcase it here. So we can call the get method and then pass in whatever our key was, right? So in this case, if we pass in last name, we should get back Tucker. So if I run it, indeed, we do get back Tucker. Now, let's go ahead and look at another example. What if I say map1.get and I pass in an empty array? What am I gonna get back? You might say, I know, David, you're gonna get back an array key, but no, you actually won't. Let me hit run and you'll see why. You can see here that we're getting back undefined. This is just another point where I'm trying to drive home that any type of object, an array is an object within JavaScript, is going to work differently than a primitive. So here, if I wanted to get back array key, I would need to actually have a reference back not to any empty array, but that specific empty array that I used to assign it, because it needs to have basically a reference back to that block of memory when it was created. So just as a reminder here, even though we can use anything for a key, that doesn't mean we can always get things back unless we're thinking ahead a bit here. So next, let's talk about how you delete values. So here, you can go ahead and delete any value by just calling delete and then passing in the name of the key. So in this case, we'll delete first name, and then we're gonna go back and actually pull the size. And you can see here that our size has reduced by one. It's now down to four, which makes sense since we have removed one value. Now, that gives us an overview of really the core things you would do when working with a map. So let's do the same thing for a set. So here, creating a set is almost identical. We're just using a different object name here. So we'll use the constructor to say that we have a new set and we can go through and add a value. So in this case, remember, we don't have keys and values, we just have values, and they're going to be unique. So here in this case, we have a string, which is primitive, that we're adding into our set, and so if we were to move forward from this, we could go through and check our size. So here, we'll go through and check the size. It has a size property, just like we have on map. 
So here, I'll go ahead and run this. And as you would expect, our set size comes back as one because we have only added in one value. And if we were to try to go add the same value in, and again, the same value here as it's equal to a previous value that's already in the set. And since this is a primitive, any string we enter that says David, that it has the same case to it, should be the same. And so here, because we've added it, if we went through and logged out the size, we should see that the size is exactly the same as it was before because it didn't add anything new into the set. And indeed, it does come back as one because we're trying to add the same value again. But just like we talked about with when dealing with arrays, we don't have to just have primitives inside of these collections. We can put complex objects inside of maps and sets and arrays. So let's pretend that we're doing a collection of employees as a team, and we wanna create this as a set because it wouldn't make sense for the same employee to be on a team multiple times. It would have different employees. So here, if we wanted to do this, we can create an object that represents our employee, and I'm just gonna create one here for simplicity, and we'll do the same thing that we've done before. We'll have an object here that has first name and last name. I can actually add that into the set. And here, we'll check the size of the set. So if I go ahead and run this, we'll see our set size is indeed one, and we have our one complex object included inside of that set. Now, we also can detect if we actually have a value inside of the set already. And we can utilize the has method to do this. So here, we can check and see if our team has this particular employee. Now, I can do this because I still have a reference back to the object that I originally put into this set. So I'm going to say, does this team have, you know, employee one that I've created here with this JavaScript object? And before I run that, I also wanna show you that we can actually remove values from a set as well. We can call the delete method on our set and we can remove it. Now again, this works just like I said with the previous statement because I have a reference back to that original object that I put in. So let's see these two values that get logged out. First of all, if it says, do we have this employee? It's true because it does indeed contain that employee. But our set size here comes back as zero because right after that, we actually have removed that from our set. There's one last thing I wanna mention that you can do. There may be times when you don't wanna just delete one item from a set, but you truly want to clear the entire set out and start again. So in that case, instead of creating a new set, you can simply call the clear method, which will remove all of the values within that set and then you can immediately go back and start adding more values in. At the beginning of this module, I introduced the concept of loops. So I wanna dive into that a bit deeper before we start implementing them within our application. Now I mentioned that we can use loops to iterate over a collection, which means we perform the same logic on each item in the collection. Now, while this is true, it isn't a complete definition. In JavaScript, a loop executes a block of statements until a specific condition is met. One such condition could be reaching the end of a collection, but it also could be any other conditional that you can think of. There are two primary keywords that we leverage when using loops, for and while. Now, each of these have multiple types of loops that I will introduce in this clip. First up, we'll discuss the while loop, which is the easiest loop to create. In this example, we start with the number 10. Next, we use the while keyword to define our loop. Just like the conditionals with if, we will define a block using curly braces that we execute each time our loop fires. Now we need to add our conditional. Here, we will say anytime the value of x is above zero, we should run our loop. So within the loop, we will log the value of the number and then decrease the value of x by one. So if we ran this code, we would see it log 10, 9, 8, 7, and so forth until we get down to one, which would be the last run of our loop. Now let's change things up a bit. What if we wanted to check for the value of X at the end of each execution of the loop instead of the beginning? Well, in that case, we could use a do while loop. Here, you can see that I've changed things around by using the do keyword. It works in the same way, but it just changes where the conditional is evaluated. This also means that a do while loop will execute at least once, since the conditional isn't checked until later. Next, let's discuss for loops, which are the most common loops that you will encounter. Now we'll talk about three different types of for loops. So first we have a plain for loop, 
a for of loop and a for in loop. First, we have a plain for loop. Now, trust me, this isn't as scary as it may seem at first glance. To define a for loop, you need to have three statements that you can add as arguments. First, you have an initialization statement. Now, you often use this to create a count variable. Next, you add in the condition that you're checking. Finally, you have a statement that will be executed after your code block on each iteration. So in this example that I have here, it would loop over all the items in the array. The counter variable gets used to access each item by its index in the array. Now we also could use a for of loop for this. If we were only concerned with the items in the array, a for of loop is much easier to understand. Here, we create a variable, in this case, val, which is short for value, and then specify the array. Our block will execute once per item in the array. Finally, the third option for the for loop is the for in loop. Now here, if we have a JavaScript object, we can loop over the keys in the object. So here we define a variable, in this case, key, and then pass in the object. The block will execute once per property in the object. Now, I know that you're excited to take your knowledge of loops and jump right in, but we need to discuss one additional topic, loop control flow. First, what happens when you're in a loop and you wanna stop the loop and move on to the next statement in your code? This brings us to the first keyword. The break keyword allows us to terminate the loop and move on to the next statement in your code. But let's take a look at another situation. What if you just wanna stop the current execution of the loop and skip ahead to the next execution. Well, the continue keyword stops the current execution of the loop and proceeds to the next iteration. Okay, now that you have that information, let's jump right in and work with loops. So now we're gonna dive in and get to work with our first loop type, which is a while loop. And while we looked at this earlier in the module, now we're gonna get to dive in and actually work with the code. And just like with most everything else we've discussed here, I do have a link to the documentation where you can go to the MDN web docs and learn more about while loops beyond what we're talking about here. But let's go ahead now and jump in to VS Code. So here within VS Code, I need to talk to you about two files before we create the file that we will be using within this clip. First of all, I have a package.json file. Now we've utilized this before to define some dependencies and we'll be talking a lot about dependencies and modules later within this course. In this case, I'm defining one here so that Node.js knows that we wanna treat our JavaScript files as modules because we're gonna be using the import statement. Now you might say, well, why are we using the import statement? We don't have any dependencies defined here. Well, the reason is, is we'll be using that to pull in our data.json file. Now this file just contains some sample data for us. It includes an array of employees that we're using again for our sample employee directory that includes an ID, an email, first and last name, date of birth, start date, and then is active flag, which is a Boolean. And so here we wanna actually pull this in so we can work with this data inside of our loops. So I'm gonna show you how we'll do that. But for now, I'll close this file and we'll create a new file. Now here within this file, I'm gonna show you the code that we will use to actually bring in this JSON data. So here it's gonna be an array of complex objects. We'll use the import statement and we're gonna specify that the contents of this JSON file will be included in that employees variable. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, if I hit F5, you'll see here that we get a warning back from Node.js. This is what's called an experimental warning. It's telling you that in essence, you might need to do this differently in the future, even though this works now. Now I'll be showing you some different ways to pull in JSON data later, so you don't need to worry with this. Just know that as we go throughout this module, you will see this warning and that's totally okay. So let's go ahead and move forward. So let's go ahead and look at how we would loop over some of this information utilizing a basic while loop. So I'll start off by creating an index variable. We'll just call this I, and in many cases you'll see people use I for this or other letters like J and K. We'll usually see single letters for this but then I'm gonna go through and utilize the while keyword. And we're gonna say here that while employees, and then we're including that index value inside of the square bracket syntax, meaning that as long as there is a value in the array at that position, and it doesn't come back as undefined or null, then we want this loop to continue. Now in this case, it's gonna loop over and it's going to 
basically include all of those names and it's gonna output them to the console. So let's take a look at that in action. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit F5. And when I do, we can see that we get all of those names out. And there are nine different values that are included here. Perfect, that works well. However, I need to talk to you about something that can happen when you're working with loops. Now, the way this loop works is after each log statement where we're logging out the employee's name, we then increase that index value by one. So when it runs through the first time, it's zero, and then it's one, and then it's two, so on and so forth. Well, what happens if you make a mistake? Let's say, for example, that you create a loop and you forget to add in this statement. Well, here's the problem. Every time this loop runs, that value is gonna be zero. And so it's going to keep running. And this brings us to a condition that we would call an infinite loop. So let me go ahead and show you what would happen here because I don't want you to freak out if this happens when you're working with your JavaScript code. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit F5 and it's just gonna start running repeatedly. I'm immediately gonna try to hit this uh, stop box here for the debug controls, but you can see that by the time this finishes, this one statement was logged out 59,786 times. And the reason is, is because we basically told it to loop and that condition is always going to return true. So we do need to be careful when we're working with loops that we don't end up with infinite loops. If it happens, no big deal. Just do what I did, hit the stop button on the debug controls and it should actually exit you out of that particular running file. Okay, so with all that said, we've seen that this can work utilizing a while loop. But let's also take a look at another kind of loop that is a type of while loop. And if you remember from earlier in the module, it is a do while loop. So here in this case, we're first gonna do a little separator so we can tell the difference between the output of our while loop and our do while loop. But then I'm gonna go ahead and define this loop. I'll update the index value to be zero again, which is what it was initially before. And then we'll say do, we'll use the do keyword and then we'll define our code block, which in this case will have a logging statement just like before. And also just like before, we'll increase the value of that index by one. But we're gonna put the conditional at the end. We'll check to see if there is a value that is included in that employee's array at the specific position once we've moved that number up by one. So now if I were to go through and hit F5 and run this again, we'll see that we get the output both from our while loop and then we get to that separator and then we can see we have the same output for our do while loop. Now, I'll tell you, while loops are very useful and you'll use them a lot, especially once you move more into working with functions, which we'll cover in the next module. But the next type of loop that we cover, which is gonna be the for loops, I think those are gonna be even more critical for you to learn. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at for loops. So now that we've covered while loops, we're gonna move forward and take a look at for loops. And I think these are gonna be even more common for you in your JavaScript development. I think it's something that every JavaScript developer needs to know well. And we're not just gonna cover one type of for loop, we're actually going to cover three here within this clip. And just like with everything else we talk about, I do have a link here to the documentation for for loops. Now, this is gonna take you to just a plain for loop, but if you look on the left pane, you can easily get to the for in and for of loops as well, which we also will be using here within this clip. Okay, now that we have all of that out of the way, let's dive in to VS Code. Okay, so I'm here within VS Code and I'm first gonna create a new file. Now here, before we start bringing in that JSON data and working with it like we did in the previous clip, I'm gonna start off here with a simple array. It just has four string values. Now, what we need to do here is talk about how we actually create a for loop. And if you remember from earlier in this module, you have to define three different statements as you create your for loop. So let's take a look at this in action. So here we have our for keyword followed by our three statements. And then we have our curly braces and then we have whatever we're gonna execute with each run of the loop. But let's break down these three statements in detail. So first of all, where I am saying let i equal zero, this is the initialization statement that will run before our loop executes for the first time. Then we have our conditional that will be checked after each run of the loop. In this case, we're gonna check to be sure that our index variable or i in this case we're using, but you could use any variable name that you want. We're checking to see if this is 
less than the length of our names array. And then finally, we have a statement that will execute after each run of the loop. And in this case, that statement will add one to the value of our i variable or our index variable. Now again, we'll commonly use this variable as an index, although you certainly don't have to, but as a new developer, this is the most common pattern that you will see. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the results of this for loop. So if I run this with F5, I can see here that it does indeed return each of the four names. Now, the reason that it doesn't keep going is because of our conditional. In this case, it knows that if it exceeds the length of the array, then in that case, it needs to stop running the loop. And so that would actually take us to whatever our next statement would be. So this is just a basic for loop. And I know that it seems a little daunting at first having to define those three different statements, but you can take this pattern that you see here on your screen and use this to loop through any array that you have. But there are other ways to do it as well. So let's take a look at a different approach. So here we'll utilize a for of loop. Now, if you have an array, you can simply say for, and then you can say the variable that you will use to define the specific item of the array for each run of the loop. In this case, we'll say name, and then you use of, and then you give it the name of the array, which in this case is going to be names. So we can say name of names, and then we can simply log out the name. Now, in this case, you don't have to remember nearly as much for how to define this particular for loop. So if I run this, and I'm gonna go ahead and hit F5, we'll see that we get the exact same result. Now, there's a lot of different articles out there about performance between these two different options. I'm not gonna talk about that here within this course, but just know if you're looping over an array, either of these approaches will work. You will notice that there are some differences. First, if you need to access the index, in other words, what run of the loop you're actually on, you might wanna use the first approach. There is a way you can do it with the second approach, but it's a little bit more complicated. But I'll go ahead and tell you, we're also gonna cover a way that you can loop over the items in an array or other different types of iterable data structures, but we're gonna do that utilizing functions in the next module. So again, we'll learn even more about how we can do this then. Let's keep moving forward with this. Let's go ahead now and let's pull in the data from our JSON file like we did in the previous clip. So in this case, we're gonna bring that in as the employees variable, just as we did before. Now, what I wanna show you here is another type of loop, and that is gonna be a for in loop. So here, what I wanna do is I wanna grab just one employee. So we'll grab the first employee that actually is included in that employees array. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to loop over all of the different properties in that particular object and we use a for in loop for that. So here you can see how we actually structure this. We will include a variable that gets defined, which is property, and that will be defined for each of the properties included within that employee object. So then I can pull that out and I can use the property name, both to actually log that out, but also to get that particular value out of that employee, utilizing the square bracket syntax that you can see here. So now if I were to go in and actually run this, I would be able to see all the data we have for this one employee. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm gonna go ahead and hit F5. Now here, you'll see that we have our ID, we have our email address, our first and last name, date of birth, start date, and is active value. All of that has been defined and we can access all of that using our for in loop. Okay. Now we're gonna do something a little bit interesting here because we're gonna bring these concepts together. However, to make it easier to actually read this in the debug console, we need to go in and just add in a bit of a separator here. So I'm gonna have a multi-line separator here that will clearly distinguish what we did earlier in this file from what we're getting ready to do. So what I wanna do here is I wanna do what we just did in terms of looping over all the properties for an employee, but I want to do that for all of the employees, not just one. So to do this, we're going to mix our for of and for in loops. We're actually going to nest our for in loop inside of a for of loop. So let's take a look at what this would look like. We're gonna actually bring both of these approaches together. So we're gonna start off by saying we wanna loop over the employees. Then we're gonna say that for each of those, we actually want to loop over all of the properties. And then to make sure that we have some level of separation within this output, 
after we go through all of the properties for a single employee, we then will include these two dashes. That way we can clearly distinguish one employee from another. So now that I have that in place, let's go ahead and hit F5. And here you can see the output. We can see that we're outputting all the data for each of the employees and we have that little two dash separator between each of them. So if we're wanting to output the information in a list of employees, we can utilize this for of and for in loop together and show how we can loop both over the contents of an array as well as over the different properties included with a JavaScript object. Now, up to this point, we have been working under a few assumptions. The first assumption is that we always want our loop to execute all of its iterations until that condition turns to false. The other assumption is that we always want our loops to execute all of the statements that are contained within them. However, there are situations where we might want to do something different with one or both of those assumptions, and that leads us to loop control flow, and that's what we're gonna cover here within this clip. So let's just dive right in to VS Code. So here within VS Code, I'll create a new file, and then I'm gonna go ahead and pull in the JSON data just as we've done previously. Okay, let's talk about a few different scenarios where we might want to do something different than those assumptions that I mentioned earlier. Let's say, for example, that we want to list out our employees, but we only want to list the first five items from the array and not all of them, which in this case would be nine total. Well, we can go ahead and have a normal for loop. And I should mention there are multiple ways that you could accomplish this. So if you've been paying attention, you might have noticed some other ways you could do this too, and that's totally fine. But here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize a loop control flow statement called break. So here, if you notice, inside of our for loop, we have an additional conditional that we have added in. In this case, we're checking to see when that I value, our index, is equal to five. In this case, that would mean that we have already output five items and we would be starting the sixth. And here we're saying break. Now, break tells us to totally break out of the loop meaning that we won't have any more executions of this for loop and it will immediately move to the next statements that we have defined. So here, this would enable us to list just those first five items and then break out. So if I hit F5, we can see that it indeed, it does do that. It lists those five items out and then it stops. But that's just one scenario here. Let's look at another scenario because maybe we don't wanna break out of our loop completely. So let's go ahead and add in a separator and then let's look at the scenario where we wanna search only for people that have first names that start with the letter B. Now to do this, we don't need that index value, so I'm going to use a for of loop. We'll iterate here over all of the employees and we'll check to see if a given employee's first name does not start with the letter B. And in this case, we're going to use the other loop control flow statement that we're gonna learn about and that is continue. Now, continue means that we're going to stop the current iteration, but we will immediately move to the next iteration. Now, you would use this in scenarios where we don't want to go through all of the different lines of code that we have entered in within the code block for our for loop. So in this case, if I were to run this code with F5, we can see that it only lists out the two employees that we have whose first name starts with the letter B. So for all the others, it never reached that console.log statement because of continue. Now there is another scenario that I wanna to talk to you about, and that is when we're dealing with nested loop control flow, because things can get a little bit tricky here, but there's a concept I wanna teach you that'll make this quite a bit easier. So if you remember, we utilized code very much like this to list out all of the employees and then all of the properties within those complex objects within a previous clip. This was kinda of like listing out our employee directory. And so what we did was we started off with a loop over all of the employees. And then for each of those employees, we went through and we actually looped over all of the properties within those complex objects. Now, here's what I wanna do. Let's go ahead and look at the data first and this will make a bit more sense. So here within the data, you can see that we have an ID, email, first and last name, the date of birth, the start date, and then the is active flag, which is a Boolean. Now in this case, once we get to date of birth, we don't wanna list any more properties. We just wanna list ID, email, first, and last name. So we're gonna do this utilizing a continue statement. So we're gonna detect when we're looping over those properties that we get to date birth, and then we'll say, let's just continue on 
to the next run of the iteration. But I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, it's not gonna work the way we have planned just yet. But I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna run this code with F5. And you'll notice here that indeed it doesn't list out the date of birth, but it does list out start date and is active. Now the reason is, is because when we call the continue statement in this case, it's going to take the closest loop, which in this case is going to be that inner for loop, the one where we're looping over the different properties. So here it's just continuing to the next property. But what if you want it to continue here to the next employee? Well, this is where we can utilize something called labels. So here I'm gonna give a name to that outer for loop. We'll call this one employee. And then what we can do with our continue statement is we can actually specify that we're wanting to continue for that loop, not for the inner loop. So here by utilizing these labels, we can more clearly specify when we say continue or break what we're referring to. So now if I were to go ahead and run that code, we can see that it now indeed does work how we intended, where it's just listing out the ID, email, first and last name, because we're utilizing the continue statement and we're specifying we want it to continue on that outer loop. And so here's how you utilize the continue and break statements and how you can even utilize them within nested loops. So now we're gonna build off the concepts that we've learned here within this clip to really begin to integrate these concepts into our command line application that we've been building. So here within this clip, we're first gonna be reading command line arguments that are passed to our application. And then we're gonna be utilizing loops to display information for multiple employees. So let's dive in. So I'm here within VS Code and as a reminder in the exercise files for this module, you'll be able to see this under the project directory and you'll be able to see both a before and after of this particular project code. So you can certainly go to the before directory and work alongside of me. Now the first thing you need to do, because we do have a dependency here, this is actually in the exact same state that it was at the end of the previous module, we do need to go ahead and call npm install. And this will install the one dependency that we have. Now you can tell that that's included because I now have a node modules directory and I have a package-lock.json file. Okay, so now I'm gonna go under my index.js file. Now I'll note one other thing, we have included the exact same JSON file that we were using earlier. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and start the process by bringing this JSON file in. This is gonna have our sample data for employees and we're gonna use that within our application. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna go here under where I'm defining my create prompt. And what I wanna do is I wanna show you something about how we can look at the arguments that are used when we're actually running our Node.js application. So in this case, Let's go ahead and actually log out something, and it's going to be an array that Node.js provides. And this is called process.argv. Now this is gonna have all of the arguments that were used to run this file. But instead of me talking about it, it might be easier for me just to show this to you. So let me go ahead and go down here to the terminal. And in this case, instead of just hitting F5, I'm purposefully going to actually write out the command for this. Now I'm in the same directory as this file, so I can type node and then index.js. Now in the output, first of all, it shows the experimental warning that I mentioned to you earlier. Again, you don't need to concern yourself with that at this point, but you'll notice that we have two different values in this array. The first value is the full path to node.js on my machine, and the second is the full path to the specific file that we're running. But this doesn't have to just end there. I can actually go here and run the command and pass in additional values. So let's say that when I want to list the employees in my directory application, I run this with the command list after index.js. Now when I do this, you'll see that list now shows up as the third value in the array, which would be at the index of two. Again, remembering because arrays are zero indexed in JavaScript. So we're gonna work with this to actually be able to run multiple commands for our command line application. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and we'll delete this logging information that we've included because we won't need that. But what I am gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and capture the given command that was actually used to run this particular script. So in this case, we'll call this command 
and we're going to get this by getting the second index of our process.argv array, and this will actually give us that command. So the next thing we can do is we actually can write a switch statement that will switch the logic that we're running based on the command that the end user actually includes. So in this case, we're gonna have three different possibilities and we'll switch based on the command. And so the first possibility will be list. And that's where we wanna actually go and list all of the employees that we have included within our application. And here we're just gonna add in some log statements. Again, we have a break statement. That's really important with our switch statement, but then we'll have add. And this is all of the logic that we've already added to this application, where we go through and enter in all the prompts to add a new employee. And then by default, we'll tell the user, this is an unsupported command because that means it's not list or add. And in that case, it should just exit the application. Okay, well, let's start to make this work a bit. So I'm gonna take all of the logic that I have from the previous module, and we're gonna take all of this and I am going to actually cut it and we're gonna paste it inside of the add option. So here, I'm gonna go underneath this log statement and I'm just going to paste. Now you might notice when we paste, the indentation gets all messed up. Now that's okay, the editor can actually handle some of this for you. Don't go through and have to worry about doing this by hand. If I right click here, I can go to format document and in doing so, it will correct the indentation for all of that. Now this should work if we were to go into the terminal here and we were to run our application again, node and then index.js, and then we were to enter in add we should see that indeed we get into the prompts where we can enter in our first name and our last name, so on and so forth. But I'm gonna go ahead and hit cancel with control C. So now from here, what I can do is I can now go in and add in the logic that we need to actually list the employees from our directory. So I'm gonna go up under list and what we'll do is we'll go here under this logging statement. And now we're gonna utilize some of the logic that we had used earlier within this module. And that is we're going to loop over both the list of employees and then all of the properties that each of those employees have. So here we'll start off with a for statement and we'll use a for of because we're gonna loop over the employees. And then we're gonna go through and do a for in loop to loop over each of the properties for those specific employees. And again, this code should look somewhat familiar to you if you've been following along with this entire module. We will go through and enter in just a blank line with our console.log statement, and then we'll use our prompt to actually say that the user needs to press enter to continue to go to the next employee. Now, the very next thing that we're gonna wanna do here is we are gonna wanna send out a message letting the user know that they have reached the end. And I'll do that by just saying console.log and say, okay, the employee list is completed, okay. So now I should be able to actually save my file and I'm actually gonna go through and just delete an empty line there. And now we can go through and run it again. But in this case, instead of doing add, I'm going to run list. And when we do, we'll see that we have our first employee here. I'll hit enter and now we have our second and so on. We can go all the way through all of the employees that we have within our application. And so by utilizing the power of arrays, or other types of collections and loops. First of all, we've been able to pull an argument out of the different command line arguments that are passed to our application. And then we've been able to look at our data structure that is an array and utilize loops to output detailed information about each of the employees that are included within our directory. Next, we're gonna be diving into one of the most important aspects of JavaScript, functions. Now, up to this point, we have written out our statements in JavaScript for everything we wanna do. But what do we do if we wanna perform the same logic in different places in our JavaScript file? Well, we could certainly copy and paste that code, but then every time we wanna update it, we would have to go back and update it in multiple places. That seems like a mistake waiting to happen. Real JavaScript applications are built using functions, which allow us to group together code logic in reusable blocks. And within these blocks, we can define their input, which we call parameters, and their output, which we call the return value. So let's say that we wanna validate any input that the user enters for a new employee. Let's start by looking at strings. If we were entering the department for an employee, we might wanna only allow an entry from the list of departments we have at the company. We could add in a check to be sure that we received a string 
and that it is from that list. Now let's make this into a function. First, we need to give our function a name, just like we do when we create a variable. As I mentioned in an earlier clip, naming is really important here. And honestly, there's just a bit of an art to it. The JavaScript engine does not care what you call it, but your teammates and honestly, your future self will thank you for good naming. Our function will be returning a Boolean to indicate if the input value is valid. So I'm going to start the function with the word is. Something either is or it is not, so this fits well with a Boolean value that is either true or false. Next, I'm going to define what it is that we're checking. So I'll add in input. And next, I'll say what we're checking for, which would be valid department. There we go. So any developer can read that name and say, oh, you're checking to see if the input value is a valid department. Perfect. Let's get this into some code. So while we have three ways to create functions, I'm gonna start with a function declaration. To use this, we start with the function keyword followed by the name that we just created. Next, we need to define the parameters of the function. Now, if you remember, I mentioned that the parameters are the inputs of the function. Functions can have zero parameters, they can have a lot. In our case, we will have just one parameter, input. Notice that I am using the same language I used in the function name. Now after this, I can define the code block for my function using curly braces, just like we did when working with loops. The code that exists inside of this block will get executed every time that we call this function. So I'll go ahead and add in a logging statement in the function. We'll add in the real logic in just a minute. Now, when I want to execute the function, I can simply use its name followed by parentheses. Now inside of the parentheses, I can put in the parameters that I want to use to execute my function. If I had multiple parameters, I would separate them with commas. So now we have created a function using a function declaration and we have executed it. That is a great first step. Next, we need to talk about something else. We need to talk about scope. Yes, this is a critical concept to understand when working in JavaScript. Up to this point, our variables and our scripts have been available anywhere after we've defined them. Now, there are a few exceptions to that when we were dealing with loops, but I didn't really address it at that point. When you create a function in JavaScript, the variables that you create inside of that function, as well as the parameters, are a part of the function scope for that function. You cannot use those variables outside of that function. Now, this is different from variables that we create outside of the function, which are a part of the global scope. Thankfully, this is pretty cut and dry and not as complex as it used to be when we defined variables with the var keyword. This is why you should avoid using the var keyword in modern JavaScript. Now, if we go back to our code, we can see this demonstrated there. If I created a variable is valid within that function and assigned it a value of true, I couldn't read it outside of our function. It is limited to the scope of the function itself. So how do we let the caller know if the input was valid? Well, in this case, we will use a return value with the return keyword. Functions in JavaScript only return a single value, although they can certainly return a collection or an object if you need to return more information. Also, your functions don't have to have a return value, which I demonstrated earlier by running our function when all it had was a log statement. Now I'm going to put in the real logic for checking the validity of our input. Here we will use an array to store the actual department names. You can see that I am defining this as a constant since the value of those departments won't change while our program is running. Now we can check to see if the input value is contained within that array or not. Now if it is, we would return true. If it's not, we would return false. In this case, since the includes method on the array returns a Boolean, we can simplify it like this. Remember, since we defined our array of departments inside of that function, we cannot use that variable outside of the function since it is contained within the function scope. There is a lot more to get to with functions. We need to get into some additional syntax for different ways of defining functions, as well as discussing some additional best practices for working with functions just as we did for function names. We'll even explore a completely new way to iterate over collections using our newly discovered power of JavaScript functions. So now we're gonna dive in and use our newfound power of function declarations to improve the application that we have been working on here within this course. Now, as a reminder, 
inside of the exercise files for this module, you'll be able to see both the before, meaning where we're at right now in the application, as well as the after state of the application, meaning after we've integrated all of these new concepts at the end of this module. So let's go ahead and jump right in to VS Code. So here I have the application pulled up that we were working on at the end of the last module. Now what I'm gonna do here, because I don't yet have my node modules directory, is I'm going to run npm install to install the dependency that we have. Now that that's in place, we can start working here within the application. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use function declarations to isolate some of the code. Currently, you'll see that all of the logic for our application exists within this switch statement. And at times, that can make it a little bit hard to read. So we're gonna isolate each of the different actions like list and add into their own functions. So to start off with, just for organization's sake, I'm gonna go ahead and add in some comments. First, I'm gonna add in a comment that's gonna specify that all of our individual commands are going to happen here in the top portion of our application file. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna have another section which is where we actually have the logic that will run every single time that our application executes. And that's gonna be where we parse out the command from the command line arguments and where our switch statement resides. So now that I have that in place, I'll neaten up some line spacing here. I'm gonna start off here by removing the code that exists under this list option. So here, I'm gonna replace this with a call to a function that we will be creating. In this case, we'll call this list employees. Then I'm gonna go through and do the same thing for add. Now again, this is a lot of code that exists here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of this, and again, we'll be moving this to earlier within the file. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete this, and then we'll add in the call to add employee. Okay, so now we've neatened up this information here within our switch statement. Here we can clearly see that if we call list, we're gonna call our list employees function. And if we call add, we're gonna do our add employee function. So now let's go ahead and create those functions. So here, we're gonna go ahead and create our function for list employees. Now here, we don't need to add any parameters and we won't have any parameters for these particular types of commands because here, we're just gonna execute logic that the user will then interact with. So we just define it with no parameters and you can see that because there are no values in between the parentheses. However, now that we get inside of the function, I'm now going to move all of the logic that was previously inside of that switch statement. Great, now that we've defined this function, we need to add in our function for adding an employee. So here, we will add this one in, and I'm gonna take all of the logic that was in the switch statement earlier as well, and we're gonna drop that into this function. So now here we have the logic for our add employee function. Now we're gonna create another function, and this is not going to be a function that's going to be under our application commands. Here, we're gonna create a function that will really bring all of the logic together around how we get information from the end user using the prompt and how we validate that and then what we do with that result because in some cases we'll need to do some custom logic for processing that or transforming that. So here I'm gonna create a new function here. We're gonna call this get input and it's going to have three different parameters. The first is gonna be prompt text which is what we show to the end user. Then we'll have a validator function that we'll go through and validate to ensure that that input value is correct. And then after that, we're gonna have a transformer function, which will potentially transform that value into something else. And so over the course of this module, this will get implemented. Now, one of the things I haven't talked about yet is default values for parameters. Let's say that we wanted to have a default value for prompt text so that when the user called the function, even if they didn't enter in a value, we would have something for that parameter. Well, in this case, we could define that in this way. If we say equal, and then we pass in a default value, that will become the default, so that if the user calls the function without entering a value for that parameter, it would use this value. If we don't do this, the user can still call the function without entering a value for one or more of the parameters, but all of those parameters would be undefined. Now, in this case, I'm not going to use a default value, but I wanted to be sure you knew how to use that if you wanted to have a default value for one of your parameters. Now, we have a lot more we'll be doing with the get input function over this module, but for now, I'm simply going to have it get the value from the user through the prompt and then return that value. So now that we have this in place, we have taken the first step of integrating functions into our application. However, 
Before we look at integrating our validator and transformer functions, we're going to have to learn about a new way to define functions with function expressions. So now we're going to talk about another concept called function expressions. And this is going to integrate nicely with our process of validating the input that the end users are giving. So let's go ahead and jump right in to VS Code. So here within VS Code, I'm exactly where I was at the end of the last clip. Now I want to go ahead and show you something. If we look under add employee, we can see that we're doing a lot of the same logic over and over again. So let's look, for example, at what we're doing to validate our strings. So here, when the user enters a first name, for example, we're checking to be sure that it's returning a value, meaning that it's not an empty string, it's not undefined, it actually has a value to it. But we're doing the exact same thing for last name. And then if we look at when we're entering in the numeric values for the year, for the month, and for the day, we're doing a lot of the same logic as well. We're checking to be sure we have a valid number and that it's an integer. And if not, then we want to exit from the application. Well, wouldn't it be great if there was a way we could bring a lot of this logic together? That's what we're going to be doing. But to do this, we're going to utilize a new way of defining functions, and that is a function expression. So here, I'm going to go above my application commands, and I'm going to create a new section for functions. We're going to call these our validator functions. Now, if we think about the different types of input that we have coming into our application through the prompt, users could be entering in a string, they could be entering in a number, or they could be entering in a Boolean value. So let's think about what would be some common logic that we would use to define the validation that needs to happen for each. So to start off with, and I'm gonna use here a function expression to do this, we're going to start by looking at string input. So here, I'm gonna create a new function expression. Now, you'll notice that one of the big differences here is I'm actually defining this like I'm defining a variable. And here, what I'm doing is I'm saying that is string input valid is going to be equal to a function. So by defining it in this way, I'm able to pass around this just like I would pass around a variable. So here, I'm still going to specify the function keyword, I'm still going to have parameters, and I'm still going to have my curly braces that define the code block that's going to execute. Now, here, I've defined the logic for is our string input valid. We're going to say here that if we have an input, meaning that it's not an empty string, it's not undefined, it's not null, we're going to return true. Otherwise, we're going to return false. And we get this by using the ternary operator that we learned in a previous module. So that takes care of strings. But what about Boolean values? Well, in this case, we could go through and enter in an is Boolean input valid function as well. And here, we're just going to check to see is it either the word yes or the word no. And if it's either of those, then we can return true, saying that this is valid. Otherwise, we'll return false. Now, we need to add in some validation for numbers. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let you in on a little secret. At the end of this module, I'm going to walk you through the process of creating one validation function that can handle pretty much any type of number validation that we need to do here in our application. For now, we're going to create three separate number validation functions, one for the year, one for the month, and one for the day. But just know that we will be simplifying this a little bit later. So let me go ahead and create the first one here, which is going to be focusing on the year. And so here, we're going to go through and check, as we did before, that it is a valid integer value. And then in addition, we know that our year should fall between a specific range, which again is 1990 to 2023. So we're going to add in those checks here, and we'll return true if everything meets that criteria. Then we'll do the same thing for month. We know here that it needs to be an integer, and it needs to be between the numbers 1 and 12. And then finally, we'll have ours for the day. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can still see we have a good deal of reused code here between these three functions. That's why we'll be unifying them later. But again, don't worry about that part for just now. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to actually look at our get input function. So here, what we want to do is we want to integrate in these functions, our validator functions. And what's going to happen, and you'll see this in just a minute, when we call our get input function, we will pass in the function that we want to use to validate our input. So I need to add in some logic to do that. But let's talk about a few scenarios that we want to handle. First is, if we don't pass in a validator function, we don't want to validate the input. But if we do pass in a validator function, we want that to analyze the value that's returning from the prompt. So to do this, I'm going to add in an if statement here. And I'll say if validator and validator returns 
false. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, if we have passed in a validator function, we want to call it. And we're going to see that here by treating validator as though it were a function that we've defined. But in this case, it's going to be the result of a function expression that we're passing in. And don't worry if that doesn't make complete sense just yet. You'll see it in action here in just a minute. But if that returns false, then we want to go through and say invalid input and we want to exit the application. Very similar to what we were doing within our add employee function. Okay. Now that we have all of this in place, what we're going to do now is we're going to completely change the logic inside of our add employee function. So what I'm going to go do is I'm going to go under our add employee function and we're going to remove most of the logic that exists within this function. So I'm going to scroll all the way down, all the way until we get down to where we actually get the Boolean value and we're going to delete all of this. So that leaves us just with our employee object and then outputting the employee JSON. Now, what we're going to be able to do here is utilize our get input function to ask the user for these values. So here I'm going to start off by getting first name and last name. And you'll notice here that we're entering in a prompt and then we're passing in the function as a parameter to our get input function. In this case, it is our is string input valid. Now notice here when I'm passing this in, I'm not putting the open and closing parentheses after I'm not calling the function. I'm just simply passing the function as a parameter to our get input function. Now this is how it would work for our string values, but let's look at our next values. So here I'm going to go ahead and define our start date year and we'll do the same thing. I'm going to go through and say our start year pass in the prompt and then we'll see is start year valid being passed in. The same thing here for month, we'll go through and enter in the prompt value, and then we're going to say is start month valid. And of course, you've probably figured this out. We'll do the same thing for the day. So we'll pass in the prompt with get input, and then we're going to say is start day valid. Okay. So now that we have that in place, we can create our date based on those input values. Now this part is exactly as it was before. This line of code actually hasn't changed from what we had previously. Now we have one more step here. And that is, is that we need to define our employee is active value. So here we'll do the same thing. We'll call get input. We're going to check it with our is Boolean input valid. Perfect. So now that we have this in place, we should be able to run our application. So I'm going to go ahead and bring back up the terminal. And here within the terminal, I'm going to call node index.js and then add. And now we can interact with our application. So first I'm going to enter in a first name. Then I'm going to enter in a last name and then I need to start off by entering in an employee start year. In this case, if I try to enter in 1989, we should see that the application will exit because that is outside of the allowed values. And indeed, that's what happens. If I run it again and I enter in a correct value and a correct month and a correct day, then I can enter in, is the employee active? Yes or no. Now I'm purposely here going to say no. Now we can see here that it does output all of the correct values. We do get a date output. However, you'll notice here that for is active, we're not getting a Boolean value yet. We're getting a string. And in this case, a string that just says no. So we're going to have to do some additional work in the next clip to make all of this work. And in the next clip, we're going to introduce another new concept, our third way to define functions. And that is with arrow functions. So next, we're going to talk about arrow functions. Now, these were introduced to JavaScript in ES6. So this is even newer than function declarations or function expressions. So according to the MDN web docs, an arrow function expression is a compact alternative to a traditional function expression with some semantic differences and deliberate limitations in usage. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm not going to cover the limitations in usage here within this course but we will cover those thoroughly later within this learning path. So let's take a look at arrow functions. So here, I just want to remind you what a function expression looks like. So here we can have a function called is David. And if we're checking to see if the name equals David, we can denote this this way. This gives us our function expression that we covered in the last clip. Now, if we want to use an arrow function, a multi-line arrow function, and you'll see what I mean because not all arrow functions are multi-line in just a minute, but here you can see that we're really changing out by not using the function keyword. And then in between our parentheses for our parameters and the opening curly brace, we have this arrow symbol, which is really just 
an equal sign followed by a greater than sign placed together. And then we can return a value just like we would in a normal function. But if you remember, one of the things about arrow functions was that they could be compact. That was a part of the description that was provided in the documentation. Well, here we have a single line arrow function with a parameter. So here we can define this entire function entirely on one line without those curly braces. Now, if we do this, that means that our function really has just one statement that's gonna be executed. And if that statement returns a value, you don't have to use the return keyword here. It will return the result of that one statement. Let's take a look at some other examples here of arrow functions. We could also have a single line arrow function that has no parameters. Now, if we do that, we absolutely have to use these open and closing parentheses, even if we don't have one. Now, I will say, if you have a single parameter and you don't use the parentheses, that's okay. And we'll see some examples of that later within this clip. You can also have multiple parameters with an arrow function, just like you could with any other function and you separate them with a comma just like you would in other functions. So now that you have an overview of what arrow functions are, let's take a look at how we would use them within our application. So let's jump over to VS Code. So here in VS Code, I have the application in exactly the state it was in at the end of the last clip. Now, if you remember, we had a problem we were trying to solve, and that was, we wanted to be able to solve a situation where we enter in yes or no and have that correspond to be true or false. Now we're gonna solve this using arrow functions, but before we do, I wanna show you that we could convert any of the validator functions we have, we could convert these into arrow functions. We would simply need to delete the function keyword and then we could enter in the arrow, which again is really just an equal sign with the greater than sign right next to each other. And now we have an arrow function instead of a function expression. So I could save this and go through and run it and everything would work just as it did before. Now, we're gonna do something different here. We're gonna add in a transformer function. So the way that this is gonna work is we're gonna create a section here for our transformer functions, just like we did for our validator functions. Now, as a kind of a quick side note here, we're actually gonna delete this in a minute. We're not gonna need this, but I'm gonna take you on a journey to show you why. Now here within here, let's think about what we want our logic to do. We're basically saying if the user enters in yes, we want it to translate to true. And if the user enters in no, we want that to translate to false. So we could easily create a function in here utilizing an arrow function that would give us the logic we need to transform the Boolean value. Here we have a single parameter of input, and then we're gonna return the result of this conditional. Now the conditional here is input strictly equals yes. So if the user has yes included, then that would return true. And if they type in no, then it's gonna return false. Now you might say, well, what if they put in something else? Well, we've already handled that with our validator function. So we don't have to worry about that in this situation. If it actually is a value that's not yes or no, it wouldn't ever reach this point. But to make that work, we need to go up here and add in our logic for how we're going to handle our transformer function. So here we're gonna say if transformer, then we wanna return the result of our transformer function. Great, so now that we have this in place, I should be able to go down into our logic where we're getting the Boolean value, and I'm gonna include a third parameter. And that's going to be our transform Boolean value function. Okay, now, all of this should work to give us the correct value for true or false. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the application, and here we'll enter in a first name, and a last name, and we'll go ahead and do the start year. And here's where we enter yes or no. Now in this case, I'm going to enter yes. And we should see here that our is active value is set to true. I also could go through and do the same thing and enter in no, and we would see that it returns false. So our arrow function is working exactly as intended. However, I'm gonna tell you that everything we've done with this so far is in some ways, too much. We can actually write this with a lot less code. So what I'm gonna do, I want you to remember what we included here for our transformer function, but I'm gonna delete it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down here where we're entering in the transform, and I'm going to delete this, and I'm going to replace this with an arrow function. And here, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say that we have a single parameter, which is going to be i. Now, if you remember, I said you don't have to 
include the parentheses if you only have a single parameter. And that's the situation here. And if we have a single statement as a part of your function, like we do, which is we're returning the value of the conditional I strictly equals yes, then we don't have to use the return keyword. It will return the result of that. So if everything works as expected with this single line, this inline arrow function, I should be able to get the same result as the code that I had before. So here I'm gonna open back up the terminal and here we'll go ahead and run the application again. I'm gonna go ahead and enter in my name. We'll enter in the values for the year, the month and the day. And now I should be able to type in yes and still have it return true. And indeed it does work that way. Now, when we get into other areas of JavaScript, you'll see that arrow functions can be quite powerful. And we're going to be using that in the next clip to provide a new and different way to actually work with collections, to go through and loop through them, to go through and search in them, to filter in them. And we'll do that by pairing those capabilities with arrow functions. So next, we're gonna use the power of arrow functions to work with collections in new and different ways than what we've done so far. So let's just jump right into the code. So here within VS Code, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna create a function that will log out a single employee. Now this is one of the great uses of functions. If there's something you need to do multiple places within your file, you can isolate that logic in to a single function. So here I'm gonna call this function log employee. Now we're gonna have a few new things here, but again, all stuff that you can pick up. So I'm gonna talk you through what I'm doing here within this function. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is we're actually creating an arrow function here that's gonna actually do the logging. Here, it's gonna take a single parameter of entry. So how are we gonna get the values for a single employee? Well, here there is a function called entries on the global object called object and you can pass in an object. And then what it's gonna do, it's gonna enable you to basically loop over each of the properties within an object. Now you could do this just like you were doing a for in loop. It's basically the same thing. But here instead, we're using what we would call the functional approach. We're using an arrow function to do it. So once we get back an array of entries for an object, we can then call the for each method on that array. Within that for each method, it will execute the arrow function that you pass in once per item in the array. Okay, so now that we have that in place, we're gonna take a different approach to how we're listing out our employees in our application. So here, I'm actually gonna completely delete our two for loops. Now, I'm gonna tell you, in many ways, this is a matter of preference. You can keep using the for loops, they work just fine. But in many cases, you'll see developers using the approach I'm gonna show you here, which we would call the functional approach. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete these for loops. And now we're gonna include some additional logic. Here, I'm gonna use that for each function again on the array of employees. And then we'll go through and for each of the items in that array, we'll log out that employee. So let's see if this works. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and pull my terminal back up. And I'm just gonna go ahead and call node index.js and we'll say list. And here we can see it lists out our employees just as it did before. Great. So we really haven't changed anything, but we have optimized the code within our application. But now we're gonna add in some new functionality. So we're gonna actually add in new commands. So the first new command that I want to add in is gonna be a command called search by ID. And here's what I'm thinking. We're gonna go through and try to find a given employee based on their ID. If we look back at the data, you remember that each employee has an ID, which is a numeric value, all the way from zero up to our very last one, which is eight. So here, we wanna be able to search by that ID. So to make this work, we're gonna to need to go up under our application command section, and we're gonna to need to create a function that will house this logic. So here inside of this function, we need to do a few things in particular. But first of all, I wanna let you know that we're going to be relying on the capability of the array object called find. So here in the documentation, you can see that find enables you to find a specific value out of an array. You can pass in an arrow function, and if that arrow function returns true, then it will return that specific value from inside of the array. So let me show you how we're gonna use it. So here within VS Code, what we're gonna do is we're first gonna go through and get a value from the user. So here, I'm gonna say that we're gonna get an ID, we're gonna say get input, 
we're gonna have a prompt of employee ID. Now we don't wanna validate it in this case. So I'm gonna include null for the validator. And for the transformer, I'm just gonna include number because that will convert the value that is passed in to be a number value. Otherwise, it would be a string. So now that we have that in place, what I wanna do next is I wanna go through and try to find the employee based on that ID that the user enters. Now I can do that here by utilizing the find capability of the array that I just mentioned to you. So here we'll pass in an arrow function that is gonna check and see if the ID of that specific user matches the ID that our user just entered. Now, if so, it will return that value and we'll have a value for result. However, we're not guaranteed a result, are we? If I enter in an ID of a thousand, well, we don't have that many employees. So we need to account for a scenario where we might not have a result at all. So here, I'm gonna create a conditional and we'll say, if result is defined, we'll create a console.log statement to add in a bit of a space, and then we'll log the employee. If not, we're going to return a message telling the user that, hey, we're sorry, but you don't have any results. Perfect. So now we've integrated a new capability to our application. So here, I'll save it. So here, it's asking us for an ID. We'll first target a user that does exist. So we'll enter in the number three, and we can see that it does log out that specific employee. Now, next, I'm gonna go through and run it again, but I'm going to include an ID that I know we don't have, which is 1,000. And here, we can see that it does return no results. Great, so here, we've been able to utilize arrow functions to completely change the way that we're listing our employees with our list capability, and we've added in a new capability to search for users by ID. So now, we're gonna build on the concepts that we've learned so far with functions, and we're gonna do something else. So instead of going through and looping over an array, or even going in and trying to find a single value out of an array, we are going to filter the values from an array. And we're gonna use this to add in an additional search capability in our application. So here in the documentation, we're gonna use the filter method of array. So what this does is this allows you to provide a function. And if this function returns true for a given item in the array, it will include it in the results. And so we're gonna implement this to search for users by first and last name within our application. So let's jump over to VS Code. So I'm here in VS Code and here the application is in exactly the same state as it was at the end of the previous clip. And now we're gonna add in that search capability for searching for a user by name. So I'm gonna go down to my switch statement and we're going to add in another case. So here, I'll go ahead and enter in search by name, and we'll have a function called search by name that we'll use for the logic for this search. So now that I have that in place, I'm gonna go ahead and move up directly below where we're searching by ID. And here, we'll go ahead and create our function shell that will enable us to search by name. So now that we have this in place, we need to talk about how we're actually going to do this. What we want to enable users to do is to enter in a partial first and a partial last name. And if the user enters in a first name, for example, let's say they enter in the letter D. Well, anyone who has a first name that includes the letter D should be included in the results. But if we don't include anything for first name, then we should just return all of the values. So let's go ahead and implement this. First, we're gonna go ahead and prompt the user to enter in the first name that they're searching for. Again, this can be a partial value. Now notice here, we're not using any type of validator or transformer in this case with the get input function. We're not validating it because if the user doesn't want to enter a value, we want to accept an empty string here in this case. And notice that for both of these, we're converting whatever the user inputs into the lowercase version of it. This way we can compare lowercase versus lowercase. That way it's not going to be case specific. Okay, that's kind of the easy part. We've covered a lot of those concepts before. Let's go through now and look at how we're going to actually filter this array. I'm gonna go ahead and create a variable to hold our results. Then we're gonna create an arrow function. Now when you pass an arrow function into the filter function, what this does is it's going to pass each individual value from the array to this filter function. And if the function returns true, then it will include that item in the results. If it returns false, it will not include that item in the results. So here, let's figure out how we're gonna evaluate 
each of the names that the user has the option to pass in. So here, we're first gonna check for the first name. Now, if the user actually does include a string to search by, then we're gonna wanna go through and see if that is included in the name of the current item in the array. Now, specifically what we're doing here is we're checking first to see if they pass that value in, and then we're checking to see if it doesn't include the value that the user has passed in. So think about that. Let's pretend for the moment that we pass in the letters D-A-V-I-D. Well, if there's no one in our directory that has the letters D-A-V-I-D in their first name, we should return false. And that will make sure that that item is not included in the end results. But if we get this far, that means we also need to evaluate the last name. And here, this is going to be identical just with the last name instead of the first name. And notice that with both of these, we're also converting this to lowercase before we check for the value. Now, if we get to this point, that means that we should return it to the results because that means it has passed the test for both our first name and the last name. It could be that the user didn't enter in a search value for first or last name, and if that's the case, it will just return all of it. Okay, so now we've been able to filter that array. We should get back a list of results that match the criteria that we've specified. Now what we need to do is we need to loop over each of those results and we need to display them for the end user. Now we're going to use the for each function as we've done before. We're gonna take that results array and we'll create an arrow function that will loop over those values. Now, as a note, we actually have multiple parameters here. You've seen me use for each before and I only used a single parameter. However, you can get access to the index as well as the specific item in the array. And that's what we're doing here. And you can see how to create an arrow function that has multiple parameters. Okay, we've done a lot of work to put this search into place. Let's go ahead and test it out. So I'm going to bring up the terminal, and here I'm gonna be using the search by name command, and we can see that it's asking us here for the first name. I'm just gonna enter in the letter D. And then for the last name, I'm not gonna enter in anything. So what we should see is that we should get results back that have the letter D in the first name. And here we can see that we do have two search results that were returned, and both of these do indeed have a letter D in the first name. So here we've been able to use arrow functions to help filter out an array to values that we've specified. Now we have two remaining concepts to cover with functions in JavaScript. And the first of these is recursion. Now, when we're talking about programming, recursion is when you call a function within itself. Now in doing this, an infinite loop can occur, so this must be done in a way where a function will not call itself continually. Now you might not immediately think of a use case where you would need to call a function within itself, but we're gonna integrate one of these examples within our application. So let's jump over to VS Code. So here within our application, I wanna take a look at our get input function. So let's talk about what happens inside of the get input function. We go through and check to see if there is a validator in place. And if there is a validator, and the input comes back as being invalid, we simply exit the application. But what if we wanted to do something else? What if we just wanted to ask them again and give them a chance to go through and actually enter in a correct value? Well, instead of exiting out of the application, we could choose to do something else. So what we're going to do is we're going to call again the get input command. So here, we're gonna return the value that we get from calling get input again, and we'll pass in all of the same values. We'll pass in our prompt text, we'll pass in our validator, and we'll pass in our transformer. And so if again, the second time the user enters the correct value, it will proceed just as though they had done it the first time. But if they don't, it will keep asking them again and again until they enter in a value that is valid. So. Now that we've integrated this into the application, let's test it out. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and start the application. And here, we'll use the add command. So I'll go through and enter in the first name. Then I'll enter in the last name. Now, I'm purposely adding in these to be valid. But let's say I enter in 1989, which would not be valid in this case. You can see that it says invalid input, 
but then it goes through and asks me again. Let's say I enter in 2024, also not a valid option. It'll tell me again that it's invalid, but it will let me keep going. Then I could enter in 1991, which would be a correct value. And now I can progress through all the options and then finally specify that this employee is active. And here we can see that I do get the correct value actually returned. So this is one example, and albeit a simplistic example, for how we can leverage recursion to help implement the goals we have within our application. Now we have one final stop on our journey to learning about functions in JavaScript, and that is higher order functions. Now within JavaScript, a higher order function takes one or more parameters and then returns another function as its return value. Now you might be thinking, I can't think of why I would ever need to use that, but we actually have a use case within our application that is a perfect fit for this type of function. So let's jump over to VS Code. So here within our application, I'm gonna scroll down to our validator functions. And if you remember earlier on in this module, I said that we had a lot of code that was reused between these three different validator functions and that ideally we would have a way to bring them all together. And I said, towards the end of the module, I would be doing that. Well, this is the time. So I'm going to actually just delete all three of the validator functions that we have. And now we're gonna start the process of integrating something new. So here I'm gonna create a new function and this function will be called is integer valid. So ideally this will give us the ability to really get any integer that we need from our end users. And we'll pass in a min and max value when we create this. But that won't work for our validator function because we expect that our validator function is only going to have one argument and it's going to be the input value. So how do we do this? Well, the answer is, is that we actually return another function within this function. So here we'll go through and return another arrow function that does indeed take that input value. Now what we can do is that inside of this, we can now include all of the logic that we've been using to verify that something is a number and also to verify that it fits within the min and max values that we have defined. So now we can take this input function and we can actually use this as a validator. Now, if this doesn't make a ton of sense yet, let me show you how we'll use this. So I'm gonna scroll down to where we add our employees and I'm going to replace what we're using here currently. So instead of is start year valid, here we're gonna call is integer valid and then we'll pass in our min and max values. You might say, well, we're calling this function here and we didn't call the other one before but remember what our return value is for this function. It's another function. We're basically creating our custom validation function at runtime. So now I'm gonna do the same thing with checking for the month. And we'll go through here and we'll enter in the min value as one and the max value as 12. And we'll do the same thing here for is start day valid by going through and actually passing in the min as one and the max as 31. So if all of this works, we should see our application perform just as it did before, but with one custom validator function instead of three. So let's test it out. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and call add within my application. I'll pass in a first name and a last name. And here, we should see it be able to validate between the years 1990 and 2023. So if I enter in 1989, it's gonna tell me invalid input, and then it will let me enter one again. I'll go ahead and enter 1990 again, and it does get the correct value. I'll do the same thing here for both the month and the day, and then I'll specify that the employee is active. And we can see that everything succeeded just as it should. So here we have leveraged a higher order function to return a custom validator function for each of our different use cases where we can specify a min and max value. Now that we have a good understanding of functions, we can dive into another critical area of JavaScript, asynchronous programming. Let me explain that term if it's new for you. Some code executes the instant it runs. For example, think about defining a variable. Now other code may need to go and perform some other tasks and then report back when it's done. Now the first approach we would call synchronous and the latter we would call asynchronous. Within JavaScript, you may use asynchronous logic for doing things like asking for user input. And this is where we've used asynchronous logic already. Calling an API. Let's imagine that we were building a weather app and we wanted to go fetch the current temperature in Dubai using a publicly available service. 
We can use it for reading and writing files to the local file system, uploading and downloading files, interacting with a database, and interacting with an external service. You'll find that most every JavaScript application does one or more of these things, so you will need to understand how to work with asynchronous code. Now, there are three primary ways that you can deal with asynchronous code in JavaScript, callbacks, promises, and async await. Now, while we have gained new ways of dealing with this as JavaScript has matured, there are still situations where you will need to use each of these. So we will be covering them all in this module and I'll be providing a brief introduction to these different approaches here within this clip. Now, I'll be using the Node.js module for interacting with the file system here. If any of these imports seem confusing to you, don't worry. We'll be doing a deep dive on modules very soon. First, we will be looking at the callback approach. In theory, this is pretty simple. We create a function that we wanna be called when the file has been written. We can assign this function to a variable using a function expression, and we'll come back to this function in a bit. Now next, we need to specify a file that we wanna to write to, and then we can pass in the data we wanna write. We can then pass this function in as the third parameter, and it will be executed once the file has been written. If we were to execute this, we would see that it successfully writes the file and then outputs the log message. It may seem like callbacks are perfect. Why would you ever need anything else? Well, there are some difficulties that come with callbacks especially when you need to perform multiple asynchronous tasks in a row. While we define the function as a function expression and then saved it to a variable, I could also have written it this way. So if I wanted to do another asynchronous task and then another, we quickly end up with something called callback hell or the pyramid of doom. Your code becomes less readable and it can be very difficult to determine where errors are happening within these asynchronous tasks. Next up, we have promises. Now, the promise object represents the eventual completion or failure of an asynchronous operation and its resulting value. When working with promises, you can write logic that gets executed when the promise is fulfilled or rejected. Now, rejection would happen if there was an error during the asynchronous execution. Now, we aren't gonna talk about errors a lot in this clip, but it is coming up really soon. So you might look at this and say, that looks a lot like callbacks. And in some ways, you would be right. One of the advantages is that you can chain promises together. Node.js allows us to work with promises as well for writing files. In this way, we can specify the logic that gets executed in the then method of the promise. This will execute unless there is an error. Now there is a different way that we will handle this error, but I'll cover that in the next clip. If we have another file that we need to write, we can include that in our result function. Now we can chain these together as long as we are returning the promise. We can even simplify this code by leveraging single line arrow functions. Now we can see this simplified a great deal over using callbacks nested inside of other callbacks. Finally, we have a third option, and this is the one that has become the default for modern JavaScript, and that is async await. Now it's important to note that this isn't a different approach. It actually uses promises behind the scenes. It is really just a different syntax for working with promises, and it is a bit closer to how we work with synchronous code. Let's take a look at a simplified example of what we covered with promises. So here you can see that we are writing a file to the file system, and then we are logging something to the console. We can rewrite this using async await like this. In this way, the await keyword waits for the promise to resolve and then proceeds to the next line of code. If we wanted to write multiple files, we could do it like this, just as simple as adding another line. The reason we call this async await is that these await statements generally need to exist within a function that is designated as an async function. This means that the function returns a promise. We have been able to use await prior to this because we have been taking advantage of a capability in our version of Node.js called top level await. Now we have just barely covered the basics when it comes to working asynchronously in JavaScript. Over the course of this module, we'll be exploring all these different approaches in much more depth. Up next, we need to cover something. Now we have made an assumption that our code all works and nothing really goes wrong, but stuff always goes wrong. And for that reason, we need to take a look at error handling. Okay, I have to break something to you. Things don't always work perfectly in your code. I know it's difficult to accept, but it's true. 
And up to this point, we've only considered the happy path. This just means the path through the code where everything goes right. In any programming language, you also need to account for the things that can go wrong. What if you try to parse a JSON object that isn't correctly formatted? What if you try to write a file that you don't have permissions to modify? What if we request data from a server that is currently down? There are so many situations that could occur that would result in us having to handle something going wrong. So I wanna look at two different ways that we can deal with errors, using try-catch as well as handling errors with promises. Now, while we often need to deal with error handling in synchronous code, we absolutely need to deal with it in asynchronous code because we are generally interacting with something else we don't have full control over, such as the file system or an API endpoint. First up, let's look at two new keywords, try and catch. Earlier in this course, we talked about JSON. If we pair together our ability to read and write files with the ability to parse JSON using the parse method of the JSON object, we can store and retrieve data on the local file system. Now, using some of our asynchronous programming knowledge from the previous clip, that could look a bit like this. Let's think of what could go wrong here. First, the file might not exist. Second, the file might not be valid JSON. Even if it has a JSON extension, there is nothing preventing the file from having something completely different in it. It's also possible that the JSON might be malformed because someone chose to write it by hand. And if that's the case, our application will throw an error when we try to parse the JSON. So how do we handle that? Well, we could handle this using a try catch block. We wrap the code that we want to try inside of the try block. Now, immediately after this block, we write another block. This block will be used to catch the error if it happens within the try block. This block has an argument, and that will be the error object that was thrown. Now, we haven't talked about the error object yet. This error object has three different properties that we can use to determine what went on to cause the error. And we have name and message along with stack. Now, that last one probably isn't super useful to you yet, but the first two will be vital in determining what led to this error. So let's jump back into the code and see how we could get more information about our error. So here within our catch block, we can add some log statements to better understand the error. When we output the name and message, we can see that parsing the JSON was indeed the issue that led to the error that we have received. At this point, you could choose to do something different. Maybe you need to tell the user that you can't load the file or have the application exit. One of the great things about async await is that you could use this exact same syntax to catch the errors in your asynchronous code too. So if we had an error in reading the file, that would also get caught in the catch block. Promises work a bit differently. With promises, just like we have a then method to go in and add what action should be executed when the promise resolves, we also have a catch method that should be used and executed when the promise is rejected, meaning that there was an error somewhere in the process. Let's take a look at that one too. So I've rewritten the same logic without using async await. If I wanna catch the same errors, I could add a function in the catch method of the promise object. The error object will be the argument into this function. So I can still access the name and message. I could add in my logging statements here to see why this error occurred. There is a lot more to error handling. So much, in fact, that there is a whole course in this learning path to dive into the specifics. We can use the basic information I have covered in this clip to add in some basic error handling in our application to handle any unexpected scenarios that may arise. So now that you have an overview of asynchronous programming and you're familiar with concepts like callbacks and error handling, we're actually gonna get a chance to work in the code with these concepts today. And this will play an important role because we're gonna add in some new capabilities here within this module to the directory application that we've been building. But the first thing we need to do is I need to introduce you to another JavaScript keyword that we haven't covered yet. And that is throw. So the throw statement throws a user defined exception and execution of the current function will stop. The statements after throw won't be executed and control will be passed to the first catch block in the call stack. If no catch block exists among caller functions, the program will terminate. Now, you would use this in situations where your application simply cannot proceed. So let's say, for example, that your application stores all of its data in a file. Well, if it can't read that file when the application is starting up, 
it may need to just throw an error and that would actually stop execution of the program. It would exit and it would report back on what that error was. And we'll be using this here as a part of our error handling when looking at callbacks. Now, the next thing I need to talk about is that we're going to be using a Node.js API. So here we have the documentation for our current version of Node, which is Node 18, which is the LTS version. Now I'm specifically looking at the API for interacting with the file system. Now the file system has two different APIs. You can see here the promises API, but we have the original callback API as well. So if I scroll down through all of these options, you can see that I end up on the callback API. We're specifically going to be looking at the read file function. So here, if I scroll down to read file, you can see that here's the function that we're going to be executing and we're able to pass in a path, some additional options and a callback to read a file from the local file system. So now that you understand what we're going to be doing in terms of what API we're going to be working with, you understand the throw statement. Let's dive in and take a look at working with callbacks in code. So I'm here within VS code. And the first thing I'm going to do is to create a new file. Now here within this file, the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to pull in that Node.js module that I just showed you the documentation for, and that is the file system module and more specifically the callback version of the file system module, which again was the original API for the file system module. Now the next thing we'll need to do is we'll need to call our function for FS dot read file. Now we need to pass three different parameters into this function. Now, before we do that, I want to show you that I have a JSON file here. It actually has some employee data similar to what we've been dealing with so far. And this is contained just within a JSON file. Now this is valid JSON currently in this file. And so what we should be able to do is to read this in from the local file system and then parse it as JSON. And then we can verify that that data is correct. So that's what we're going to be doing here within this clip. Now to make that work, I'll need to pass in the file name. Now, in this case, the file name, we're just going to say it's in the current directory. It's data.json. And then we have the ability here to pass in some options and we can either pass in a string or an object here. But if we just pass in a string, it's going to be the encoding of the file that we're trying to read. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to say that this is a UTF eight file, and this is going to then pull this data back as a string. If I didn't include this value, it's actually going to return the binary data as a buffer. And in some cases we would want that. If we were maybe working with an image, for example, and we wanted to do some manipulation on an image, but when we're dealing with a text file, like a JSON file, we want to pull this in as UTF eight. Now, the next thing here is that we need to pass in our callback function. Now, this particular callback function is expected to have two different parameters. The first parameter is an error parameter. So if anything goes wrong in attempting to read the file from the file system, we will see that this value comes back. Now, if we don't have anything that goes wrong, we can expect that this value will be undefined. And this is pretty much the standard practice when dealing with callback functions is the first parameter is going to be an error. So you can check that when the callback function is executed. And then the next parameter is the result. In this case, that's going to be the string data coming out of the file that has been read from the local file system. Okay. So to make this work, we're going to need to check for that error. So here I'm going to go ahead and check to see if the error is defined. And if it is, I'll log something out saying that we can't read the file. And then we're going to use the keyword that I introduced earlier throw. Now what this will do here, because we can't read the file, it will throw this error. So we'll see that logged out on the console and it also will stop the execution of our application. And we'll test this out here in just a bit, but let's say that everything does go well. Well, what do we do next? Well, I'm going to go ahead and define a new variable and I'll parse out the JSON. And then I'll go through and log that out. And then I'll say, Hey, we've completed, we've done everything we intended to do within this application. Now, some of you might be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, we haven't accounted for the fact that it might not be able to parse the JSON data. You are correct. And we'll be getting to that in just a minute. But for now, if I go ahead and run the application by hitting F five, we can see that it does pull the data back. Now you can see there's 65 different objects that are included in this array from the JSON data. So it doesn't log everything out here, but we can see that it does pull it back. And then we get our log statement saying that it is complete, but let's look at an error scenario here. Let's say that instead of data.json, let's say we were trying to do maybe x.json. Well, we know that this file doesn't exist. You can look over there in the Explorer in the left pane and see that it's not included. 
So we should get an error when this happens. So let's test that out by pressing F5. And we can see we do indeed get an error. We can see it says error reading the file. And then we get an uncaught error. It says no such file or directory. And that's exactly what we would expect. But you'll notice here that it didn't attempt to parse the JSON after this. It didn't log out complete or anything. It truly stopped at that throw statement because we couldn't proceed beyond this point. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is another scenario that we need to account for. And that is going to be the situation where we actually have a file that gets read in, but it can't properly be parsed as JSON. Well, in this case, we're gonna to need to create a try catch block. So instead of this code that you see here, instead, I'm gonna replace this with a try block, and we're gonna include all of that logic that I had previously inside of this try block. And then we're going to add in our catch block, and we're gonna do something very similar to what we did if we had the earlier error. So here we'll log out and say that we cannot parse the JSON from the file, and then we'll go ahead and throw that error. So we can test this out as well. Now, first of all, this should work perfectly if I leave everything the way it is right now. And we can verify that by pressing F5. And indeed, everything does work properly. But let's say I were to go into this file and instead of it starting here with an array, let's say I just added in some random symbols. Well, we know this is no longer valid JSON. So now if I go back and I were to execute this again, what we would see is we actually get another error that's thrown specifying that we cannot parse JSON from the file. Now, this is a good example of working with callbacks in general. We're able to go out and get something asynchronously, in this case, reading a file, and then execute a callback function when that's completed. But as I mentioned to you in one of the earlier clips in this module, there are times when nesting a lot of callbacks together can become confusing. And that's one of the many factors that led to a more modern approach for dealing with asynchronous code, and that is promises. And that's what we're gonna be covering in the next clip. So next, we're gonna dive into working with another asynchronous programming concept in JavaScript, and this time it's gonna be promises. And promises are an essential element of modern JavaScript development. So let's not waste any time, let's jump right over to VS Code. So here within VS Code, I'll first create a new file. Now within this file, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bring in the Node.js module for working with the file system, but this time it's gonna be the version that utilizes promises as opposed to callback functions. Now, since we have this in place, we'll start the process of reading the file. And as I started out here, you might be tempted to think, wow, this looks exactly like what we were doing in the last clip. And trust me, it's gonna change here pretty quickly. But the first two arguments that we're gonna pass are identical to what we used in the previous clip. We'll give the file name and we'll specify that it's going to be UTF-8 encoding. But here's where things start to change. We don't pass in a callback function. Instead here, we're gonna specify the logic that needs to be executed once the file has been read. But instead of a callback function, we're gonna enclose this inside of the then function. So here we're gonna specify that this will be executed once that file has been read. But you'll notice here, we only have one argument to our arrow function that we defined here, and that is data. Whereas when we're dealing with callback functions, we would have both a potential error and whatever the result was from our asynchronous action. But don't worry about that because we will handle errors here in just a minute. But for now, here within this particular function that we've created, I need to add in the logic for parsing out the JSON and logging out all of our details to the console. Now, once this is in place, I should be able to run this and assuming that that file is present on the file system and assuming that it is valid JSON, we should see these values logged out to the console. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. But we do need to take care of the situation where either the file isn't present or it isn't valid JSON. So for here, instead of adding another dot then, we're gonna add in a dot catch. And this will catch any of the errors that happen in the entire promise chain. And I'll go ahead and give you a heads up in a bit, we'll be adding even more asynchronous logic to this, and we'll see that any errors that happen would end up in this particular function. So here within this particular function that we've created, we can add in the logic for logging out the fact that there's an error and then throwing that error so that it will end execution of the application. Okay, now we could test this out too by doing what we did previously and changing the file name. I'll just add an X on to the end. We know that that file isn't present. So when I hit F5, we can see that indeed we do get our log statement stating that we couldn't complete loading and parsing. And then we can see what the error was, which in this case was no such file or directory. 
Perfect. So that's working exactly as we would hope. Now, here's another scenario though, and probably one you haven't thought of yet. What if you're dealing with some type of an SDK or API where you don't have access to an API that supports promises and it only supports callbacks? And trust me, you're gonna run into this situation. Well, you can actually create your own promises. So I wanna show you how that works here in this case. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through and create a custom promise. And in this case, it's gonna use the callback version of the API that we used in the last clip. Now, I wanna go ahead and call out here that we're gonna create a function in a slightly different way. And that is, we're gonna create our first async function. So here, I'm gonna specify that we're creating an arrow function. Again, this should look pretty familiar to us because we've done this kind of thing before. But in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the async keyword here to specify that this function returns a promise. Now, you might be saying, well, how can we return a promise if we don't have an API that supports that? Well, in this case, a promise is just an object. So what we can do is we can actually go in and specify that we're gonna create a new promise. Now, a promise takes a function as its argument. And this function has two different parameters that are passed to it, resolve and reject. Now, these are two functions that we will call when we're ready to either resolve the promise or reject the promise, meaning that there was an error that happened within the execution. So to get the logic for this going, let's go back to the top here and underneath where we're bringing in our promises API, let's bring in the API that we used previously. So here we'll bring in the node file system module for the version that uses callbacks instead of promises. And you'll notice here, we're gonna call this one FSC. So we'll just distinguish that for file system callbacks. Since I have that in place, let's now go inside of the arrow function that we created as we're creating our new promise. Now in here, we're gonna call fsc.readfile, and this should look identical to what we did within the last clip. We'll specify if there's an error, we need to do something, and then if there's not, then we'll need to do something else. Now within this particular conditional where we're checking for the error, we can say that we're going to reject based on the error. And then in the situation where there's not an error, we can actually call resolve. And here, this will enable us to resolve it, so anything that's waiting on this promise to be completed will get this data back, assuming, again, there are no errors that happen in the execution. Now, it becomes pretty easy for us to integrate this into the logic that we currently have. So here, I can actually go in, and before the catch, I can actually add in some additional asynchronous logic. So in this case, we'll say that we're gonna read that file again, and then after that, we'll log that data out to the console. So now I'll go ahead and save this file, and now we'll run it. And you'll notice here that it did actually output the entire JSON file after our complete statement. So we can see that we've been able to integrate this chain of promises with a custom promise that we created utilizing the callback version of the API. So next, we're gonna explore how to use promises in a different way by using async and await. Now, according to the MDN web docs, the async function declaration declares an async function where the await keyword is permitted within the function body. And the async and await keywords enable asynchronous promise-based behavior to be written in a cleaner style, avoiding the need to explicitly configure promise chains. Use of async and await enables the use of ordinary try-catch blocks around asynchronous code. Now, all of those concepts are things that I introduced at the beginning of this module, but now I wanna show it to you in code. So let's waste no time, let's jump into VS Code. So here within VS Code, I'll create a new file. And here within this file, the first thing we're gonna do is to pull in that promise-based API from Node.js for working with the file system. Now, as I mentioned in the definition slide previously, to utilize async and await, we need to have an async function. So here, I'm gonna define an async function called load data. Now, most of the logic in here is gonna be similar to what you've seen, but to start off with, I'm going to use the await keyword. So here, I'm gonna say that data is equal to await and then fs.readfile, and then we'll pass in the same arguments that we used previously. So let me explain what's going on here behind the scenes. We're still using the promise-based API, so we're still working with promises. The await keyword specifies that the promise will need to complete, and then after that, it will execute the next steps that are listed in your code. This makes it work in many ways, similar to how we work with synchronous code. And we'll see that's true on multiple fronts here within this clip. 
So that's our first step. And the next step here is just the plain stuff we've been doing in all of the last several clips. And that is we're gonna parse this out to be an actual data object by parsing the JSON, and then we'll actually log some stuff out to the console. So now that we have that in place, we should be able to execute this function and that should give us our data. So what are we gonna do here? Well, at the end, I'm just gonna go ahead and call load data, and then I'll include a final logging statement that says that that promise has completed. But here it's async, and you might say, well, I thought in the last clip you said that async had to return a promise. Well, in this case, using await is basically doing that for us behind the scenes, so we don't have to do it manually. So now I should be able to save the file and hit F5, and you can see that it does bring back the data, it does log out and say that it's complete, and we see that final log message stating that the promise is completed. Okay, now that's great, but just as we've dealt with before, we need to be able to handle situations where errors may occur. Now, the difference here is we're gonna go back to what we were using with synchronous code to be able to do this, and that is gonna be a try catch block. So here, I'm gonna specify our try block, and I'll go ahead and adjust the indentation here. And then we need to add in our logic for our catch block. And again, this is gonna be very similar to what you've seen before. We'll actually log out a message and then we will throw the error. Okay, so now this should work exactly as it did before. So here, if I go up and change so that we have a file that doesn't exist, and then I hit F5, we'll see that it utilizes promises, but we still get the ability to see the error displayed here, just as we would have done in using a catch function after our promise chain. So here we're gonna do this in line utilizing a try catch block. Okay, now that's perfect. And this all works the way that we would want it to. But I wanna show you some of the power here because we can go through and do some additional things. Like let's say I don't wanna just do one asynchronous thing. Let's say that I wanna do several. And I'm gonna add in some logging statements here so we can actually see that this plays out in the order that we would intend. So here we're just gonna go through and read the same file several times. And this will just help to illustrate the way that async and await works behind the scenes. So here in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and have several additional reads of the file. So after we read the file the first time, it will say file read one, and then it'll go through and do the same thing for two and three. Now, if this works the way that we want it to, we should see that we're going to see this come out in order, and all of these statements will be logged in the order that you see them here in the code. So now I'll hit F5, and we can see that indeed, we actually see file read one, two, and three happening before we get to the point where we're logging out the data, and then finally before we're actually listing that the promise has been completed. Now, I've shown you all this, and I read you a definition earlier that said that await needed to exist within async functions, but now I wanna introduce you to one additional concept, and that is top-level await. So here, according to the ECMAScript proposal for top-level await, this enables modules to act as big async functions. With top-level await, ECMAScript modules can await resources, causing other modules who import them to wait before they start evaluating their body. Now, I realize this probably doesn't make a ton of sense yet because we haven't covered ECMAScript modules and modules in general yet, which we will be doing very soon. But let me show you how that changes, potentially, how we can write our code. So I'm gonna jump back over to VS Code. So first, I wanna point out, if we go under our package.json file, here we're listed as type of module. So this is being treated as a module with ECMAScript modules. So in this case, because we're using node 18, we can take advantage of top level await. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually gonna take this entire block inside of our function, and I'm gonna copy it. And I'm gonna go down here below where we executed that promise, and then I'll paste it. And now I'm gonna to go to everything that we've included previously, and I'm just going to comment this out. And so now this is all we have to execute. Now I wanna show you that this works outside of the async function because of top level await. So if I run this now, we can see the exact same result that we had before, which means if you are using a module, you do have the ability to utilize await outside of an asynchronous function in some cases, and that's why we can use it here. So now we're gonna be taking these asynchronous programming concepts that we've been covering in this module, and we're gonna be integrating them into the sample application that we've been building. So here in this demo, we're first going to be loading data using a file on the local file system. And then we'll be utilizing asynchronous logic with promises and async await. 
And then finally, we will be persisting data beyond a single execution of the application. So let's dive in. So here within VS Code, I'm first gonna run npm install to install the dependencies that I have for the application. Now I wanna show you in the data.json file, we have some new fields. We're getting a salary in US dollars as well as a local currency for each of the employees. And we'll be covering that in the upcoming clips. Now also note here, we have a lot more employees than we did before. We currently have 60 different employees that are listed. And so we're gonna be working with these employees throughout the course of this clip. So let's jump over into the index.js file. So here within this file, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change how we're actually loading in data. We're gonna be using something that should be pretty familiar to you at this point, and that is the promises version of the node file system API. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna have some global variables. The main one is going to be employees. Now we previously got that from loading in the JSON using the import statement, but here we're gonna create an empty array. And the plan will be that we'll read in the data from the data.json file and populate this array on startup of the application. But to do that, we'll need to write some files to actually handle loading data as well as writing data back to that JSON file. But once this is in place, the cool thing is, is that our application will actually be working. When we add an employee, they'll actually get to stay in the directory uh, even after we close the application and restart it. So our first function here is going to be for loading in the data, and this should look very familiar to you. We're gonna have a try block. We're gonna use the fs.readfile function. We'll pass in that it's data.json, and then we're gonna go through and parse that JSON. We'll have a catch block to catch any issues that may arise, and we'll say that we cannot load employees if that happens, and then we'll throw the error. Okay, that's our first function. Now the second one is gonna be very similar. It's also going to be an async function for writing data. So what this will do is it will take our current array of employees and it will write that data back out to the JSON file. So we'll use fs.write file, and you'll notice here that we do pass in the file name as well as the content, which in this case is gonna be a string that's generated by json.stringify. And we'll add in our catch block in case anything unexpected happens. Okay, so this is a good first step. We've added in a lot of additional information here on how to load in data from the JSON file and write it back out. Our next step will be, we're gonna wrap some of our logic around application execution into a new function. The reason is, is we wanna actually have a startup process where the data is loaded before anything else happens. So here, I'm gonna go in and create a new function called main, and I'm gonna specify that this is gonna be an async function. And again, when you're doing an arrow function, this actually goes right before the parameters. Okay, so now we have that, and I'm going to actually take and cut everything that we have here under application execution. And I'm gonna paste that inside of this function. And we can format the document to be sure everything has the correct indentation. Okay, great. So we're getting close, but now we need to actually specify what happens when the application starts. And here's where we're going to utilize some of the promise chaining that we learned about in a previous clip. So we'll say that loading data is the first step, and then we'll run our main function, and then we'll add a catch to catch any errors that happen within the overall startup process. So great, we've included that in place and we could now run the application and we should see that it would work just as it had before. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull the terminal up and here I'm gonna run node index.js and we'll say list. And you'll notice here that indeed it does work just as it did before. So now that we have that in place, the next thing we need to do is we need to handle a situation that's currently happening when we add in a new employee. Now I'm gonna show you here that when we're adding in an employee, we're not specifying an ID anywhere. And if you go and look in our JSON file, you'll notice that here in this file, there are numeric IDs and they go in order. Now we could certainly just create some sort of random ID for each employee, but in this case, I wanna follow the same concept that has been put in place with this sample data. So we need to create a function that will help us know what the next ID is for a new employee. So I'm going to scroll up here. I'm gonna go under where we're actually defining our get input function, and we're gonna create a new function here. And I'm gonna show you some new concepts as a part of creating this function. So this function is gonna be called get next employee ID. Now this doesn't need to be an async function. This is gonna happen synchronously, but here's what it's trying to do. It's gonna go through and figure out what the biggest ID in terms of the max value 
of the number for IDs across all employees is. So here, there's a function I want to tell you about on the array object called map. So let me show you what this is. And I'm going to tell you this doesn't actually solve our problem yet, but it's the first step. So we're going to call map on our employees. And what this does is it enables us to return a value from each item in the array. In this case, we're going to return the ID of each item. Now it will create a new array. So imagine this new array that has all of the different IDs from zero to one, two, so on and so forth. It has all the values for each of the employees in our array. The problem is math.max is not designed to take an array. Math.max is expecting that we're going to list a bunch of values as parameters. So in this case, if we passed in math.max and we did one comma two comma three, it would return three because in that case, that is the maximum value. Well, we can do this here utilizing something called spread syntax. So I quickly want to go over to the documentation. So here for the MDN web docs, the spread syntax allows an iterable object such as an array or string to be expanded in places where zero or more arguments for function calls or elements for array literals are expected. So this is what we're going to utilize here to basically change it out from an array into something that our math.max function can actually use. So here, what I want to do is I want to utilize spread syntax at the very beginning. So I'm simply going to add in three dots and it will convert that into a list of parameters for the math.max function, which should give us our maximum ID. And then we'll simply return one. Now, the way that we'll integrate this into our application is simply after we create our new employee, we will go in and add in the ID. Perfect. Now, there's one more thing we're going to do here. We no longer need to just output the employee JSON. That actually seems to be not that useful. Instead, we want to do something else. First, we want to add this employee to the array of employees, and then we want to write the data back out. And this will ensure that that new employee will remain in our list when we start the application again. Now, you'll notice here that we have an error. Well, the reason is, is because this isn't currently listed as an async function. So we're going to go ahead and specify here that this is an async function. And then when we go down to use this function, we're going to also specify here that we want to use await. Okay. Now we've added a lot into this application and you might think, well, let's test out adding in a new employee, but we're purposefully going to wait because we haven't yet added in the ability to add in those two new fields that we've added. And we'll be doing that over the upcoming clips. So now we're going to use our asynchronous programming logic to do something that I think is pretty cool. And that's to make HTTP requests. And this opens up a whole host of ways that we can build exciting experiences by leveraging publicly available APIs. And that's exactly what we're going to start doing here within this clip. So first of all, we're going to be reviewing a public API for currency conversion. And eventually we're looking to integrate this into our employee application. We are then going to be signing up for a free API key for that API. We'll then be testing out that API with Postman and then implementing that API within JavaScript utilizing fetch. So let's dive in. So we're going to be using the exchange rates API. So within our directory application, we're going to set US dollar as being the base currency. So we're going to store all of our employees salaries in that currency, but then we want to be able to convert it in an accurate conversion over to whatever their local currency is to display in the application. And we can do that here with the exchange rates API, but like most APIs, you need to have an API key. So here you can actually click to get a free API key. And you can go ahead and select the free option and you'll have up to 250 requests totally for free every month. And it says free here for a lifetime. So I've actually already done this and I already have an API key. So we're going to go ahead and move forward past this part. Now I'll note here the API key that I have, I will be deleting at the end of recording this course. So don't go through and try to use the key that I'm using. So now we're going to jump over to an application that we haven't used yet in this course. And that is Postman. So Postman is a great way for us to test out publicly available APIs or anything really that we can hit with an HTTP request. We're going to use this here to verify that our API key works before we move over and start integrating it into our application. So first we need to know the request URL. Now I know for the request that we're doing, we're going to be utilizing this particular URL, which is going to give us the latest currency conversion data. Now we do need to specify some parameters. So in this case, we need to specify that our base is going to be in US dollars. So we'll say base is USD. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to add in a header. And this header is going to be the API key. 
So I'm going to specify API key. And now I'm going to enter in the value that I got by creating that free account. Now, as a reminder, as I said earlier, I will be deleting this API key. So don't try to reuse this one. Now that I have that in place, we're now able to actually execute this. So I'm going to hit the send button. Now we'll see that we get the data returned. Now here you can see that we have rates. Now this is all in comparison to the US dollar. So here you can see what we actually would need to multiply values by to get the actual conversion over to whatever the currency is. So for example, if we scroll down to GBP, which is going to be Great Britain pounds, we can see that that's 0 0.832005. Okay, so now that we have this in place, how do we integrate this into our application? Well, Postman has a feature that can be helpful in getting started, and that is the code generation feature. So here you can see for JavaScript, it actually has some code. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, I wouldn't recommend using this code without making some edits to it, but this just shows you how you can utilize Fetch. And I know we haven't yet talked about Fetch, so let's take a quick trip over to the documentation. So here in the MDN web docs, it tells us about the Fetch API, and this provides an interface for fetching resources, including those across the network. Now, with this being said, this is only recently available in Node.js. And with it being available in Node.js, we now have an API for making HTTP requests that is the same both on the server and in the browser. So let's go ahead and dive in and actually utilize the Fetch API. Now, before we integrate this into the application, I simply want to test it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new file and we'll call this Fetch. Now here within this file, we're gonna bring over a lot of the concepts that were covered inside of Postman. So first of all, we're gonna create a new headers object and we're going to specify our API key as one of the headers. It simply won't work without this. If we made the request, we would get back a status code indicating that we weren't authorized to make the request. Now, the next thing that we need to do after this is we need to actually set our request options. So here, we'll go ahead and specify those. This will include some different values, including the method, as well as those custom headers that we just created. So once we have this in place, now we can actually look at integrating in and using fetch. But since it's asynchronous code, and since we're gonna be using async and await, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this in a try catch block. I'll go ahead and set that up. And then within our try block, we can now enter in the code to interact with fetch. So first of all, I'll say that the result here is going to be awaiting fetch. And then for fetch, I'll specify first that URL. And this includes that base parameter that we had included. And then our request options variable. Now, after this, we're going to go through and say that we want to get back the JSON results. Now, that also requires that I use await. Now that we have this in place, we could execute it. But I also want to give us some logic here in our catch block in case something goes wrong. And it's important to note here, anytime you're calling a publicly available API, especially if you have a free API key and you're not actually under an SLA, there's a good chance it might not work properly the first time or it might not work well on occasion. So you absolutely need to integrate error handling in. In some cases, you might even wanna integrate the ability to retry an API call if it fails the first time. But for now, we'll go ahead and save this and I'll hit F5 to run it. And here you can see it has returned the same data that we saw in Postman. We get all of the different currency conversion rates that were included for that API endpoint. So now that we understand how to work with a publicly available API, now that we understand that we have a service that we can call to get this data, in the next clip, we can work on integrating this into our application. So now we're gonna take the information that we've learned about asynchronous programming and especially the information we've learned about making HTTP requests in the previous clip, and we're going to apply that to the application that we've been building. So here, over this clip, we're first going to be integrating the currency data from the public API, and that was what I demonstrated in the last clip. And then we'll be adding additional prompts for salary fields, displaying formatted currency fields, and verifying our data persistence. So this is pretty exciting. Let's head over to VS Code. So here within the application, the first thing we need to do is to create another global variable to hold our currency data. And this will be what we populate once we go and fetch that data. So now we need to actually go and fetch it. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because we did cover this extensively in the last clip, but I will point out a few changes to what we included previously. So we'll create our new async function called get currency conversion data. Within this function, we'll go through and first create our headers object. 
and we'll go through and add our API key. Again, if you don't have an API key yet, go back and check the previous clip. Now, the next thing we need to do is to create our options object, and I will show you one thing with this. So you'll notice here that we're creating a property on this options object called headers, and we're using the variable headers for the value. Well, if you ever have to do that, you can actually just write it this way. Perfect. Now, the next thing we need to do is actually get the data. And then we need to check something here, and we didn't do this in the previous clip. So here we need to check that the response is okay. Now that's gonna mean it's got a 200 or 200 level status code. Now that's important because that means that the request completed successfully. Now the server that's sending us the data is what sets that status code. So if we get back a status code of 500, meaning that there was a server error, for example, on the server that was supposed to be sending us the data, then it's not going to throw an error here. However, we want it to throw an error. So that's why we check to see if the response is okay. Now I also wanna show you here we're creating our own error. We're not using one that was passed to us. We can do that by utilizing the constructor here and saying new error and then passing in the message for the error, which in this case is cannot fetch currency data. Once we have that, we can go through the process of actually setting the value on our currency data object by parsing out that JSON. Okay, so now that we have this in place, the next step that we need to take is we need to add in a validator function. If you remember, we have prompts for all the data that's gonna be included in the directory. And for each of those prompts, we need to have a function that validates if the user's input is correct. And we have two additional fields. Now I'll show you this here on the data.json file. We have both a salary in USD, which is just an integer, and we know how to validate that. We've already done that. However, we also have a local currency, which utilizes a three-letter currency code. Now we're getting those back with the API call and we need to be sure that what the user enters is actually a value that we have included in those results. So let's create a validator function to handle that use case. So here, we're gonna create a new function. We're gonna call this is currency code valid. Now we're gonna pass in that code, that's how any validator function works. But in this case, we're gonna go through and get the keys for our rates object on our currency data. So that will be all of those three letter codes like USD and GBP and ZWL and so on and so forth. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna check to see if the code that the user supplied is included in that array. And we're gonna do that with the index of method on the array. Now with this, if it is not found, it will return negative one. However, if it is found, it will be zero or higher. So here we're just gonna add in a single conditional to say if the index of is greater than negative one. If that's the case, it will return true, indicating that the currency code is valid. Otherwise, it will return false. Okay, now that we have that in place, we're gonna go back up and add another function underneath where we are getting our currency conversion data. Now, you might say, this file is getting pretty long and a little bit confusing. Well, you would be right, and that's why we often split our applications up into multiple files, which we will be covering in the next course module around modules, but you'll have to hold on just a bit for that. Okay, now let's go ahead and add in another function here called get salary. And here we'll pass in both the amount in USD as well as the currency code that we wanna have it displayed in. And we'll both do the conversion and handle the formatting here within this function. So the first thing we need to do is to do the conversion. So here we'll add in a new variable called amount and it's gonna take the currency that gets passed in and if it's USD, it's just gonna return the amount. Because in this case, we know that we don't need to convert USD because that's what it's already in. However, if it's anything else, we want it to multiply that amount by the currency conversion rate that we got from the API. Perfect. Now the next thing we need to do is handle formatting because we know that each currency is displayed a little bit differently. And from an earlier clip in this course, you know that we can utilize the number format to handle currency formatting. In this case, we'll format that based on the currency code that gets passed in. Perfect, okay. We're getting closer here to having this fully implemented. The next thing we need to do though is we need to add in our prompts for the user. So I'm going to scroll down to my add employee function. And after we ask, is the employee active? We're now going to add in two additional prompts. The first one will be for that salary in USD. In this case, we're gonna utilize the validator that we included previously, and we'll say anything between 10,000 and a million is sufficient. Then we'll add in our local currency prompt for that three letter code. And in this case, we'll use the function we just created is 
currency code valid. Okay, let's look at one more function that we have, and that is our log employee function. So here, we're simply logging out every single property. But in this case, we don't wanna do that because we want special logic for the salary USD and that local currency code field. So here's how we're gonna handle that. We're gonna go through and create a conditional and say, hey, if this is salary USD or if this is the local currency code, we're not going to log it out. However, for anything else, we will log it out in exactly the same way. Now, the last thing we'll wanna do here is that we'll want to go after our object.entries here where we're going through each of the values included in the object and we're gonna to want to log out specially both the USD salary as well as the local currency salary. Now to do this, you'll notice that we're using that get salary function that we just created. Okay, we're almost ready to test this out, but what we need to do is we need to modify the startup process so that we can go fetch our currency data before we execute our main function. In this case, I'll go through and enter in another function in the promise chain, and that will go and fetch our currency conversion data. Perfect, now we should be ready to test this out. So I'll open up the terminal. So here we'll execute the add command on our application. So let's enter in a first name. We'll say William, last name, Rogers. We'll go ahead and set the start year. In this case, we'll say 2000. And then we'll set the month to be two, the day to be three, and we'll say that the employee is active. Now we get to enter in an annual salary. Well, we know it should be at least 10,000. So if I enter in 100, it will say invalid input. So let's put in, it's gonna be 100,000. And then we need to enter in a local currency. In this case, I'll say GBP for Great Britain Pound. Let's pretend that William is working out of our London office. Now it actually has written those values out to the JSON file. So if we go in and look under our JSON file, and I scroll all the way to the end, we'll see that William Rogers is indeed included. Now, the next thing we need to do is we'll go search for William to verify that we can display the currency correctly. So I'm gonna go ahead and load the application. And in this case, we'll search by ID. It's gonna ask for the ID and we'll say 60. And here you can see we have William's listing in the directory. We get a US salary listed as 100,000 and you can see that we have a properly converted and formatted local salary displayed as well. So up to this point, we have made the assumption that when we are running an asynchronous operation, we want one operation to complete before we start another one. But we don't have to do that, and the global promise object supports some different ways of handling concurrent promises. So let's jump over to the documentation. So I'm here on the MDN web docs looking at the global promise object. And I wanna point out there are four different methods on the global promise object that deal with handling concurrent promises. We have promise.all, promise.allsettled, promise.any, and promise.race. Now, I specifically wanna talk about promise.all and we'll be integrating this into our application. So here, we can pass promise.all an array of promises. Now, what it will do is it will return a single promise and that single promise will fulfill when all of those promises that we've passed into it fulfill themselves. Now, if any one of those promises that we have passed in fail, then that single promise it returns will fail as well. Now, by doing this, we can do multiple asynchronous processes at the same time. So let's take a look in our application at how we could implement this to change how our startup process works. So here in VS Code, and our application, we're loading that JSON file completely before we start the process of fetching the currency conversion data. Now, to be honest, in our use case, loading that JSON file because it's a local file is really quick, but let's pretend that both of them existed on a server. Well, we might wanna go ahead and have them both operate at the same time. So that's exactly what we're gonna do here. So I'm gonna utilize the global promise object and we'll say promise.all. Now, inside of this object, we're gonna pass an array of promises. So in some cases we can just copy and paste. So I will include load data because it returns a promise and then we'll take get currency conversion data and I will put this here as well and execute it so that it returns a promise. Now, if you remember what it said is that it's going to return a promise so we can utilize our dot then immediately after this promise dot all. And now our application will start up once both load data and get currency conversion data have completed. Now, if either of them fail, 
then it will go to our catch block here, which will then log out that we cannot complete the startup process and then throw the respective error. Okay, so now let's test this out. So here, I'm going to run the application using the search by ID command. And we can see now that it has completed loading both the employees as well as our currency conversion data. And you can see that because if I log out employee number 60, which is William Rogers that we added in the previous clip, you can see that not only do we get the listing showing that we have received the JSON data from the local file, but we also get the properly formatted currency data, meaning that we have been able to successfully fetch the currency conversion data from our public API endpoint. So I would be remiss if I didn't cover one additional concept since we're talking about asynchronous programming, and that is event handling. Now, events are things that happen in the system you're programming in, and the system produces or fires, in this case, a signal of some kind when an event occurs, and it provides a mechanism by which an action can be automatically taken, that is, some code running, when the event occurs. Now, let me give you some examples to help you understand how this plays out. Maybe you want to respond to some type of system event. So in the case of our application, let's say we wanted to do some cleanup as our application was exiting. So we would need to listen for some event that would let us know that our application was about to close. But one of the most common use cases of event handling in JavaScript is when you're looking in the browser to handle things like mouse clicks, because you'll want to know if a user clicks on a button, for example. And so you need to have some code that executes when that happens. But until then, you don't want that code to execute. Or also things like key presses. And we're even listening for some of that within our application inside of the third-party module we're using to get user input. But there also are other things, such as async progress events. Let's say that you're uploading a large file, and that large file, maybe it's 100 megabytes, and you want to be able to get notifications so that you can let the end user know the progress of that upload. Well, you'll need to have some custom code that executes every time there is an update from that overall async process. Now, I want to show you how you can leverage the event emitter that is included as a part of Node.js, but just know that really a majority of your event handling use cases are going to happen when you start working in the browser. But let's go ahead and jump over to VS Code. So here in VS Code, I'm going to create a new file. Now, here within this file, the first thing we're going to do is to bring in the Node.js event emitter. And this is what allows us to both listen for events as well as emit our own custom events. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create an emitter. And I use the constructor pattern on this event emitter object. Perfect. So now that I have that, the next thing I want to do is actually want to add in an event listener. So in this case, we have a string identifier for the particular event, and we'll call this one hello. And then we can add in a function that will execute whenever we receive that event. So in this case, I want to add in an arrow function and it will receive a message. Now that's going to come into play here in just a minute. Perfect. So now we need to actually emit this event and verify that we can receive it. Now to do that, I'm going to utilize a function, a global function in JavaScript that we haven't talked about yet, and that is set timeout. Now set timeout takes two arguments. You can pass in a function and then a number of milliseconds that it will wait before it fires that function. And so here, we want to emit this event after we wait for three seconds. So I'm going to start off by calling set timeout. We'll create our arrow function, and then we'll say that we want to wait for three seconds, which again is 3,000 milliseconds. Okay, now we need to add in the logic to actually fire this event or emit the event. So in this case, we'll say emitter.emit, and we'll give it the name hello. This is the same string that we referenced earlier. That's how it's going to know what listeners should fire for this event. And then we're going to pass in the custom data, which in this case is just going to be a string called message. Now, if everything works when we run this file, we should see that after three seconds, we get a message stating that the event has been handled, and then we display the message that was sent out through the event that was emitted. Okay, let's give this a test. And indeed, we can see that we did receive that event. The event has been handled. And so this illustrates at a basic level how we can listen for and emit our own custom events. If you have done any exploration of JavaScript on your own since you've started this course, you have likely seen that JavaScript applications don't exist within a single file like some of our examples. So let's look at a few of these scenarios. First, 
you may want to split your application up into multiple files. And most all applications do this. You can organize your code around areas of the application and then export specific functions and variables to be available outside of that file. And we will walk through how that works within this module. Second, you may want to leverage some of the great code that already exists in the JavaScript ecosystem. Node.js has its own package manager, NPM. This eases the process of integrating third-party code into your JavaScript applications. I cover the concept of package managers in JavaScript The Big Picture. So if you want to understand more about the concept of the package manager and what options you have in the JavaScript world, feel free to head back and watch that clip. Now, using Node with NPM, you can install any of the third-party packages that exist that cover common scenarios that you may run into. If we take a concept like data validation that we included in our application earlier, that is actually solved by a handful of NPM packages that have already been written by other developers. All of this is possible because JavaScript has the ability to work with modules, and we have seen the capabilities increase in this area as JavaScript has matured. I want to introduce you to two different module standards, ESM and CommonJS. The first one that I want to discuss is CommonJS. This standard was created specifically for Node.js since JavaScript didn't have its own module implementation at that time. It uses the require method to load in modules. So if you're working with Node.js code, you will likely see this used quite a bit. This was the standard in Node.js for a very long time. It uses an export variable if in the module to determine what is exported outside of the module code. Next up, we have ESM, which is short for ECMAScript modules. This is the standard that is now a part of the ECMAScript specification. Instead of using the require method, this approach uses the import keyword. And instead of using an export variable, we use the export keyword to define which elements should be exported from the module. This is now the standard in Node.js, although common JS modules can still be used. Since ECMAScript modules are the standard moving forward, we have been using them, and we will continue to use them throughout the course. With that being said, let's look at an example of both in action. First up, let's look at a common JS example. Here, we're using the require method to pull in the system library from Node.js. In addition, we are also importing a local file that contains JavaScript and a JSON file. If I wanted to export the function I have defined, I can specify that this function is a member of the module.exports object. So that's common JS in a nutshell. Next up, we have ECMAScript modules. Here, we can use the import keyword to pull in third-party modules as well as local files. One of the differences here is that we can specify what specifically we want to pull in using this approach. There are some variation to the types of imports we can do, but I'll cover that more later in this module. I could also pull in some JSON using an import statement. If I wanted to export a function, it is as simple as using the export keyword to indicate that it should be available outside of the module. Now that you have a basic understanding of modules, let's jump to what will become a superpower for you using third-party modules. So next, we're gonna dive into this essential topic of using third-party modules. Now I want to introduce some terms and concepts to you that I mentioned all the way back in JavaScript, the big picture. First of all, we have the package manager. And in terms of software development, a package manager is a tool that enables you to install and manage software written by other developers into your own software projects. Now, when we're talking about package management within JavaScript, we really have two different pieces of this. We have the client that we use to go and search and fetch the projects that we want to integrate in, but we also have the registry that actually hosts those projects. So when we're talking about the clients, what we're referring to is NPM, which comes with Node and what we will be using and have used already in this course. And we have others like Yarn and PNPM. But in terms of registries, there's really one that we look to and that is NPM. Now they do have their public registries and organizations can also have their own private registries that you can leverage. Now over the course of this demo, we're gonna be doing a few things. First of all, we're gonna be searching for available packages in the NPM registry via the NPM website. Then we're gonna be creating a package.json file using the NPM CLI. And finally, we'll actually be installing and using a third-party module using the NPM CLI. So let's dive in. 
So I'm here on the NPM registry website. Now, as a note, NPM is actually now owned by GitHub, which is now owned by Microsoft. So Microsoft actually controls this ecosystem. So here, if I wanna look for packages, let's just say I've heard of a package called Chalk. Now this package enables me to be able to go in and do some cool things in terms of styling the things I output to the console. Because to be honest, up to this point in our project, our outputs have been kind of pretty bland, all just a single color and hard to maybe distinguish certain things from others. So let's take a look and see if this project could help us in that way. So here, if I click into Chalk, we'll be able to see a listing for it. In addition, we can go and actually view the documentation that's included in the readme file for that repository here on the NPM site. Now you can see this is a pretty popular library with over 242 million weekly downloads. But here you can get a sense of what it enables you to do. You can get a basic sense of the API and how to work with it. Great, I think this is what we're looking for. So let's figure out how we can go to a completely blank project and integrate this into a JavaScript application. So I'm here in VS Code, and I don't have anything yet in this project other than just my .VS Code directory. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna create my package.json file. Now, we could create it by hand, but that's not recommended. Part of what is included with the NPM CLI tool is the ability to initialize or init a new package.json file. So here I'm gonna type NPM init, and now it's gonna walk me through some questions. So first we'll give a package name and I'll just hit enter, which will leave the default as examples. And then we can enter in a version number. In this case, I'll leave the default of 1.0.0. Then I'll give it a description. Then we can leave the default entry point. And I'm not gonna enter in a test command or a Git repository or keywords or an author or the license right now. I'll just accept the default. And it gives me a preview of what my package.json file would be. I'll just go ahead and hit enter and we will see that our package.json file has been configured. Great, now the only thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go in and do what we did earlier. I'm gonna make sure that for type, we actually have this listed as module because this will enable us to use ECMAScript modules, which is what we wanna be doing for this project. Okay, great, that is the first step. Now from here, I want to install the library that we just looked at, Chalk. So to do that, I'm going to run npm install Chalk. Now, I'm gonna do one more thing here because I want this to actually be listed in the dependencies in my package.json file. So I'm gonna specify that I want to save this because I'm not just installing this for the moment. I want this to actually be included with my project. Now that I've done that, you'll notice that my package.json file is updated to list the dependency that we just installed. And now that we have that installed, which we can tell because we have both a node underscore modules folder and a package-lock.json file, we can now use it within our project. But I wanna to talk to you a minute about how these different files and folders interact with your source code repository. Now, if you were creating a Git repository for this application, you would check in your package.json file, you would check in your package-lock.json file, but you would not check in your node underscore modules folder. So you would need to configure your Git ignore file to handle those appropriately. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file and we'll just call this index.js. Now here within this file, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually bring in this third party library. Now, in this case, this uses what we would call a default export. And so this would be the way that we import it in. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I actually want to use this. So in this case, I'm gonna do a console.log statement and then I'm gonna specify that I'm going to use a blue bold logging statement here for first name and then we'll just use the normal output for David. And then I'll do something similar here for the next line. We'll do last name, and in this case, we'll do green bold, just to help you see what's possible with this particular library. Great, so I'm gonna save it, and then I'm gonna go down to the terminal, and I'm gonna go ahead and run my file. And you'll notice that I do indeed have blue and green in the output in the console. Now, I'm not gonna walk you through how you would integrate this in with the project we've been building. You can absolutely use the knowledge that I've given you here through this and other modules to be able to do this yourself. And you can go and look at the documentation for Chalk on the NPM site or on the GitHub repository for that project to learn how to do even more with this library. So before we can move forward with creating a multi-file JavaScript application instead of the single file application that we're dealing with currently, we need to have a conversation about exporting values when working with ECMAScript modules. So let's just jump right in to VS Code. 
So I'm here in VS Code, and this file is exactly at the state it was in at the end of the last clip. Let's say that we want to use this new third-party library chalk that we've brought into our application. And let's say that we want to isolate some of our logging functionality into another file so it doesn't have to be in our index.js file. Well, we can do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just simply comment out this code because we're not going to be using it. The next thing I want to do is I want to bring in some sample data. So I'm going to bring in a sample employee. This was actually pulled out of the sample JSON file that we've been using up to this point. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to create some logic that will loop over an employee object and log out the data to the console, but utilizing some of the colors that we can use with chalk. Now, again, you could go through and do a lot more with this than what I'm going to do, but I'm showing you here how we can isolate this logic in a different file in our application. So now that I have that in place, I'm gonna create a new file called logging.js. Now the first thing I'll do within this file is I'm going to bring in our library chalk that we've been using in this application. Now the next thing I'll do is to create a function, and this is going to log out an employee object. Now this should look somewhat familiar to you. This is very similar to what we're doing within the log employees function of our custom JavaScript application. Now with this being said, we're going to use this in our index.js file. However, if we tried to go and import this now, it would fail. And the reason is, is because this function is not included in the exports from this JavaScript file. We can fix that by adding in the export keyword here at the beginning of this definition. Now that this is in place, we can go back to our index.js file and beneath our chalk import, we could actually add in the import for log object and we're specifying that it's coming from our logging.js file. Now that we've brought that in, we can actually use it. So I can go down here below where I'm defining that employee object, and I can add in a call to log object. Perfect, so if I go down to the terminal, and if I were to run the application, we can see that indeed it does output the way that we have intended. The keys here are listed in blue, and the values are listed in a bold gray color. Perfect, okay. Now that we have that in place, I'll tell you that we don't have to just export and use functions. We can also do variables as well. So what I'll do is underneath my import, I'll go ahead and add in a variable called num employees log. So this will keep track of the number of employees that we've logged out here within this application. And then I'll simply increment that value at the end of the log object function. So now if I go back over to my index.js file, I can't use that yet because I haven't included it in the imports. In this case, if I add in a comma, I can see that it's going to suggest that I bring in num employees logged, which is what I'm intending to do here because that is included in the exports. So now what I could do is I could maybe log out another employee. It'll be the same data, but we'll use this just as an example. But then after that, we can go through and add in another logging statement that will tell us the number of employees logged and we'll output that in red and then we'll do the gray bold for the actual number that will come back from that variable. So now if I save this and then run the application, we can see that indeed it does output the two different employees and then it tells us we have logged out two different employees. Now with this information on how you can export functions and variables for use in multiple files, in the next clip we can jump over to our application and begin to add some organization. So now we're gonna create a multi-file JavaScript project out of our currently single file JavaScript application. And I hope that you've seen that as we've built more and more into this application, it becomes a little trickier to navigate that index.js file. I wanted you to see that firsthand so that you could understand much of the value that comes with dividing your application into multiple files where you take common concepts and apply those into a single file and then pull them into whatever main file you're executing. So let's dive in to VS Code and see this in action. So I'm here in VS Code, and the first thing I'm gonna do is to run npm install. Now this application is in the exact state it was in at the end of the previous module. Okay, I'll close the terminal for now. We'll come back to that in a minute. But if we look through this file, there's several areas that jump out as good candidates for isolating to their own file. The first that we'll take a look at is how we load and write data to the file system. So let's go ahead and create a new file called data.js. Now within this file, we're gonna take everything that we've done so far 
in terms of loading and writing data, we'll remove it from our index.js file. In addition, the import statement for bringing in the node file system module, we're gonna remove that as well. Now I'm gonna move over to my data.js file and we'll start by bringing in that import for the node file system module and then we'll go ahead and paste in those functions that we had from our index.js file. Okay, now that we have these functions in place, the first thing we'll need to do to make them available outside of this file is to mark both of them with the export keyword. Now that we have that in place, we need to think a bit about inputs and outputs. So here, our load data function is accessing the employee's variable. Well, that's not in scope here in this file. So what we'll do, instead of actually assigning that variable here, what we'll do is we will just return the parsed values from our JSON file. Okay, that's one thing. But now in the next function, here we're also using the employee's array to write the data to the JSON file. So here we can simply include that as a parameter that we'll need to pass in. Okay, now that we have this in place, let's go back over and take a look at our index.js file. So another area where we could probably isolate some of our logic is around how we're dealing with the currency data. So here we have two functions, get currency conversion data and get salary. So I'm gonna take these and I'm going to cut them as well. Then I'm gonna create a new file called currency.js. Now here within this file, we can also bring in those functions that we pulled from our index.js file. Perfect, so now that we've brought these in, we need to designate them both as exports. Now in addition, in thinking about inputs and outputs, we have the same situation here. We can't assign currency data at this point because that variable is not in scope. So we will simply return the result of our HTTP request. Okay, now if you look down at our get salary function, you'll notice that it's telling us that currency data is not currently in scope. So here we need to include this by making it a parameter that gets passed in to the function. Okay, so now that we have these two additional files in place, let's use them within our index.js file. So here I'll go to the top of the file and we're gonna bring in the functions that we've just created by using import statements. Great. Now, if we scroll through, there are a few areas where we will need to update the application. First, if you remember, we now need to pass our currency data to our different get salary calls. So here, we'll go ahead and add that in. Now, as I scroll, the next thing that we'll need to do is when we add an employee, we'll need to be sure that when we call write data, we pass in our employees. Great. Now, the next thing that we'll need to do is actually update the way in which our application starts up. If you remember, we have a promise chain that executes. We call load data and get currency conversion data simultaneously by using promise.all. What we'll need to do is take the results of those and actually assign those to the appropriate variables. Now, when you're calling promise.all, it will return an array of results, and that array will correspond to the order in which you passed those promises into promise.all. So in this case, we're gonna assign employees to the result at the zero index and currency data to the result at the index of one. Now after this, we'll return the result of our main call, which will keep the promise chain going and will catch any errors that happen in any of those functions. So now that we've isolated these two areas of our application, let's test it out. So now I'm gonna run search by ID and we'll go ahead and search for ID number 55. And in doing so, you can see that we do successfully pull back an employee from the directory we can see that we have successfully been able to isolate the logic around loading data from the file system and writing it back to the file system, as well as getting all of our currency conversion data because we're seeing everything properly represented here in the console output. So next, we're gonna implement a very common use case when you're programming in JavaScript. And that is we're gonna choose to change from working with our local file where we're storing everything as JSON to moving that data into a relational database. Now specifically, we're gonna be working with SQL Lite here because that's gonna give us a very simple way to set up a database quickly and get to working with it. However, if you're new to working with relational databases and SQL in general, don't worry. There's a great course here on Pluralsight that will help get you up to speed if you have any questions about the things we're going through. So here in this demo, we're gonna do several things. First of all, we're gonna be installing a third-party module and technically two different ones here to work with SQL Lite. And then we're gonna be converting our persistent data storage in our application to use SQLite instead of that local file. And then we'll be verifying our ability to store and access the data in SQLite. So let's get right to it and let's jump into VS Code. 
So I'm here in VS Code, and the first step I'm gonna take is to install the two modules that we'll need to interact with SQLite. And those two modules are SQLite and SQLite 3. Now, I realize the naming is a little confusing here. SQLite 3 is the actual driver that we'll be using to interact with the database, while SQLite is a wrapper that goes around that driver. Now, if you're not interested in using SQLite, you can find modules to work with about any relational database that you can think of. MySQL, SQL Server, Postgres, you can find NPM modules that will help you interact with those databases, whether they're local or whether they're on a server somewhere else. But I'm gonna go ahead and install these modules. We can see that those have been added and installed. And so now I'm gonna close the terminal so we can start working with SQLite. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file because we wanna isolate our database logic into a single JavaScript file. Now here within this file, we'll need to pull in some different imports. First of all, we're gonna to need to import the SQLite driver. That's what's really doing the hard work of interacting with SQLite for us. And then we're gonna pull in one method from the SQLite package, which is open. Now the first thing we're gonna to need to do is to create a table. And we'll actually check this every time we're interacting with the database to be sure that our table has been created. So here we'll create a new function that's gonna be an async function, and it's gonna take one parameter, which is gonna be the connection to our database. And then we're gonna create a SQL query that's gonna say, if this table doesn't exist, we need to create it. Now these fields should look very familiar to you. They're pretty much the data that we have been working with throughout a vast majority of this course when it comes to our employee database with everything from our ID, which will serve as our primary key, and then we have our email, first name, last name, our USD salary, the local currency indicator, the start date, and then whether or not the particular employee is active. And what we'll do is we'll actually run this query at the end of this function. And so if we wait for this to complete, it will verify that our table has been created. Now, if you notice here, we're using the phrase, if not exists, in SQL. So it will only create this table once, it won't write over our data if it already has been created. Great. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to create a local variable that's going to store the connection to our database and then a function to get that connection. So we'll call this underscore DB. Now I wanna point something out here. You might have noticed this, that I'm not exporting any of the things we've created so far in this particular JavaScript file. And that's intentional. All of these are things that are meant to be executed only within this particular JavaScript file. We'll get to some exported functions here in just a minute. Now, if you notice here, we're passing in a file name when we're opening our connection to SQLite. It will actually store all the contents of our database in a file here within our project directory. And you'll see that work here in just a minute. But just as we open the connection, we also need to have a function to close our connection to the database. And you'll notice that all of these are async functions. These are all things that need to go interact with the database and then report back once they've completed. Okay, so this is really all of the behind the scenes plumbing that needs to happen for us to interact with SQLite. Now, if you think about it, there are two things that we need to program this to do. The first is to get all employees, and the second is to insert a new employee. So let's start off by getting all the employees from our database. So I'm gonna go ahead and create another async function, but I'm going to specify that this one needs to be exported. So here, we're gonna go through and get a connection to our database, and then we're going to run a query that will get all of the employees from our employees table. And that's the table again that we created at the beginning of this file. Now, we need to go through and do some adjustments here. So one of the things is, is that SQLite doesn't have a native Boolean data type. It's gonna just store it as an integer. So when we get that back, we're gonna need to convert that integer back into a Boolean. So here, since we're getting back an array of rows, which is basically an array of employees for us, we'll actually utilize the map function on our array to go through and create a new array where we've converted that is active value into a Boolean. Then we'll close the connection and return the employees. Okay, now we've got one more function to create here within this file, and that is gonna be how we insert a new employee. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you that this function is pretty long, but that's because of the way that we're defining our SQL statement to actually insert that into the database. So don't be scared by this. If you understand how SQL works, you'll be able to understand this. So here, we're gonna create another async function called insert employee, and we'll take in that employee object, the same employee object that we've been working with before. 
Now here we're gonna specify that we wanna insert this into our employees table. And we need to first go through and list all of the columns that we wanna insert this data into. And these will be all the properties on our employee object that we've been working with so far. And then we need to specify that we're going to insert parameters when we run this for each of those values. Now we need to say what those values are. So here we're just gonna list them out in the same order that we listed them out in the SQL query above. So we'll go through ID, email, first name, last name, that salary, the local currency code, the employee.start date, and notice we're converting this to a string here instead of a date, and we're converting that is active property to a number. Okay, we'll then get our connection, and then we'll run our query with all the parameters that we've entered, and then we'll close our database connection. Okay, so we've done a lot here to enable our interaction with a relational database but we're only gonna to have to tweak a few things to have this work within our index.js file. So I'm going to click into this file. We're gonna go ahead and go to the top. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually write over this import statement because we don't need it. We're gonna be using our database instead of the local file. So we'll import the two functions that we created, get all employees and insert employee. And remember, we had to mark both of these as exports for them to be available for us here. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to modify one function. Now, previously, when we called get next employee ID, we made the assumption that we already have some data, but in this case, we don't have any employees in our system yet. So we'll need to account for one additional condition, and that is if we don't have any employees yet. If that's the case, we'll simply return one for the first ID. Okay, now the next thing we need to do is we need to get the employee's email address when we're adding in a new employee we actually haven't entered in that prompt yet. So I'll go ahead and add this in as well. Now we could create a custom validator to truly check if it's a valid email address. We're not going to do that in this case, but if you wanna build that out yourself, feel free. Now the next thing we need to do after this is we need to change what we're doing because we're not going through and actually writing the data utilizing the same function that would store it to a JSON file. In this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in a new call to our insert employee function. And here we'll pass in the employee object that we've entered in. Okay, we're almost done. We need to do one more thing. So I'm gonna scroll here to the bottom to our startup. And instead of using our load data function, we just need to change this out for the function that we just created, which is get all employees. We actually don't need to change anything else because it's gonna return an array of employees just like the load data function did. Okay. So with just those few changes, we should be able to see our application work just like it did before. So let me go ahead and bring up the terminal. So I'm gonna start by running the add command. Now, one of the things I wanna point out is that our database was just created because it initially tried to fetch all of the employees and it did that successfully, but we just didn't have any employees in the system yet. But you'll notice that we now have a data.sqlite3 file in our project folder. Okay. So now let's go through and create our first employee. We'll say David Tucker, and we'll specify an email, David underscore Tucker at globalmantics.com. Now we'll set the start year here to be 2003, and we'll say that the start month was March and the day was the first. We'll say that this is an active employee who makes $67,000 a year, and their local currency, we'll say, is Japanese yen. So we'll say that this particular David Tucker is working out of the Tokyo office. And it actually completes without throwing any errors. So we should be able to go back and list all of our employees. So I'll go ahead and run the list command. And we can see that indeed we get back a David Tucker with an ID of one. We can see that we get back our USD salary, our local currency. We can also see our start date and the is active status and we can see the salary properly formatted in both US dollars and Japanese yen. So here we have successfully implemented data storage using a relational database with third-party modules to manage the connection between our application and SQLite. Congratulations on making it to the final module here in JavaScript Fundamentals. I wanna introduce a few concepts to you in this module that come into play once you are actually building JavaScript applications. As we get into teams to build solutions, we need to make sure that our code is consistent and that our application works as intended. Now, as you likely suspect, we have some software best practices and tools that can help us address these two concerns. 
Now here in this clip, we'll be addressing the second concern, making sure our application works as intended. And to do this, we're gonna explore the concept of unit testing. Now unit testing is where individual components or units of an application are tested to make sure they behave as the author intended. These tests are usually written for a specific unit testing framework. And it is common for these tests to get executed every time code is committed to a project to ensure that the new code does not break application functionality. And unit testing is just one type of testing that complex software projects may leverage. Now, one of the concepts that I introduced in this description was the unit testing framework. And in JavaScript, we never have a shortage of frameworks, and this is just as true when it comes to unit testing. We have popular tools like Jest, Mocha, Jasmine, Ava, and Vtest. Now here within this learning path, we will be providing an entire course to help you learn unit testing for your JavaScript application with Jest. Gabriel has a great course on this topic and I highly encourage you to check it out. Now I have to break some news to you. We aren't gonna be writing any unit test here in this clip, but I didn't wanna leave you empty handed. If I were to open the browser here, I have a personal project called Lambda Micro that I created as a part of another Pluralsight course. Now this code base has tests built into it that run every single time that I check code into this repository. And this helps me make sure that I'm not breaking anything before I release it into the world. Now I have my local copy of this project pulled up in the terminal. To use Jest to execute this entire collection of unit tests, I can simply run npm test. Now, if you wanna see how that was configured, you can take a look in the package.json file. Now, once the tests have completed running, you can see that it ran 64 individual tests organized into seven different suites. Now, there is another concept I will also introduce as a part of our discussion around unit testing, and that is code coverage. Now, code coverage is a metric designed to tell you how much of an application is actually tested by the collection of unit tests that have been written for it. Now, there are different approaches for calculating this metric, but it is generally assumed that a higher code coverage number is better than a lower one, as it means that more of the application is tested by the unit tests. Now, if I were to go back to the terminal, it calculates the code coverage for each individual file, as well as the project as a whole, using four different criteria, statement coverage, branch coverage, function coverage, and line coverage. Now, we won't dive into the specifics of any of those, but I wanted you to be aware of why there are different numbers listed here in this report. Now, in addition to Lambda Micro, most popular open source projects also have a collection of unit tests, and you can find a repository that you're interested in and see how they wrote their tests. That's one of the many benefits of open source code. Oh, and don't forget to go in and check out Gabriel's course. He spends over 90 minutes covering this topic in depth, as opposed to the four minutes that I'm spending here introducing it. In addition to unit testing that we covered in the last clip, we also need to think about how we can help our code to be consistent. Now, I've mentioned at several times throughout this course that JavaScript enables you to do things in different ways. Think about defining variables with let and const versus the var keyword, or using single quotes or double quotes for strings, or function expressions versus arrow functions, and the list goes on and on. And if your development team has everyone doing different things, it's gonna be really hard to have a consistent code base. But there are tools to help you with this, and this generally falls under the category of what we would call code linting. Now, linting is the automated checking of your source code for programmatic and stylistic errors. And this is done by using a lint tool, otherwise known as a linter. Now, a lint tool is a basic static code analyzer, and it's important to reduce errors and improve the overall quality of your code. And using lint tools can help you accelerate development and reduce costs by finding errors earlier. And that sounds like a very good thing. Now, when we're talking about JavaScript, there's really one tool that rises above all the others in this area, and that is ESLint. Now, ESLint statically analyzes your code to quickly find problems. And it's built into most text editors, and you can run ESLint as a part of your continuous integration pipeline. Now, we haven't talked much about continuous integration, but if you remember, I mentioned that you can run your unit test every time code is checked into the repository. Well, you can also check your code style with the linting tool in the same way. And this helps make sure that somebody's not checking in code that goes against the styles you have agreed upon as a development team. 
Now let's look at integrating ESLint into our application. So let's jump over into VS Code. Now one of the things I want to mention is that there is ESLint support directly built in to VS Code if you're using the ESLint extension. So you can go under the extensions tab and you can search for ESLint and you'll notice that we have one from Microsoft here that comes up right at the beginning. Now I already have this one installed, but if I didn't, I could install it here with just the click of a button. And one of the great things about this is once we have our rules configured for ESLint, it will show us all of our errors directly in our code editor. We don't have to go run them separately, which you'll see what I mean by that here in just a minute. But I mentioned something here about rules and ESLint comes with some default rules, but developers can publish their own set of configuration rules for ESLint as an NPM package. And several companies have done that. And one of those, just to give an example, is Airbnb. Now, Airbnb's configuration is called ESLint config Airbnb. And we can see that it's fairly popular at 3.8 million weekly downloads as well. But you can see that we have one command here that we can use to install this. And so let's go ahead and head back over to VS Code and let's put that in place. So I'll go ahead and paste in the command that we saw and I'll go ahead and install this particular package. Now you don't have to understand everything that's going on behind the scenes with this command to be able to use it in your project, but we're actually using another NPM package called install peer depths or peer dependencies to help go through the process of installing all the packages we need to utilize this. Okay, now that we have that in place, we're now ready to start working with their config. Now we could use ESLint to generate a config file for us, but in this case, I'm just gonna create one and it can actually take multiple formats. In this case, we're gonna use the ESLint RC file. So here, I'll go in the project and I'll say new file and we'll call this .eslint RC. Now here, we don't have to do a ton of heavy lifting to make this work. We simply need to specify that we're gonna extend that Airbnb configuration that we have already installed into our project. And that's all we need to do for now. Now what we can do is we can go in and actually run ESLint against our code base. So here I'm gonna run npm eslint and I'm gonna specify that it should use the current directory. Now we're gonna see a bunch of output here, so don't be startled by that. And here we can see we have 123 problems. And if we look here, there's several different examples. Some of these might make sense and some of them might not, and that's okay. We can see, for example, that this rule set prefers that strings use single quotes instead of double quotes. Also, we get warnings here for using console statements. Now, some of these things we care about, and some of them we don't. Some of them are just about style, for example, whether or not we put a space before and after our square brackets for creating an array, and some of them directly have to do with functionality. But we can go ahead and we can fix a vast majority of the issues that we're seeing. If you notice here in the terminal, it says that 92 errors are fixable with the fix option. So here I'm gonna run ESLint, but pass in the command line option to fix the errors that it can fix by itself. And indeed we can see that that has completed. And now we see that we only have 30 problems left. Now we can adjust the rules here to some extent because we heavily use things like console logging. So we can configure within our ESLint RC file what rules we want to actually utilize and which ones we don't. So in this case, I'm gonna specify that there are a few things that we're going to turn off in terms of the rules that come with the Airbnb configuration for ESLint. Now, if I were to go back and run ESLint, we can see that now we only have seven problems. So let's dive in and take a look at those problems because I want you to see how ESLint is supported within the editor here in VS Code. So first, we'll go to our index.js file. And if I scroll down here to the bottom, you'll notice that we have an error here because it says I should use something called array destructuring. So I'll show you how we can do that. I just didn't show you this particular syntax yet. We could rewrite the two lines that we have there this way. We can remove the two lines that we had previously and do it all within a single line of code. And this is just another way of creating variables based off of data that's contained within an array. Now, the next errors that we see here are on lines 43 and 50. So if I scroll up, we'll actually see those. And if we look in the sidebar, we also have a representation of those warnings presented here. So we can easily see at a glance where the problems are. Now here, it's preferring that we would use an arrow function in this case, instead of an unnamed function expression. So here we'll simply replace these values and then we'll save. 
Now, we'll notice that as we do that, it's giving us yet another issue here, and that is that basically we don't need to use a return statement. We can put this all in a single line arrow file. Now, I'm not gonna fix this just yet because this is something that ESLint can actually fix itself. The next thing I'll do is head over to the next two files where we have errors, and that is our database and currency.js files. We'll start here in database. Now, the first thing it's gonna say here is we don't need to actually use the await keyword when we have a return statement that is returning a promise, that it's actually redundant. There's actually nothing wrong with including it, but we don't need it here, so the rule set says we should remove it. Okay, so that's one thing. The next thing happens here on line 28. And in this case, we actually chose not to use this parameter. We're instead using that local variable that we've defined, underscore DB. So I can remove that. Now we have one more thing to fix. If I go under currency.js, you'll see here that we also have another redundant await keyword. So I'll remove that. Now with that being said, I should be able to go in and run ESLint fix and it should fix that one arrow function that it wanted on a single line. And we can see that now we don't have any errors or warnings included in the output. So that even though we had over a hundred issues to begin with, we have quickly integrated in the fixes that we needed for those. Now, I wanna show you something else that I think is pretty powerful. And that is that ESLint can actually run fix every single time we save our files. So here, what I wanna do is I wanna create my settings file for VS Code. And here within this file, I simply need to add in the following configuration. We're gonna say that on save, we wanna run fix for ESLint. And we wanna specify that this is for JavaScript files. Okay, let me show you this in action. So now I'm gonna go back to my index.js file. And let's say for example here, this logging statement that I have, let's say that I'm using double quotes. And it's gonna tell me, hey, this prefers single quotes. Well, now all I have to do is actually save the file and in doing so, it will automatically be fixed by ESLint for any of the types of errors or warnings that ESLint can address by itself. So hopefully this just gives you a small window into what's possible when using ESLint to make sure that our code stays consistent to rules that we've defined. Congratulations, by making it through this course, you have truly covered the fundamentals of JavaScript. If you go out into the real world, you will find that you understand a vast majority of the JavaScript that you will see. Every now and then you will run across something and say, what's that? That's okay, we'll cover those things later in this learning path. You'll also likely run into even more questions about how to create things the right way in JavaScript when it comes to industry best practices. That's something else that we will be diving into throughout this learning path. We will also dive even more deeply into the tools that you will use to write your code to improve your overall developer experience. While we've covered everything from the big picture all the way through the fundamentals, there is a lot to go. But the great thing is, now that you have made it through the fundamentals course, you can start writing code and solving problems. But don't stop your learning just yet. You are just getting started. Thanks for joining me on this journey through JavaScript fundamentals. If you wanna connect with me, feel free to check out my blog at davidtucker.net where you can get links to connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Feel free to also follow me here on Pluralsight so you can get notified when I create new courses. Keep me posted on what you're doing with the skills that you have learned in this course because I'm excited to see what you build with JavaScript.